they are doing it. I really like to appreciate and thank you for that, sir. Uh, now I will request Dr. Rajgopalan to present his talk on the facial injuries. Dr. Rajgopalan, please. Sir, Dr. Rajesh Gupta said he is joining. This is the first talk there in the list. He said he will join in five minutes. Do you want me to start? Yes, sir. Okay. Hello. Hello. Uh, Hello. Can you see my screen, sir? Yes, we can. Visible? Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good morning to everybody. Rajesh? Sir, sir, please continue, sir. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I no inform problem. them that you will be joining. Yeah, no, no problem. After, after, after you, after you. No problem. After oh. you, sir. Thank you, Rajesh. Uh, good morning to all of you. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Raneja, sir, for giving me this opportunity. Uh, to all the delegates who have logged in, the, my topic is facial injuries, and that's an important topic for all of us, not only you, to all of us practicing orthopedics, because this is not something we don't want to miss. And of course, it is important from the exam point of view, too. Now, before I go further, there are two types uh, of growth plates. Yeah. Sir, sir, uh, sir, please, uh, full screen, sir, kariye. Do it full screen, sir. I am in full screen in my laptop. Rajesh? Sir, it is not here, sir. It is not full okay. screen. Okay, then probably I have to go, because in my laptop it is full screen. I will just see what can be done. I'll put escape. See, now I have gone to uh, this thing. Uh, and... no, sir, now do full screen, sir. Now do full screen. No? No? No, sir. Not yet. Okay, then I'll just close it and let's see what is wrong. I will just close it, then probably open it again. I close the presentation and I'm opening it again and I put on slideshow and from the first slide. It is still not full screen? Not sir, not sir. Uh, niche press karina, jo niche jo icon hota na, sir. That will not be there when I'm in full screen. That's the whole problem. I am in full screen. If you let me that also, I will do what I can do. I have to probably minimize this and put that. Is, yeah. it now? is it okay now? Rajesh? Not yet, sir. sir. Can't hear me. Um, okay. Sir, at the bottom there is a. Yeah, yeah, sir. I know that, sir. I have actually. Is it okay now? Uh, no, Rajkopal, it is not the full screen. Can you hear me now? It's still not full screen. Okay, what we do now, uh, I think Rajgopal. Sir, you can, sir, 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 you can continue with this. We continue with this. Okay, okay go fine. ahead with it. Say in my laptop, it is full screen. No problem, sir, no problem. You continue. Okay, continue. Uh, so, there are two types of growth plates. One, which is responsible for the longitudinal growth. And the other one, which are called apophysis, which are at the points of attachment of a muscle. My talk to you is going to be entire about the Physis, which are responsible for the longitudinal growth. This is a good example of both in the upper end of femur. You have a physis responsible for the longitudinal growth and an apophysis at the attachment of the abductors into the trochanter. So this is what I'll be talking about epiphysis alone. Now, those plate injuries can be defined as disruption in the cartilaginous pipes of long bones. That may or may not involve the epiphysial side and the metaphysial side. So this is an example where it has taken place in the low end of femur through the physial plate. Now, the physis 
came to be described somewhere in the 1500s, but the person who had described it maximum is John Hunter. Sir, 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 sir your slides are not moving now. Huh? Really? Your slides are not moving. No? Slides are not moving, sir. Uh, Madesh, I don't know what the problem is. Is it moving now? No, no, sir, no. You have to exit and then, sir, continue. Okay. That's what we did. I will do that. Uh, no. Yeah, now moving, sir. Uh, but now it is not in the play mode. I will do one thing. I'll try to go into this and see. Is it moving now? No. Please click on the, click on the next slide, sir. Not moving, sir. Not moving. Uh, all I can do is I'm going to stop sharing, okay, and then open it again. Um, share screen. Uh, <coughs> Raj Gopal. Yes, sir. What we can do that you set your things. Uh, sir, is it opening now, there. sir? Sir, just a minute, sir. Is it opening now? Slide changing now? No, sir, same. Not okay, changing. Then, Rajesh, I you take over. Okay, Rajesh. Sir. Yeah. Rajesh, you take over. Okay, sir. Okay. In the meanwhile, let Rajgopal set his slides, okay? okay? No problem, sir. I'll just continue. Right, Rajesh. Sorry, sir. A bit late. No. Yeah. Can you see my screen, sir? Yes. I can see. Yeah. Full screen, sir? Yes. Yes. Okay. So again, good morning, everybody. Now it is good afternoon, good, good noon, whatever. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk on a very interesting topic and very controversial also. Uh, this is a DVT prevention, uh, you know, uh, latest guidelines and recommendations. So let's see. Now what is uh, venous thrombomelism? Basically, this is a blood clot in the venous system. Okay. And together, D vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism are referred as venous thromboembolism. Most of these thrombi, they resolve spontaneously, but one to four percent may develop into symptomatic venous thromboembolism. Fatal pulmonary embolism is seen in 0.3 to 1 percent following total joint orthoplasty and 3.6 percent after total hip surgery cases. So, a proactive approach to reduce the incidence of VTE is therefore of paramount importance. Now, students must be knowing what is Varsho's triad. So it is endothelial injury, hypercoagulability, and abnormal blood flow. One or all of these factors can lead to the thrombosis. Endothelial injury, uh, for example, can be during surgery or during trauma. Endothelial injury means endothelial injury to the blood vessel wall. Hypercoagulability can be there in many conditions. For example, cancer, for example, thrombophilia, for example, patient on oral contraceptives, hormone therapy. And abnormal blood flow can be due to congestive heart failure or prolonged sitting or prolonged immobilization. Normally, there is a balance between procoagulants and anticoagulants in the blood. But if any of these factors get involved, there will be chances of thromboembolism. Now, if it is not prevented, the consequences are symptomatic DVT or pulmonary embolism, fatal pulmonary embolism, increased risk of recurrence and chronic post-thrombotic syndrome. So it is very, very important to know what is venous thromboembolism or what is DVT. So if it is there, how to assess it? So there are many ways to assess. One is a clinical assessment, then there are a few tests, and then there are a few prediction tools. And let us discuss them one by one. So how the patient of DVT will present? So patient will present as pain in the limbs, discoloration of the legs, cough or leg tenderness, swelling of the leg or the lower limb, there will be warm skin and superficial veins will be prominent. 
Now there are few signs student must know. What is Homan sign? It is very important sign which he has to be listed. There is a pain in the posterior calf and knee with a forced dorsiflexion of the foot. So this is Homan sign. What is Moses sign? A gentle squeezing of the lower part of the calf from side to side will there will be tenderness or pain. What is new half sign? Thickening and deep tenderness elicited while palpating the deep in the calf muscles. This is new half sign. So these are the few signs you must be knowing. Now coming to the test, one of the blood tests done is the deep dimer. Now deep dimer is a degradation product of the cross-linked fibrin. So normal value is less than 5, 0.5 microgram per ml. But if the level is more than two, then it is considered significant. This is a sensitive test, but specificity is low. Suppose it is high in the blood, then we have to go for other investigations like ultrasonography, okay? But if it is low, then it excludes DVT. Now ultrasonography, what is known as color flow Doppler is a commonest test done by, you know, advised by we people for the diagnosis of the DVT. Then comes CT scan venography, MRI venography, and non-contrast MRI, but these are not commonly implied, but only done when there is a doubtful diagnosis or we want to do some intervention. Now coming to the prediction tools. There is a variable and there is a scoring. So active cancer within the last six months are palliative score one, Calf swelling more than three centimeter compared to the other score one, collateral superficial vein one, pitting edema one, swelling of the entire leg one. Paralysis, paralysis are recent cause immobilization of the lower extremity one, recently bedridden more than three days or major surgery one, previous DVT one, alternative diagnosis mean differential diagnosis at least as likely D-vein thrombosis minus two, localized pain along the distribution of the D-venous system one. Now what is the interpretation? There is a high probability of the DVT if it is equal to or more than three, and the prevalence of DVT here will be around 53%. Moderate probability scoring is more uh, one to two. Here, the prevalence of the DVT will be around 17%. And low probability, less than zero or zero, prevalence of DVT will be 5%. So high probability, there will be very, very high prevalence of DVT. Coming to again, very commonly used assessment model that is a Capriani risk assessment model. So the points are assigned for the different conditions, different variables here, one, two, three, and five. So these five points are there in orthopedic undermarium. So elective orthoplasty, stroke less than one month, hip pelvic or leaf fracture, multiple trauma, and acute spinal cord injury, they each carry five points. Now, what is the significance? Now it is a VTE risk and suggestive profile axis. So what it is? If the score is zero to one, incidence of the DVT will be less than 10%. It is considered a low risk patient and we don't require any specific measures, only early ambulation is required. If the score is two, the incidence of DVT will be around 10 to 20%. It is considered high risk, again, Graduated compression stocking or intermediate pneumatic compression is all that is required. If score is three to four, incidence of DVT is around 20 to 40%. They are considered high risk. Here, along with GCS and IPC, patient will require low molecular heparin or one of the oral formulations. And if the score is five or more, the DVT incidence is 40 to 80% and there will be around one to 5% mortality and it carries the highest risk. So patient again requires, you know, stockings or IPC and low molecular weight heparin are some of the oral formulations. So in high grade, high risk and highest risk level, you require some medication. Now, coming to the various predisposing risk factors. Now, active cancer or cancer treatment, age more than 60, critical care admission, dehydration, known thrombophilias, obesity, one or more significant medical comorbidities like heart disease, metabolic, endocrine or respiratory pathology, acute infectious diseases, and inflammatory conditions. Personal or first degree family history of ET, hormonal therapy, varicose veins with associated filibitis, and pregnancy are less than six weeks postpartum. Now, Depending on the risk factor, 
they are divided into strong respectors, moderate and weak respectors. So our conditions like hip and knee fracture or major surgeries like knee and hip arthroplasty, major general surgery, major trauma and spinal cord, they fall under strong risk factors. And there are so many conditions under moderate and weak risk factors. So most commonly we are using prophylaxis for hip and knee surgery and some of the you know, leg or hip fractures. Most commonly we are using for hip and knee replacement. So it comes under strong risk factor. Coming to the prophylaxis. Now prophylaxis of DVT, how we have to prevent the DVT? So it can be pharmacological or it can be mechanical. Now what is pharmacological prophylaxis? The most common drug used is low molecular weight heparin. And most of the studies they have shown that the risk of proximal DVT is reduced from 15 to 60 with this, six, 15 to 6 percent with this drug. And commonly used drug here, it will be enoxaparin. Enoxaparin is 40 milligrams subcutaneously OD to be started 12 hour or more hours preoperatively or 12 hours or more postoperatively and can be extended till 35 days post op. Other drugs are deltaparin and tinzaparin, not very commonly used. So low molecular weight heparin is the preferred choice of most of the orthopedic surgeons for all major operations. Okay, but there will be there, there will be greater bioavailability, longer half life, the uh, risk there, there there are less side effects, including hemorrhage and you know uh, LFT elevations and fever and local side direction, but the incidence is quite less as compared to the other compound. So there is a level one evidence to show that in orthopedic surgery, low molecular weight heparin is significantly superior to both unfractionated heparin and warfarin for the prevention of DVT. Okay. And it results in significantly less minor bleeding complications when compared to the UFC or unfractionated heparin but more significant, more minor bleeding when compared to the warfarin. Again, low molecular weight heparin is more efficacious than either dose adjusted UFH or warfarin when used to prevent DVT and proximal DVT following PKR. Other studies also supported that low molecular weight heparin is better for DVT prophylaxis in THR compared with warfarin or aspirin. So this is a preferred drug in most of, with most of us. Now, what is this unfractionated heparin? What is the dose? It is 5,000 units simultaneously given every eight to 12 hours. It is given two hours before surgery and we resume a full dose after surgery and a renal adjustment here is not required. But the main side effect here is thrombocytopenia in you know, up to a tune of 30%. That is known as heparin induced thrombopenia syndrome. That is known as HIT syndrome. Heparin induced thrombocytopenia syndrome. And more chances of hemorrhage and increased level of you know, liver functions, LALT and AST. Coming to other drugs which are used in the prevention, they are factor 10A inhibitors. They are in indirect inhibitors like fundaparinum. It is given 2.5 milligram OD subcutaneously six to eight hours after surgery. And there are then side effects like anemia, fever, nausea, and rash. And there are direct inhibitors like Rubber exoban, 10 milligram orally, OD. Most of us are using these drugs these days. It is begun six to 10 hours after surgery. This is an oral formulation and can be continued after th 35 days after THR. The another drug is Epixaban, which is 2.5 milligram BD. It begins to 12 to 14 hours after surgery and continued up to 32, 30, uh, 32 to 38 days after surgery. And then is the endoxaban. Another drug which is approved by the FDA is the Debigartan. A Debigartan is a direct thrombotic inhibitor. So what is the dosage? It is 110 milligram, two capsules given 
daily once a day but it does not require inr testing and there will be bleeding and git events now when we advise all these drugs one thing to remember is we have to have a baseline cbc lft and rft done for all the patients inr has to be done all these drugs when we start them but with a follow up some of them don't require inr again and again in patients undergoing major orthopedic surgery who decline or are uncooperative with the injections or an ipcd recommend using rabaroxaban apixaban and dabigatran and then we can also use vka vitamin k antagonist or aspirin now what is vitamin k antagonist it is warfarin commonly used drug in the past now less and less community is used but still few of us use it so it is recommended by the latest AP accp guidelines for the prophylaxis in patients undergoing thr here target inr would be around 2.5 and range between 2 to 3 so we have to have you know inr done very frequently when we are using warfarin normal level of warfarin for the post surgery is 1.1 but when the patient is on drugs then we have to maintain this range not more than this okay so dose is adjusted based on inr results but the reversal of effect can be there with a vitamin d vitamin k injections so the patient has side effects it is not tolerated there is a bleeding so you can give the patient vitamin d okay so the adverse effects are alopecia hemorrhage and tissue necrosis which is very rare another drug you know which came into existence for the prophylaxis a recent few years back is the aspirin now it inhibits thrombexin a2 it is inexpensive easily administered and low rate of bleeding convenient dose 81 mg bd for 4 to 6 weeks and many of the studies have shown that they reduce the risk of dvt by up to 36% in thr patients but the use is restricted in only low to moderate risk categories or when you expect an extended prophylaxis when extended prophylaxis is desired then we use aspirin but it is not used as a sole drug in the latest recommendations here what i was talking it is not included as an appropriate sole option for the prevention of vte but in patients undergoing elective tkaa or who have a contraindication to the pharmacological prophylaxis or uh, and undergoes a tha and hip surgery aspirin in conjunction with the compression device as a part of multi multi modal approach would meet these measures okay it is not used as a sole agent in the prevention of dvt now this is a meta analysis of many studies from 1980 now what it shows it shows in the absence of pharmacological prior prophylaxis the post operative risk of vte in total hip replacement would be around 39% and in total knee replacement total hip replacement 39% and total hip knee replacement it will be around 46% so this is a meta analysis done from many studies now what are the contraindications to the pharmacological prophylaxis where we cannot give it if patient is already on oral anticoagulants with inr more than 2 there is a thrombocytopenia known bleeding disorder evidence of active bleeding uncontrolled hypertension lumbar puncture or epidural spinal analysis is expected within next 12 hours or performed within last 4 hours and a new stroke patient so this is the contraindication for the pharmacological thromboprophylaxis now coming to mechanical prophylaxis now this is very very important in every post operative patient you know early mobilization 
I am doing this for years together now. You know, when the patient is able to sit, even if you have given, you know, epidural or spinal, as early as possible, start mobilization. Maybe on the side of the bed. Ask the patient to do, you know, quadriceps exercises. Start movement. You have to help the patient out, you know. So this is very, very important for the prevention of the DVT. Secondly, you can use these compressive stockings. No, compressive stocking, they are special type of the stockings with a pressure gradient. The gradient increases from distal to proximal. At the ankle, it is around 18%. At the upper calf, it is 14 At the thigh level, it is 8 So that is why they are known as graduated compression stockings. And many studies have shown that the incidence of DVT is reduced with the use of these compressive stockings. Third, there is intermittent pneumatic compression device, what I was talking about, IPCD. So how they help? They decrease the venous stasis. They improve the blood flow velocity. They increase the level of circulating fibrinolysin. It requires no monitoring, no increase in bleeding, and generally they are very well tolerated. But how they work? There's an inflation and there's a deflation. So inflation is for around 10 to 20 seconds and deflation is around for 40 seconds. So that, that is why it is known as intermittent pneumatic compression device. Basically, they pump the blood out of the veins. Okay, that is why it is known as IPCD. Third one is the venous foot pump. They are also used for the prevention in prolong, you know, prolonged mobilized patients and there is a pressure gradient which is more at the foot and less. It is around 135 millimeter mercury and at the leg level or calf level it is around 40 to 45 millimeter mercury. Now what are the recommendations? In an elective hip and knee replacement, we can use mechanical prophylaxis and mechanical prophylaxis in this type of surgery has to be started as soon as the patient is admitted in the hospital. And it has to be continued till the patient starts ambulating. Okay. Coming to pharmacological, there are so many drugs we can use. We don't have to use, you know, more drugs. Only one drug is sufficient for prophylaxis. We can use dabigatan, we can use fondaparinum, we can use no molecular weight heparin, we can use rubber oxaban, and we can use unfractionated heparin. But in a replacement, the total duration is around 28 to 35 days. In a replacement, hip knee replacement, it is for 10 to 14 days. Coming to hip, hip fractures surgeries, not replacement, other hip fracture surgeries, Again, mechanical prophylaxis is indicated along with the pharmacological. Here again, we can do few drugs, fondaparinum, low molecular weight heparin, rubber oxaban, and unfractionated heparin. Okay. Other orthopedic surgeries we can also use, but not commonly. There are only few drugs mentioned here, low molecular weight heparin and unfractionated heparin. Coming to the NICE guidelines for VTE prophylaxis for patients undergoing elective THR. L guideline says that use low molecular weight, weight heparin for 10 days and then switch over to the aspirin. And most of us are doing this now. And aspirin can be continued up to 28 days. Okay. The other recommendation is low molecular weight heparin in combination with the stockings anti-embolism stocking until the patient is discharged. But then use this low molecular repair to veterinarian for 28 days. It is not combined with aspirin. And third one is oral rubber oxaban, apixaban, or dabigatan more than 14 days. Can continue up to 35 days. But we don't have to use all these drugs in combination. Only one of the drugs has to be used. Now, what the ACCP guideline says, they recommend the use of low molecular weight heparin, low dose unfractionated heparin, vitamin K antagonist warfarin, fundaparinum, aspirin, or an IPCD for at least 10 to 14 days and up to 35 days. Most of the studies are saying that. 
Now, this study shows that early prophylaxis in surgical patients with low molecular weight heparin has been associated with significant reduction in post venous thrombosis. And he has shown that initiation of therapy within eight hours of surgery has the greatest effect. The ACCP guideline says that low molecular repair should be given to the patients undergoing major orthopedic procedure at least 12 hours preoperatively and or postoperatively. Now coming to comparative effectiveness of mechanical prophylaxis versus no prophylaxis. Studies have shown that mechanical prophylaxis only significantly decreases DVT thrombosis. Other studies have shown that the risk of proximal or distal DVT was not significantly different when you are using the mechanical prophylaxis only. But the data are not available to evaluate the comparative effect of mechanical prophylaxis versus no prophylaxis on other outcomes. Now, it has been shown by the latest guidelines from the ACCP that use of mechanical methods in addition to the pharmacological prophylaxis during hospitalization with a high risk patients are advisable. Now, in patients undergoing major orthopedic surgery, evidence condemns the use of inferior vena cava filter placement for primary prevention over no thromboprophylaxis. It is not recommended routinely but it is recommended in those patients who are at rise, is high risk, especially young patient with a proximal DVT. And when the other form of you know, pharmacological, the prophylaxis is contraindicated in high risk patients. Routinely, it is not used. Coming to some Indian studies. The previous studies have shown because it is shown in literature that the DVT, you know, it is very un uncommon, it is uncommon in Indian and Asian population. And it is more common in the whites and blacks. So few of the earliest Indian studies have shown that since the incidence of DVT in Indian patient is very low, so it is not a cost effective to advise prophylaxis in the Indian patients undergoing TH and TKA. Another Indian studies have shown that a very high level of suspicion and close clinical monitoring is mandatory and routine chemoprophylaxis is professed not justified in every patient. Then comes another study later on in 2016. They have shown, now this is opposite. VT is not uncommon in Indian patients. So optimal implementation of VT, e prophylaxis and treatment is required. So what is the conclusion? Patients undergoing THR are at the highest risk. VTE prophylaxis, mechanical and or pharmacological should be implemented. VTE prophylaxis with low molecular weight heparin seems to be more efficient overall compared with other available methods of VTE prophylaxis. Capitalism remains about the use of aspirin as the sole method for the VTE prophylaxis in THR patients. Thank you. Sir, hello. Sir, you are muted. Sir, Rajkumar, you are muted, sir. Uh, thank you, Rajesh. Yeah. Rajesh, I will just try sharing my screen again. Yeah. Okay. First, open my thing. Is it coming, Rajesh? Not yet, sir. Not yet. Okay, then I will do one thing. I'll first share the screen, Op open it, and then share the screen. Not coming even now? Not yet, sir. I don't know what is wrong. Okay. Just go up again. Okay. Then, sir, you have to unmute, sir. Uh, what is wrong? Just close it. Maybe I close it and open it. 
Let's see whether that will work. Sir, uh, sir, can you send me your presentation? I can share from here if possible. Yeah, I, I, I just try once, Rajesh, because uh, uh, I've just closed the presentation. I'm just opening it again and trying. Uh, let's just see if it works no. that way. Is it coming now? Rajesh, no? Not, sir, not. Uh, Raj Gopal. Yes, sir. But I will suggest you, yes, send, you send your presentation on my email. Okay, sir. Right. We'll open it up here and then you can give your lecture. In the meanwhile, I think uh, with the permission of chairperson, sir, we can take Dr. James Sherman's wardrobe to start with. Yes, we can do that. Right. James, uh, I think you can yeah, I'm ready, your sir. wardrobe. And uh, Raj Gopal, yeah. you send your uh, lecture on my email. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Okay. Oh, what's the Is my screen visible, sir? Sir, full screen, sir, full screen, Data Jant? Yeah. Not happening. Now it is okay. Good. Okay. Uh, I'll start with my wardrobe presentation. Before that, uh, I want to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity uh, to present uh, this uh, lecture. Being a DNB examiner and MS examiner, I think wardrobe is an area which can make and break the result. It carries some 40 marks and that is quite a big chunk of your uh, presentation. Usually when you are going for a ward round in examination, you are taken to a place like this where you will find a lot of uh, walkers, beds, tractions, etc. So I have uh, uh, divided this uh, talk in three parts and it would be an interactive uh, session sort where I'll ask questions also after giving a brief intro of the topic. So the first part is the tractions. Normally, there are two types of traction, the skin or a skeletal traction. The skin traction, we when we are using adhesive, we give up to 6.7 kgs of weight and non-adhesive is 4.5 kgs of weight. So usually examiners are fond of asking this question, what is a fixed traction, what is a sliding traction? A fixed traction is traction applied to the leg against a fixed point of counter traction. The length of the limb remains constant in this. Uh, second one is a sliding traction. This was first described in 1839 by John Hedy James, used to tie the patient. The initial weight was 10% of the body weight. Height, one inch, counter traction height was one inch for one pound. This is the next. Uh, thing which is usually asked that is a Thomas splint. A Thomas splint descriptions, it was first described uh, by Johann Thomas in 1876. It was used as a knee appliance for ambulant management of knee inflammation. The degree of inner side bar to the ring is 120 degrees. The outer, outer bar has a padded ring of 5 centimeters. The distal sling Above the heel should be around two inches. The straps below the heel should be beyond two inches. A master pad of Henry is usually applied at the level of knee joint, which has to be a six into nine inches. But when compressed, it has to be of two inches. For measuring the size of the ring, oblique circumference of the thigh just below the gluteal fold is taken. If swelling, non-injured limb plus two inches. Length of the splint is from cross to heel plus six inches. This is used basically to maintain reduction, but not to obtain reduction. Counter traction passes up the side bars. The line drawn from GT to the lateral mellulus is uh, one of the straps and lateral strap is behind and parallel to the line. The medial strap is above the line. This is to encourage the medial rotation. So in simple words, for the outer cord should be above and inner cord should be below, like it is shown over here. 
principles of effective and proper traction this is another viva question is your traction effective so these are the points that has to be described the traction must produce a pulling effect on the body the counter traction must be maintained slings and splints must be suspended without interference ropes must move freely through the pulleys and weight must hang free now coming on to a question answer session if uh, you are interacting uh, question usually asks is what is being applied over here what are the indications what precautions do you take to apply this and what are the complications anybody wants to try any of the students so is surface traction which is being applied here okay. in the in the left one it is it is non adhesive yeah i'm not able to uh, listen to what's being said so this is a skin okay. traction above me yeah okay this is above me skin traction here it is a adhesive one this is non adhesive indication for fractures around the hip joint and shaft of femur precautions bony prominences should be padded and complications are pressure sores and common peroneal nerve injuries can occur if the traction is not applied properly what is this traction and what is wrong the wrong indications hints are given by these arrows again this is a sliding traction we don't know whether it is balanced or not this area should be 2 inches free which is not there is no master pad of handery and it is not snugly fitting up to the crotch and what is this application and what will you want to correct here so basically this is a ankle traction applied over a thomas splint but the problem here is that the rotation of the limb is not taken care of hence there will be pressure over here at the head of fibula and common peroneal nerve palsy would be a major issue this is a sliding traction it is used in older children with fever fractures and can be treated with skin traction in thomas splint another example of ankle traction this is wrongly applied again the limb is lying in external rotation which has not been corrected so this is known as a buck traction it is a longitudinal traction applied to the extremity in one direction with single pulley and keeping the leg in extended position this is the correct method of applying a buck traction where you have to flex it at the knee joint there should be a single pulley taking the weight name this traction what age group it is applied nowadays we don't uh, apply uh, on basis of age it is now uh, the guidelines has changed to the weight so any child who is less than 15 kg of weight you can apply this type of traction gallows or bryant traction yes. used for treatment of fractures of shaft of femur it is up to 2 years of age 15 kg how much overlap is acceptable overlap of the fracture fragment is half inches is acceptable the child's buttocks should be just off the bed knee should be in slight flexion skin must be intact and above knee skin traction is usually applied this is an example of dunlop traction the only problem in both these application is that the elbow and shoulder should be at 45 degrees which is not maintained over here now coming on to the skeletal type of tractions the basic method of skeletal traction was proposed by martin kirschner and lorenz boller it is not boller it is boller usually it is applied by using these three pins a stenman pin or a shans uh, sorry k wire or a denham pin the various points where you apply these type of uh, pins are the tip of uh, i mean that uh, olecranon upper tibia metatarsals calcaneum and so on to remember it's always easy to remember 3 cm 2.5 cm above the knee joint 2.5 cm below the trochanter 
2.5 centimeters below the tuberosity and similarly here uh, in and it is applied in second and third metacarpal 2 cm proximal to the distal end and olecranon 2 cm distal to the tip of olecranon gt 2 cm distal to the same thing is being repeated in this slide now in this one uh, this is a skeletal traction being applied usually a lot of examiners tend to ask what are the steps of applying a stenman pin for skeletal traction so the limb should lie in the exact rotation as the normal limb. Here it is neutral, which is wrong. Secondly, it should lie parallel to the ground. Here he is putting it in an oblique uh, method. So here, what is wrong in this application? This is a above uh, knee, I mean, uh, TVL traction, above uh, upper TVL traction and uh, there is no master pad of henry and the strappings i mean the, the traction cords are very close to the skin this is another example of a lower tbl skeletal traction this is the only area where you apply the pin from medial to lateral side this is example of lower femoral pin the the correct method of applying the pin would be giving it in a uh, bolus stirrup, uh, sorry, bolus, uh, bolo bronze plate. Now, this is a bolus stirrup. It is used for changing the direction of the traction forces. It is used for suspending the traction cords. It is used to fix the stirrup pin to the traction units. Now, this is a older method of treating ipsilateral fractures of shaft of femur and shaft of tibia this is known as a chanlay's traction unit the advantage is that equinal deformity does not occur tendocalcaneus is protected and rotation of foot and distal fragment is controlled with this type of cast and traction method this is the acetabular traction used for or uh, trochanteric traction pin which is used for central fracture dislocation or, and fracture on the acetabulum this is a box apparatus which has different pulleys this one is used for lower uh, tibia upper tibia and so, uh, femur. This is a box apparatus, I mean, sorry, bowl of bronze splint, and uh, different pulleys have that significance. This one is for calcaneum and lower tibial, upper tibial, lower femoral, and this is to prevent equinus. This is not to treat foot drop, but to prevent equinus. This is a pelvic traction unit, a pelvic traction given for low back pain patients. Wrong is the knee should be flexed and this should go from this, uh, this pulley. The traction cord should go from this pulley. Removal of traction, elbow fractures with olecranon pin at three weeks, tibial fracture with calcaneum pin at four weeks, trochanteric fractures six weeks and femoral shaft fracture with cast brace six weeks and without cast brace 12 weeks now this is pin tract infections classification and the given by otterburn classification that is uh, minor and major infection classification one two three are minor four five six are uh, major infections in one it is slight redness to redness of the skin discharge pain and tenderness grade 2 plus no improvement in antibiotics in grade 4 there is severe soft tissue infection 5 is 4 plus radiographic changes that is osteolysis along uh, around the pin and in 6 there is infection after fixator removal so how do you do a pin track care is another exact uh, question which is usually asked you wash your hand thoroughly including between the fingers and back of hand 
Now, once you are sterile and uh, aseptic, gently massage the skin around the pins with your fingertips to bring drainage to the surface so that it can be clean. Saturate a sterile cotton swab in the cleansing solution. Gently apply the solution on the pin site at a time. Swab in circular motion. Remove any crust that is formed around the pin. Now, this is one of the tractions, although this it would be something like this in the ward. This is being used for uh, intra uh, operative uh, skeletal traction through the cervical spine. So, this is a Crutchfield's tongue, which is used for skeletal traction for cervical spine area. This is another one, which is known as a garden well tongue. These are used, and the drill bit that is used for applying this is known as a guarded drill bit, which is a guard for not piercing the inner table. Weights which can be used, uh, the amount of weight which could be used with the crush tongs, tongs, 2.5 kg for head and half kg for each vertebra. It should be neutral line with the auditory meters. Flexion needed, use double pillows. This is a traction, head halter traction which is given this is another example of a sliding traction given for uh, transportation of a patient of cervical injury, reducing spasm in cases of whiplash injuries and after torticollis surgery. This is a repetition of what I have said. Uh, in few centers, you will find this type of bed which is uh, which has a uh, trapeze which can be held upon and the patients, the nursing could be done. This is a Balkans frame with pulley system for applying Thomas tractions and a trapeze or chain for uh, better nursing of the patient. And the second section we come on to the plasters. Calcium sulfate full hydrate plus heat is the plaster of Paris reaction. Plaster of Paris is calcium sulfate hemihydrate with water. The initial set is when the crystal starts to interlock, signal end of working time, final set is end of exothermic period and hard set is complete interlocking taking place in 48 hours of plaster application and end of drying out period. So, normally above elbow slab or cast, whatever is applied, the extent should be just below the deltoid insertion, distally up to the knuckles or distal palm of hands. And below elbow, proximal extent just below the elbow crease and distals, again, it should be at the level of distal palm of hands. Above being proximal extent lower two-third of the thigh, distal extend up to the metatarsophalangeal joint. Below knee, proximal extent should be 2 cm below the tibial tubercle and distal same as above. So this is above elbow slab being applied in neutral position, mid prone position. Around the elbow, if there is an injury around the elbow, we give above elbow slab in mid supination. Or this is an example of mid supinated uh, above elbow slab. This is above elbow cast, distal palmar crease. This is a gutter plaster uh, cast. This is a functional position of hand in which the wrist is 20 to 30 degree of extension. MCP is 45 degree flexion, PIP is 15 degree flexion, and DIP again 15 degree flexion. Common question, this was asked to me also in my DNV exam, what is a zero position? The position of a joint when a person is in standard and position, joint movements are said to deviate from or return to the zero position. And the functional position is a position where uh, functional position. 
In other words, the best position in which the joint can be fixed. This is a thumb spike cast, and also uh, would be uh, this is a glass holding scaphoid cast. Now this extent is not correct because it is not going up to two centimeters below the olecranon tip. This is a distal tibia. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, baloney cast being applied over here. With the problem is the foot is kept in bit inversion. This is the above knee slab. The toes are not visible, and knee flexion is not there. Again, there is a mistake in this. This is a boot and bar splint, which is nowadays not used. It is also called a B rotation bar. It was. It is used for uh, avoiding. external rotation deformity at the level of hip joint in uh, trochanter fractures either fixed unstable or not fixed treated conservatively here a double spica is being applied for case of ddh here the precaution should be that the hip should be in abduction external rotation not beyond 60 degrees in case of bilateral again this is another bilateral hip spica which is being applied for or a a cast you can call it it is used in cases of perthes disease this is a one and a half spica which is used for non operative treatment of fractures of shaft of humerus sorry femur uh this is another important aspect of all examination that is a ct ni cast every student is Uh, should know about the variant in one of the centers we kept as models and the examiner was asking which one is used i mean which one is for which stage of the correction of ct this is a spin back frame this has a curvature over here and a open last shoe the toe box is free this is used for maintenance after correction has been obtained in ct so if if it is a unilateral case one side would be 45 other one would be 70 degrees if it is bilateral then both the sides would be 60 degrees this is a functional cast brace for elbow joint and this is a patellar tendon bearing uh, fcv being applied over here the principle of uh applying a functional cast braces muscle action and intermittent axial compression stimulates bone union now coming on to the next aspect that is about the fixators usually ward will have these type of patients so describe the type of fixator how is the pin to rod distance calculated it are common questions asked so the as per aj thakur's book it should be 4 cm up 4 inches sorry 4 cm above the skin the inner rod and this is a universal ao type of external fixator used with two hollow rods the pins that are used in this are shanks pins this is a esculap type of external fixator which is uh used uh, which was used initially but the uh, disadvantage of this was that it is not axially stable here number of clamps are less and rods are uh, passed through single clamp i mean uh, one clamp can uh, host two rods for that reason it is not a very stable construct as compared to the previous one that is the ao type of uh, external fixator so what is wrong what all is wrong over here the skin to uh, rod distance the clamp distance is very less over here the dressing which is done is very compressive and in this the fixator has been applied if you can appreciate on the anterior aspect ideally it should be 45 degrees angle to the shin yeah one more thing 
it is applied on a single rod again this makes it a unstable external fixator ideally a ao type of external fixator should have two rods per segment this is a ao type of distractor nowadays we use a jess distractor this was the original ao distractor used for ligamento taxis purposes what is this assembly known what are its principle this is a jess assembly jess named after dr bb joshi joshi's external stabilizing system it works on controlled differential distraction for correction of ctv again this is the distractor of uh, joshi's external stabilizing system here it is used for primary fixation in cases of pylon fractures before you do a ct and fix it another example of jess fixator being used here in this this is a elizondo ring fixation system which has rings rods wire fixation bolts which could be centric or eccentric sometimes hinges are being used for correction of deformity the wires that are used are of two types i a simple 1.8 mm k wires or a olive drop wires this is the principle on it uh, what it works is controlled differential dist distraction this is a orthofix device the important thing about this is that each segment should have minimum of 3 pins two in proximal one in distal two distal one proximal so and so forth it is used for orthofix or railroad these are used for uni planner uh, distraction of the uh, corticotomy what is wrong over here again the number of pins are less now miscellaneous usually have patient with bed sores paraplegic patients so you would be asked about the different grades of bed sores grade 1 is a non blanchable erythema grade 2 is partial thickness skin loss 3 is full thickness skin loss and 4 is extensive destruction what are important uh, equipments that you have on this is uh, uh, hydrogen hydrogen peroxide sterilium betadine lotion and this nasty device called as cheetel's forceps hydrogen uh, hydrogen peroxide works on nascent oxygen delivery system to uh, in the wounds to remove the slough betadine that is being used is 7.5% 2.5 to 7.5% so equipments on a trolley in the top shelf there would be sterile dressing tray having forceps gauze swabs towels and dissecting forceps kidney tray hand towels sterile gloves chitil forceps and galley pot galley pot is to wash the hand the bottom shelf will have drums containing bandages gamji gloves topical drugs antiseptic solutions kidney tray for dirty instruments and receiver for using the towels and swabs and this is the chitil forceps ideally it should be autoclaved when if it is uh, nowadays in orthopedic wards you will hardly find a chitil forceps but if it is at all used it has to be autoclaved daily it... now what is usol it is edinburgh university solution of lime it is chlorinated lime borate it releases nascent chlorine which is a desluffing agent most effective against pseudobonas it has 12.5 grams of bleaching powder 12.5 grams of boric acid in distilled water to make it a 1 liter solution povidone iodine 5% weight volume it is iodine combined combined with polyvinyl pyrolodin it is broad spectrum effective against gram positive gram negative fungi protozoa and viruses now coming on to spirit it has 70% alcohol nowadays instead of spirit it is uh, sterilium which is more more commonly used which is a isopropyl alcohol 
it acts by dissolving cell membranes proteins denaturation and dehydration of the cells by evaporation it is a bacteriostatic antiseptic mild rubefacient counter irritant when used on exo excoriation of the skin hydrogen peroxide i have already told you about that machinil bosch sterilization drum one of the examiners may ask you the name of this drum so it is a schmil bosch sterilization drum and the material that is used is autensentic steel which is non quenchable non magnetic type of steel the autoclave setting is uh, 30 minutes at 120 degrees for 4 minutes or 32 degrees centigrade what are the recent advances in this type of dressing this is a foam dressing used with uh cellophane tape it is used for negative suction dressing nowadays we use is this which is a vac or a wag dressing so you should know everything about wag dressing as to how much pressure is to be applied how much duration it has to be applied what is a pulse wag what is a continuous wag and when it has to be removed in our pg times tanaya sir used to Uh, apply this for double negative suction using a malicot catheter and a negative suction drain for different types of uh, i mean uh, drainage of uh, osteomyelitic cavities this is a sumac dressing or magnesium sulfate dressing which is a hygroscopic uh, material used to decrease the edema this is a manual use uh, manual used or pedal uh, suction machine the capacity of this is usually asked by few of the examiners which is 750 ml this would be kept in the trolley that would be a plaster cutting instrument the hennings plaster spreader or a bowler plaster sealer or a styles Shear. There are three different types of plaster cutting saw. This one is the angle saw, the Bregman saw, and this is the oscillating plaster cutting saw. Amputation saw resembles the tenon saw, where plaster saw is like a machine saw. This is the difference between a amputation saw and a plaster cutting saw. That means in a plaster cutting saw, both to and fro movement the teeth of plaster cutting saw cuts in both to and fro movement but amputation saw cuts only in the forward movement now this is a uh, euro bag the capacity is 2 liters iv stand one of my dnb student was asked this in one of the centers about the specification for iv stand it would be a 5 leg or a 4 leg uh, stand which has 2 to 4 hooks the material used is a chrome epoxy coated steel the maximum height that could be achieved is 102 inches minimum height is 56 inches then uh, catheters you should know about what are indwelling catheters what are condom catheters and what is intermittent self catheterization so maintaining an indwelling catheter usually you are asked how to take care of a catheter what is a catheter dressing when you wash your hand uh, before and after carrying of the patient wear gloves when hand, handling a indwelling catheter clean the perineal, uh, perineal area with soap and water twice daily avoid using lotion or power powder in the perineal area arrange for the patient to take shower or tub bath when permitted change the indwelling catheter as and when is a uh, needed like in accordance with the policy of the hospital this is a foley's catheter and this one is a k90 catheter the color coding of this foley's catheter has to be uh, remembered second important thing that is asked is how do you deflate i mean how do you remove a 
police catheter the first you have to remove the uh, fluid which is injected in the balloon usually it is a normal saline or a distilled water which is uh, the balloon is over here in which there is almost 15 ml of fluid could be injected and first remove that and then pull out the catheter if the fluid is not coming out don't try to pull it or you may cause urethral injuries though in guidelines on size in women 12 Any problem, Jen? Jen? Sir, please mute or uh, unmute yourself. Yeah. Am I audible now? <coughs> Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay, sir. Yeah, it's okay now. Yeah. So orange uh, color code is for French size 6, red 8, yeah. yellow is 10, so on and so forth. Now intracat color code is also sometimes asked. Usually we use a pink for adults that is 20, blue is 22, lime is 24 to use for pediatric age group and green is 18 where you have to uh, push large amount of fluid in a very short time. A Romovec drain has different color codes. 8 is blue, 10 is black, 12 is uh, white, 14 is green, 16 orange and 18 is red. Usually we use either 10 or four, uh, this thing, green one that is 14. Can anybody tell something about this? Okay, this is Nicole Andre tree, which is also called as an orthopedic tree. You will find it in few of the hospitals where there is an orthopedic department. This type of tree being pasted in the uh, corridor. So, if you are going for a military hospital examination or a base hospital examination, you will find few cases of amputations. The common questions are asked, what is a gulotine, what is a myodesis, and what is a myoplasty? When it is cut through, it is a gulotine. Then myodesis is uh, myodesis is a bone to muscle fixation and myoplasty is muscle to muscle fixation. Another thing that is asked is bandaging technique of below knee and above knee amputees. These are the different steps in which this uh, bandaging is to be done. This is for above uh, knee amputation. Another thing that is asked is the bed mattress. This is an airbag. Another important aspect of uh, ward round is knowing the biomedical based color coding for uh, yellow uh, bags are for non chlorinated plastic bags, punch up proof containers, and they have to be sent for incineration. Red one are to be 
sent as per schedule 1 blue is chemical waste black is for municipal waste intercoastal drainage that is thoracotomy thoracostomy this is uh, using a chest tube which is again measured in the french catheter 20 to 40 french catheter diameters are used it is connected to drainage canister using an additional tubing an indication of intercoastal drainage is unresolved primary pneumothorax secondary pneumothorax unilateral pleural effusion empyema bilateral pleural effusion or a tension pneumothorax <coughs> contraindications are intercoastal drainage coagulopathy of uh, intercoastal drainages coagulopathy hemothorax and local infection Usually, it is uh, intercostal drainage is done in the lower border of axilla at the fifth intercostal space, the lateral edge of pectoral is major and lateral edge of latissimus dorsi. CT uh, chest tube drainage less than 10 ml per hour into six hours pre removal. No air leak should be present. Stable respiratory status of 24 per minute respiratory rate. Coagulation parameters should be within normal limits. Now, this is another important uh, instrument, uh, sorry, uh, device which is kept in the ward, which is called as a walking frame or a zimmer frame or a walker. Because uh, this, I mean, uh, first of it was described by the Zimmer company, who it is known as a zimmer frame. And uh, she used to work with Aina Vifal, used to work with Zimmer. Herself was a polio sufferer and for her easy mobil, uh, mobilization, she devised this instrument. <clears throat> now, coming on to the dressing part, dressings are used to cover wound, prevent contamination, and control bleeding. In providing first aid, we commonly use self adhesive dressings or gauze dressings. Adhesive dressings are usually mainly of, for small wounds. Gauze dressings are thick cotton pad used to cover large wounds. They are held in place with the help of tape or wrapping gauze strip. Dressing must be sterile and absorbent to deter the growth of bacteria and should be left in place until the wound heals. Roller bandage application step number one is fixing, number two is rolling, and third is securing. After bandaging, you should check for <coughs> nail bread circulation, pulse, and tingling coldness. Inability to move fingers has to be reported. A medical gauze is a bleached white cloth or fabric used in bandages. Commonly used size is 4 into 4 inches. Surgical gauze must meet the standard of purity and thread count. Sponges are often referred to as gauze pads. They come in two sizes, 2 into 2 and 4 into 4 inches. The woven gauze and non-woven gauzes are two different type of gauzes that are available. The woven gauze has loose open weave which allows fluid from the wound to be absorbed into the fiber and non-woven consists of fibers pressed together to resemble a weave. Thank you for your patient listening and this is one of my books which is available on Amazon nowadays. Thank you. Then? Yes sir. Thanks a lot. Now we. Angad Gopal. Sir, Gopal. Sir, just one permission needed, sir. Okay. It's my first uh, post op post hip replacement. I'm in my hospital bed itself. Okay. So I'll. Uh, if there are any questions, students may ask. Uh, I, I think uh, the questions are at the end of this talk, next talk, and I especially advise the, all the students that they should send us their question now so that we can discuss it at the end of the uh, us talk. Thank you, Dr. Rajagopalan, sir. Thank <laughs> you.
Rajopan sir, when you have to move this light, kindly say next so we can move this light further. Can you listen to me? Sir, can I start? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I'm sorry for the problem. I really do not know where it came from, but somehow the, uh, in mine it was moving. So, okay, can I have the next slide? Yes. Next slide. Mm. Lose time on that. Sir, for me, it's remaining same slide. Just for a second, please. Oh, okay, sir. I'm sorry, sorry, sir, because I don't know yeah, whether it is moving or not. We, uh, that's why I'm we having the same problem. You were having it. <laughs> yes, sir. I don't know. That's what something wrong, sir. I don't know. Um, normally, we try it out before starting. Okay, sir. Yeah, Go now ahead. it's all right. Um, yes, sir. I'm sorry for the problem and I thank Dr. Taneja for uh, allowing me this to present the talk with after all these problems. Um, for, to begin with, I'm going to talk about the, there are two types of phytis. My talk will be about the, uh, the epiphytes, which are at the ends of the bone, which are responsible for the longitudinal growth. The other epiphysis or the growth plate is at the apophysis, where your attachment of muscles. Next slide, that, uh, that's not coming into the purview of this talk. Next slide, sir. Okay, uh, that's fine, sir. Uh, so the physial fractures could be fractures of the physis without, without involvement of the metaphysial bone. Next slide. And uh, the max the earlier description was in detail was given by John Hunter, so he's called the father of the growth plate. However, next slide, sir. The first classification which is produced, the which is popular, still used is one by Robert Salter and, um, and Harris in 1963, the classification which is accepted, frequently utilized, and commonly referred as Salter-Harris classification. Next slide. Now, before we go to the details of classification, a basic knowledge of anatomy is a must. And uh, these phases of the growth plate and uh, divide in different zones. The resting zone is the initial one closer to the physis which contains of germinal layers. Then you have the proliferative zone and then you have the hypertrophic zone. Some book gives the uh, fourth zone of functional classification. Uh, in others, this hypertrophic zone is divided into three. This is more accepted, include, which includes a maturation zone, degeneration zone and the functional classification zone. And uh, the, the all three come under hypertrophic zone. Now a little bit of our next slide, please. Yeah, the, the, the resting zone or the germinal zone or reserve zone, which is closest to the physis, and it consists of irregularly scattered chondrocytes with low, low rates of proliferation. The importance of this zone is that it contains the developing cartilage cells, but more important, it stores the necessary materials like lipids, glycogen, and proteoglycan aggregates for the later growth. So injury to this layer will cause cessation of growth. The second, these cells proliferate, as we call proliferative zone, 
in the under the histology they look the chondrocytes look flattened and they now come into a regular columns and this produce matrix and that is responsible for the longitudinal growth next slide sir the next layer is the hypertrophic zone which i also already mentioned divided into the maturation zone degeneration zone and positional calcification zone in totally in this hypertrophic zone the cells increase in size that is the maturation size then as they increase they accumulate mito uh, uh, accumulate and then deteriorate the deterioration is what is called degeneration zone and lastly the ultimate is the cell death which releases calcium and uh, this calcium impregnates the matrix with this calcium is impregnated into the matrix that is the positional calcification in this layer no active growth occurs this is the weakest portion of the physis and this is where some some of the fractures happen and alteration like disease in rickets also happen in this layer next slide there are two other things in the anatomy which will come under when you know when you come to the classification that is the groove of ranver and the ring of lockroy this physis is encircled encircled in periphery by a fibrocartilaginous tissue which cannot be seen with the naked eye that is something which is seen only under a microscope so this is a structure at the diaphysial end what is the importance this contains the chondroblasts osteoblasts and fibroblasts that support the growth so that's important the ring of lockrock lockroy is a strong fibrous structure which connects the epiphyseal periosteum to metaphyseal periosteum and that gives stability to the physis will the importance of this will come under later next slide sir. so this is just to show the uh, what we discussed before that's the uh, germinal layer where irregular chondrocytes they become flattened then they become hypertrophic then they degenerate leaving the calcium and that you have this zone where the calcification the zone of positional calcification just below that is the metaphysis next slide so uh, the importance is that there is no circulation which exists in the cartilage zone the uh, the resting layers get some vessels from the epiphysis then the metaphysial uh, vessels are the ones to supply the area below the positional calcification next slide now the physial fractures may traverse several zone depending upon where the germinal layer to the proliferative layer the most common is along the hypertrophic zone uh, it depends on the mechanism when you have a compression load the failure will be in the zone of the proliferative calcification whereas a tension force causes the failure of the proliferative zone next slide uh, there are many classifications described in literature starting from 1863 i will not be going into all the classifications for the lack of the time the one which is most commonly uh used is the salt harris classification i will go into the details but among the various classifications starting from hosher polen salt harris etc to ogden and peterson peterson is the last classification i have no of and uh, the the this slide this is the peterson classification the only one important thing of this is the type 1 of peterson is not described in any other classification next slide This is the Ogden's classification. He described nine, uh, nine types. He got a book on uh, entirely on the pediatric injuries, and he he used next slide. He used the first five of five types of Salter Harris one, two, three, four, five. That remained the same. The next four are described by him. Again, I am not going to detail. Next slide. Now I will go into the uh, Salter Harris classification detail because that is what we are going to use for management in this talk. The first first the first uh, type of salter harris classification is through the physis there is no uh, involvement of the epiphysis or metaphysical side and which may be displaced which may not be displaced type 2 is a fracture through the physis with taking a fragment of the metaphysis type 3 is through the epiphysis to the physis and going along the physial line the fourth one is involving all the three zones that is epiphysis physis and metaphysis and type 5 is a compression fracture where the growth plate is crushed or growth plate is affected next slide 
uh, it, this is a type 1 fracture, which we already described. It is a transverse fracture to the hypertrophic zone. In this injury, if you see the picture where the arrow, black arrow in the X-ray, you can make out that the physis is widened. So if there, the physis widening is the one which will give you the clue. But um, sometimes, next, next slide, the injury may be so minimal. The X-ray below, X-ray above, you can see the two white arrows. You can make out the physis widening. But the next X-ray, if you look at the X-ray alone, it probably might look which is there's no injury, but clinical correlation is a must. And when the patient had a swelling and tenderness on the medial side, which corresponded, and the radial side, now if you look at the X-ray, the medial physis is slightly more wider than the physis, physis wider than the lateral side. So it's probably a case of a subtle Salter Harris type 1 injury. Next slide. Type 2 takes a fragment of the metaphyser along with it. And you can see the black line that is the periosteum. So if the periosteum is intact, and this fragment that way, if the want to reduce, it is stable. The fragment may be quite big as you see in the X-ray. Next slide. So when this uh, fragment has got uh, importance of one, it is uh, fracture is more stable. Number two, it can be also used to for fixation because if you can do a fixation without damaging or affecting the physis. This fragment was described by a radiologist, but, uh, Thurston Holland. So it goes by his name. And this is the most common type of physis injury. Almost three-fourths of all physis injuries happen to be the Salter Harris type 2. Next slide. Type 3, as I said, it is going through the epiphysis and then on the physial plate. So it's an intra-articular fracture. There's an articular discontinuity. So that cannot be accepted because if that is going to be in that position, it can cause a disruption of joint surface. So these fractures need anatomical reduction. So most often they need an open reduction and a stable uh, fixation, uh, which will maintain the reduction to have a, an, a proper anatomical realignment of the physis and joint surface. Next slide. That's the type four where there's a metaphor all the three uh physis epiphysis metaphysis involved and uh, this again it can be dis undisplaced like you see in the x-ray you can see the fracture line starting from the uh, uh, epiphysial area joint surface to go there here also you have a next slide here also you have a thurston holland fragment is seen and these fractures also cause, cause a chronic disability it, if you look at this x-ray the tibial part, you can see the lower tibial part. There is a physis, part of the physis here, part of the physis is now, uh, displaced. You have a small Thurston Holland fragment. Interestingly, the fibula is a type 1 injury. So if these fragments again need an anatomical reduction so that if the disability is released. Next slide. A type 5 is a crush injury where Quite often, the diagnosis at the time of the day of presentation may be difficult because in a plain X-ray, you may not see anything. You may have to go, go with the history where there is a history of trauma, tenderness, and pain. Sometimes it may mimic a, a ligament injury. Usually, when they come after six months or so, you will find a growth problem and deformity. That is how you make out. So, the, um, uh, next slide. So it is important that you have to be rumor about it so that at least you have to think about it in some cases and uh, only time will know whether there is any difference. Role of imaging will come later. So forget this x-ray. This is a, a almost a shattered edge of the proximal radial physis. But you can see that these two fragments are like an implosion. They are completely displaced and you probably can see uh, this uh, the another fragment here most possibly this physis might have been compressed. So you will have a potential disturbance in growth. So these, this is something which you can make out later. Fortunately, these fractures are not very common. Next slide. There are some two, uh, there are some more class, uh, Salter Harris types have been added, which were not in the original uh, publication of Salter Harris. One is an uh, injury to the peripheral portion of the physis. And this can result in a bony bridge formation, producing deformity. This was suggested by Lipman-Kessel. Next. 
Next slide, please. Two more have been described. One is called a triplane fracture. This was described by Mama. It's something very, very common in the distal, which is seen more commonly in the distal tibia. As such, the injury is not common. And the next is the fracture of the physis, which does not include the fracture of the epiphysis, which does not include the physis. That is a fracture in the zone from, uh, between the physis and the epiphysis. That is, uh, this, these are not common fractures. So, not going to detail. Next slide, please. But this is a picture of a patient with a triplane fracture. In the AP view, you can see a, a vertical fracture and then the fracture line passes through the physis. The physis displays. And in the lateral view, you can see a metabasal fragment. So that's what he meant by a triplane fracture. And um, this is something more common in the distal tibia. Next slide. So coming to the diagnosis of these, these injuries, one, it has to be whenever you have a trauma in a child and localized joint pain with the swelling and tenderness in the physial area, one has to think of that. If the lower extremity, patient may not be able to bear weight. In the upper extremity, there may be impaired function. And if the X-ray looks normal, one has to be uh, probably even compared to the opposite side if you are uh, normal said x-ray to compare for a type 1 injury or you have to clinically reassess the patient and or probably um, use other modalities in sometimes. We'll come to that later. Next slide. So this particular uh, child came with a pain in the medial side of the knee following trauma. There was no effusion, a tenderness over the uh, uh, swelling on the, we can see the left leg in the uh, Parapatal area, it is hollow, there is no swelling here, there is a definite fullness on that side, there was tenderness. Um, if you see the x-ray now, there is a significant uh, uh, some widening which can be seen when you compare to the opposite side. So this was a type 1 fracture. Next slide. Uh, so plain radiographs in type 1 show only a physical widening. So always two views and particularly in type one, opposite extremity may be helpful and um, that can show a, a displacement or even a mild displacement also. It can be displaced that also can be seen. Next slide. Stress x-rays have been advised in the literature. I have not seen them because I have not done them because they are quite painful and more important than the pain, you might damage the physis. Most important thing is not the physical damage, but a CT scan, um, uh, I can see in the thing in a type 3, you can see the fragment. This might be a little difficult to see in a plain X-ray. CT scan got a role in this, whereas the MRI, next slide, for MRI, if you say this particular patient was actually uh, first uh, clinical X-ray appeared, X-ray you can see there, upper end of tibia, it appeared normal. Patient was thought for a ligament injury. The MRI was done for a ligament injury. And you can see a type of fracture starting with the uh, epiphysis, including the physis, and then coming to the metaphysical area, a very small uh, metaphysical fragment. You can see that's the metaphysical fragment is there. So uh, in a case where you suspect, uh, today we have the advantage of seeing it by a MRI and making out. Uh, so if you have a doubt, probably MRI can be done. Next slide. Coming to the management, the most important thing is that type 1 and type 2 are usually treated non-operatively because the reduction comes and it can be maintained. But when you do the reduction, it has to be more of traction and less of manipulation. In fact, manipulation should be avoided as much as possible. Uh, of course, to reduce it, you need a manipulation. But the body said is about 90% traction and 10% manipulation because if you do a repeated manipulation, you may damage the physis. So that's not advisable. And once you got the uh, reduction, you can maintain it with a, either a cast alone or with KYS or a screw in the Thurston Holland fragment. All that depends upon the individual case. Next slide. So, um, so most of the facial fractures are treated non-operatively. And um, what this, uh, the factors that make it, uh, that help you to decide what to do depends on many factors. One of them is the severity of injury, whether it is a low velocity, high velocity injuries, which bone and which part of the bone, which bone has got affected. 
third is the classification which gives you about the type of injury the plane of the deformity and age of deformity has come to later and the next is the gross potential next slide so if you see uh, your uh, idea about whether to did it non operatively operatively definitely in a area where the growth is maximum like a proximal humerus proximal ulna or a distal femur or distal radius where 70 to 80% of growth is there as the child is small of course you need anatomical reduction but suppose with the area like a distal ulna with 20% and the child is almost near the end of the growth so probably it may not make a much difference if you are even if the reduction is not very good next slide however that's not the only one some areas minimal deformities can be compensated like in a hip we know that the the deformities can be compensated whereas it will be very apparent in areas like the knee or ankle and also in the children the deformities do get corrected so if it's a neglected case then you are the uh, if the deformity is in the plane of movement of the hip joint and deformity is closer to the physis and child is young with out of growth then there is a very good collection of the angular deformities so that's another thing we have to know next slide and again age matters because if you have a child with the going like a 14 15 year old girl or 17 or 18 year old boy then growth potential is limited so any growth plate injury is not going to produce any clinically significant problem but in young children it can produce problem so anatomical reduction is a must next slide so in uh, salt rash type 1 and 2 injuries are usually treated by cross manipulation and casting or splinting or sometimes kvs and whenever you do them you have to check it again after 7 to 10 days for whether the main reduction is maintained or not usually they are stable and casting will be enough but sometime there can be a periosteal flap which interferes in the fracture site reduction may not be good then you have to do open reduction and uh, uh, maybe a kvs necessary if in case of type 2 next slide any intraarticular fractures you need a anatomical reduction come into the uh, what implant you are going to use a smooth physis even if it crosses the physial plate that is crosses the epiphyseal metaphysis it doesn't produce a growth problem and it is removed as early as possible but things like threaded screws will not uh, will not allow the growth so they should be avoided and if a k wire is not enough probably one can use a thicker k wire or something else which is strong enough but um, and preferably not you know in a in a oblique way preferably in a vertical way but sometimes next slide for example this is a type 2 which we are where the in the distal femur where two screws could be put which are in the metaphyseal area far away from the physis but a uh, type 4 below you could just put one screw below one screw above it may not be as stable as the previous one but still both the screws are not affecting the physis so growth uh, should not interfere with the growth next slide but in this patient with a comparatively bigger child so again growth not a great uh, thing but after even three small screws it was not Uh, surgeon was not happy, so a thick wire was put, which was removed at six weeks. A threaded pin crossing like this, non-threaded wire like a K wire crossing like this, does not produce uh, much of growth problem. Even if it produces, the union is more important. They should be removed early. Next slide. Coming to the type five, as I said, is very, very. You may not know about it in the first visit. When they come, maybe about six months later, you might know it. But if ever you have a suspicion, probably it should be not, uh, written down, documented, so that. And uh, similarly, if uh, uh, if you, even if um, X-ray doesn't show anything, can just follow up the patient. For type five and um, type six injuries can cause growth arrest and produce a physial bar, which may require a section. That's a different topic entirely. Next slide. So, what are the complications you expect from a physial injury? The most common com complication is a growth arrest or shortening. But uh, it is documented in literature that even lengthening or uh, increased growth can happen, and this happens within six months to one and a half years after injury. And use of implants and fixation devices may stimulate the longitudinal growth, maybe due to secondary hyperemia. Nothing is given in literature about why, but um, 
Even the injury alone can cause hyperemia and produce a lengthening. But the lengthening is never usually not significant to need any intervention. Uh, if it needs, one has a choice of um, epiphyseal doses of the uh, normal limb to equalize. If the shortening is less, shortening is more, lengthening of the affected side can be done. Next slide. What is more common is a growth retardation or a growth arrest, which can be complete or partial, and that can produce a progressive limb length discrepancy. Complete growth arrest is usually not common. And what type of harvest takes place depends on the injury to the physis and also to the remaining growth. Younger the patient, bigger the problem. Next slide. So the factors which are make a difference are, for example, you take the classification, the classification of the chapter, the type five has got highest amount of growth uh, disturbance chance, whereas type one has got the least. And it depends on where the which bone is involved. As we said, the bones which have a higher growth rate, higher energy injuries have a poor prognosis. Initial fracture displacement, that probably means the amount of injury only. And if the whatever reduction has to be done as early as possible, if it is delayed more than one week, the, the, the literature says that more chance of growth arrest. And reduction has to be good. If you are left at displacement, it more chance of again a growth one. And what is more repeated or forceful manipulation is definitely bad. Next slide. Uh, the between the uh, complete growth arrest and partial growth arrest. Partial is more common. It can be a peripheral or central, depending on the injury. It can produce angular deformities and limb limb discrepancy or a shortening. And what happens when you have a premature partial arrest? There's a bridge of bone forms which connects to the epiphysis to metaphysis. And uh, this bar inhibits the growth and size and location of the bar determines the clinical deformity. Next slide. I'm not going to go into details of this due to time factor. And these um, this, uh, bridges can be peripheral involving the peripheral epiphysis. It can be linear, particularly in the type six, et cetera. It can be central if it is a compression injury. And so the central is the most severe form and most difficult to rectify surgically. Next slide. This is a, uh, injury of the um, distal femur, we can see the Park Davis growth arrest lines on the left femoral lateral left femur lateral condyle and producing a genuine valgum deformity. And um, this type of the, uh, of course, the deformities can be corrected by uh, surgical means. I'm not going into the details of management of these, these because um, they are another talk by themselves. Next slide. It's the same uh, child uh, MRI where you can see the uh, area involved. So if detected early, even that particular area of the growth where the growth is arrested can be excised and uh, managed. Next slide. Decrease the uh, growth disturbance. Now, coming to what do you do for these patients? I mean, I'm uh, looking at the other than the surgical correction or deformity. Ideally, like today, when so much of tissue transplantation is done, so does the cartilage correct itself? An apophyseal cartilage we can take because that's not going to affect much, but the apophyseal cartilage does not have the growth potential. Then you can do a contrasite allograft transplantation, transplant, but they take a long time to develop. And uh, if you are going to transfer from an uh, interhuman transfer, that also is um, um, difficult. So there are a lot of uh, difficulties. Suppose you want to do a epiphyseal transplantation, there are difficulties in procuring and transferring from one side to another. Next slide. Uh, I have in the, my thesis for my post graduation uh, for my MS was the epiphyseal transplantation in dogs. So that's the picture, the agabatic picture of how the thing, the epiphyse I chose was the distal end of the ulna. The dogs, one big advantage, the growth is very fast. And so we did in three sets of dogs, 15 in each. 
So in one dog, we took the same side. It's very easy to remove in a dog, by the way. You can remove it and put it back. In the second group, we removed from the right side to the uh, left side. Right side you remove, put it on the left uh, side, and left side you remove, put it on the right side. Third from one dog to the other dog. And all the um, FUSL transplants of the opposite uh, different dogs fail. And when you put it back in the same time, it survives. And from one side to the other side, some survive, some did not survive. But what I, I, I when I wrote the final this thing, I thought that this has no role in a human being because I, at that time, that was 42 years back, I thought there's no role for getting a transplantation. Next slide. But today things are different. Today you have a, a diff, a managements where you have a, of course, transplantation. I think of, in Singapore, they have done some epithelial transplantation. I said, Robert has Lee written a book on that. And uh, there are uh, uh, ways of tissue engineering where you have uh, gene therapy, you have a tissue engineering approach, and you need a scaffold to transfer that. And um, things, those factors like some of the BMPs, and there are others coming later, they which are. But all of this, next slide. All of this are still in experimental stage. Next slide, please. All of this are in experimental stage. Nothing has shown a remarkable one where we can say that this can be done. But with the amount of technology advance, etc., it is possible that uh, uh, better tissue re-engineering and uh, with the better uh, growth differentiation factors, there may be. Buxton and colleagues found that uh, the growth division factor five promotes both cell addition and proliferation. So things like that, there is a hope for the prom promise for the future. But as of now, any tissue engineering is still in the experimental stage. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, so to conclude, the physical fractures are common injuries. Most of them heal and growth resumes uneventfully. Manipulation should be gentle. And the areas which have a high propensity for growth, you have to be careful about them, it has to be reduced anatomically. And the most significant complication is the physical injury with the bony bar, which leads to angular deformities or complete growth. Next slide. Thank you all for all the students. Wish you all the best in your exams. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Rajagopal. Uh, I think we had an excellent talk, all three talks, first of all. Uh, 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 if, if, if you have a question, please. Uh, uh, Dr. Jain Sharma, I hope you feel better. He gave his talk after a injury. Hope he's feeling better. So he'll not be on the panel at this time. Okay. The, the first question is... Is there any role of preoperative administration of low molecular weight heparin or thromboprophylaxis to doctor? I have already answered that, sir. Yes, there is a role of low molecular weight heparin. Normally, we admit the patient, you know, it has to be started as early as possible. So, it, but it has to be stopped, you know, 12 hours before surgery and then restart 12 hours after surgery. There is a definitive role. Okay. Is there a is there is if there is any role of low molecular heparin preoperatively? It is started at the time of admission, stopped twelve hours before surgery, and restarted after surgery. You have already told that. Yes, sir. Is that all? Any other question? Uh, sir Rajesh, I have a question for Rajesh, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, sir, you have mentioned about the, um, you know, major trauma and all, yeah. and also THR, TKR. What yeah. about the uh, knee scopy and spine surgery? See, they, they, they come under, you know, moderate risk factors. They are not under high risk factors. So, so do we need to start any prophylaxis for that? Not necessarily, not necessarily on in all those. Most commonly, they are for high risk patients, you know. In a moderate to low risk, we can we can you, you we can you know uh, uh, do some other mechanical prophylaxis. No problem. Okay, so so Rajesh, second thing you have. Rajesh, sir. can I uh, just ask a simple question? Sir, 
Uh, Rajesh, you have a patient who is 80 years old who has got a comorbidity of a heart ailment who undergoes a TKR and he starts getting, who has been given the DVT prophylaxis and even after five months of the surgery, he keeps getting pain in the calf muscle. And uh, suspicion was that probably he had a DVT. The color Doppler was done, which was normal. The D dimer was done, which was slightly high, 1.2. So other investigation like echo and everything was done were normal. But the cough, little cough swelling and the cough pain is persisting which can be very disturbing at night, at times. So what do you suggest that what is the cause of this pain in the cough and does it need any thing to be done for that? Sir, uh, if there is no DVT, it rules out, see, if really DVT is ruled out, you know, there's no DVT, you know, then nothing can be done. Even, even a simple physiotherapy, you know, uh, that, that is okay. But if there is a DVT, you know, then you have to continue prophylaxis, uh, the treatment for at least six months. At okay. least six months. Okay, that's good. Uh, Rajkopal, I have a, a small comment to make. Yes, sir. You know these uh, epiphyseal injury, which are vertical compression injuries, yes, sir. where you don't see on the first uh, presentation on the x-ray, there is nothing. Yes, sir. And you know these injuries are missed. And then they come to you with an angular deformity. And uh, what I learned in this case, where you suspect, the best thing is to do a MRI, which will tell you the early injury of uh, the growth plate in these cases. And then you take the remedial measure so that the patient doesn't develop any growth. Uh, do you do a MRI routinely in these cases? Sir, uh, unfortunately, in a type 5, the MRI may not help. If the, because the MRI in the day one is going to show only if there is going to be like a type four, I showed a displacement, it will show. The edema, it will show. But in a type five, the edema may be there because without the physical damage also. It is more of a cellular damage. It may not be visible. But, but the advantage of MRI, it can pick up within 10 days. That is the advantage. If 10 days patient is still having pain, Still, you have a doubt, you can do an MRI. If they, I am saying that only in terms of, for example, if patient is affordable, you can do an MRI. Even if you miss this, you might find ligament injury, fine. But otherwise, clinically, you are, it doesn't, if you're not finding anything else significant, then probably MRI on the 10th day. Because even if you find, it's only going to be for documentation. We cannot do anything to the patient to help because whatever happened, it is that cellular crush and death. So the, what they say is up to 10 days. 10 days later, MRI may show uh, something like edema and change. Yes, because sorry. you see, that if you detect it early, this growth uh, plate damage, then we have a good method to balance the growth by doing a growth relation or doing a deep epigenetic using the fat graft, etc. And you can control the... Uh, disparity in the growth both on lateral and middle side and prevent the True, sir. Thank you. And uh, yes. True, sir. Can I come yes. here, sir? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir, uh, the issue is uh, the MRI, I think, is not mandatory in acute cases day one or day two. The, mm. uh, the point is only type one and type five, you know, sir. How to go about that? Now, clinically, sir, also type one and type five, it is very difficult to diagnose. So they, they it, clinically they present the same, x-ray is the same. That is the only it, issue. Does MRI is going to add something on day one and two in type one and type five? Rajesh, there's one word you use, routine. We are, I am not advising routine MRI. You have a patient, you have a, the, the one which I showed a type four injury, MRI was done to rule out the ligament injury because it was knee. It that is right. that. So you have a suspicion, you are not, for example, you are not finding, find, for example, the ligament injury. I will expect some effusion. This patient had no effusion at all. Swelling was outside the joint. So when you have a clinical suspicion, it does not, when you are in doubt, it is still wiser to do. If not for the economical this thing, there is no loss. Dr. Roy I have a question. Yes, sir. Uh, in 
in uh, sa in the salter type eris type 1 when you have a suspicion of injury to the epiphysis can we is there any role of a gentle stress x-ray of that area yes sir actually by test books they say that one method because you might completely miss the diagnosis so they advise but i have not seen number one number two you may you may damage the physis if you are going to put a stress on that it's a very delicate structure and third your uh, stress use will help only if you if you are going to produce you are, you have to for example where the displacement is not very clearly seen you are produce going to produce more displacement so in very young children Theoretically, yes, sir. There is a role. It is given in the test book. But practically, I will say you are more likely to damage the physis. So I am personally against doing anything stress on the on the physial side. So I will probably go for if I have a doubt like that, I will go for a CT, sir. That will demonstrate your physial gap. Thank you. Any other question? Well, our session is. I must thank you. Yes, sir. sir. I have one question uh, yes. from plaster section. Uh, in case of above knee plaster, what is the reason of uh, you know giving flexion of fifteen degree? The exact reason why this of the knee joint. Yes. Sir. Of the knee joint. Yes, sir. We we put na above knee cast um, uh, cast or slab in that yes. should be fifteen degree flexion. So what is yes. the reason why? Yes, it's not there. Can I answer it? The, can I answer it, sir? Can I answer it? Okay. Sir, uh, okay. One reason for giving is that if it is given for a displaced fracture tibia, if you extend the knee, you can have a transmission. For example, when you move the leg, rotate the leg, that forces can turn. The movement may be conveyed to the uh, femur to tibia and the fragment may be displaced. Number two, if you are going to make the patient walk, if you will, he will have difficulty in walking because compared to the other side, he has the knee is going, it's going to be difficult to clear the ground. So he'll walk with the circumcision gait, which will be painful for him. So the patient will be able to slight shortening produced by the flexion will help him to walk better. Third, the as such, the position of comfort for the knee joint is minimal flexion and also you know the structures which are relaxed in uh, full extension will become short so the functional position also for uh, for ease is integrated but the main things are length and transmission of force dr gupta you want to make some comments sir? Uh, it is right sir it is a functional position basically every joint has a functional position so we should try to maintain the functional position of that particular limb so okay. now, uh, one more question. When you suspect that there may be an epiphyseal injury, maybe grade one, listening to you, it looks like that if we support that area with a slab for about 10 days and recheck it, and if there is pain persists, MRI might be a right uh, investigation yes, to do. Yes, sir. Because usually, say, for example, sir, the type uh, one, it could be displaced, undisplaced. Most of them are undisplaced where you really miss it. We would probably would have not even known. When the displacement is minimal, we might miss it. But the, for example, low end of uh, the radius sir, is probably the commonest type 1 injury that I have seen because it is very, very common and they are fully displaced. And you can reduce them anatomically with gentle traction. But if you miss them the, within the, the next 10 days, the MRI will show two things. One, it will show some subtle changes which are not seen in the plain X-ray. Like even the widening will happen. But more than that, you will have a displacement in one area, sir. It may not be all the areas. One section, you will see a displacement. But when you do it, when you are clearly seeing that patient pain is still persisting, because if it is so difficult to make out, the growth problem is usually not there, sir. Growth problem with the type 1 is the least. So it doesn't really make a difference in the long term if it is totally undisplaced. But minimal displacement, you can find out and correct. 
So I will suggest that. Uh, is, is metaphysical bar injury and metaphysical both are the same thing or different thing? Metaphysical bar injury or metaphysical injury? Metaphysical bar is no see. Metaphysical bar is a is a complication of say a injury of the locroix locroix type of injury or a type six injury where there is a bridge of bone. That's a metaphysical bar. Metaphysical injury doesn't mean that it metaphysical injury can be thrust and hold and is also metaphysical injury. Bar means there is a, uh, a bony bridge between the epiphyseal metaphyses or physical metaphyses, preventing further growth on one side. So metaphyseal bar is a complication of the growth plate injury, whereas metaphyseal injury where a portion of the metaphyses is involved. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, the uh, can I add uh, a point which was raised by. Why there is a flexion of the knee joint in a long leg plaster? Is that right? You see, you must try to understand that that was a time when the fractures were being treated conservatively, and the patient leg would remain in plaster for three months or even more. And there was a big problem of the stiffness of the knee joint at that time. So, if you have a leg in full extension, then to get the start the movements in those cases after physiotherapy would become very difficult. Therefore, they always kept about 30 degrees of flexion at the time of giving a long leg plaster, number one. Number two, when they were made to stand and walk with the help of crutches, it was much easier to get the road clearance and the leg can be propelled forward. This is one of the reasons. I think. However, if you know that the work of the Ducor Champagnat and then later on an American surgeon, Paul Brown, they wanted the patient to stand and walk and start weight bearing. Therefore, the Paul Brown and Lucas Champagner both recommended that the plaster should be given in full extension and they should be made to stand and walk. So this philosophy keeps changing into this thing. And I would like to compliment uh, Jayant for your very good presentation and uh, wish you a very speedy recovery. I didn't know that you had undergone the surgery and I leave it to the chairman to make his final comments. Thank you. It has been a nice session and I'm sure all the the people who have given the lecture have done an excellent job and we had a reasonably good discussion. I again thank you all the uh, senior orthopedic surgeons and, the, and uh, we will start our next session after two, two, at 2.20. The, it's, there's a break of 10-15 minutes. Uh, at 220, Dr. Anil Jain. Jain Sahib is here. So, thank you. Thank you all. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, sir. Hey, uh, Anil, good afternoon. How good are you? Afternoon. Nice seeing you after a long, long ah, time. Long, long time. <laughs> yeah. How are you? Good? Oh, just fine. Yeah, just fine. What's your son doing? I have uh, not seen him. After yeah, he, he has become a professor at Pittsburgh. Wow, damn good. And daughter? Daughter has become assistant professor in pathology. Yes, very nice, very nice. Good, good. Um, Anirja, sir? Uh, yeah. Sir, yeah. can I just try sharing my screen and trying whether by any hook or crook or luck my presentation will open? But as Sanjay Jain is there, it may open. It was not refusing to open all this time. <laughs> uh, Rajesh, I will just try. Sir, we, we had a problem at two to get a full screen. And... <laughs> try, try, sir. Try. Uh, try, sir. You have time. Uh, yes, I'll oh, open. Let's see. What you want. Never know. Uh, sir, I'll uh, Yes, Dr. Agnopalan. I just try, sir. Have something to say? No, sir, I'm just trying to see. I don't know why it didn't open before. Oh, sure, sure. You can try uh, at your level. Um, <laughs> otherwise, you can always uh, send your lecture to us on email and we'll do the job for you. Okay? okay That's sir. right. Yeah, I thought I already sent. Sir, I already sent last time both the presentations.
हाइलाइटर देना येलो हाइलाइटर वो I don't know what's wrong, Anil. What happened was uh, uh, before oh, starting yes. it, tried it was opening, but yeah, after it's opening that, now. Now opening, sir. Let's see our bell slides will move or not, sir. No, it will move. You just uh, <laughs> put it to this uh, okay. this one. Uh, Anil, is it moving, Anil? No, you just put it as a full screen first. Ah, uh, that's where the problem is. This is full screen, my laptop. <laughs> no, no, no. It is. It is still not uh, on the Anil, full. I don't screen. know how to show. I can just take my. Mobile and uh, um, picture. I don't know something wrong somewhere. I don't know why that's happening. Because it is coming as uh, you know. Ah, that's what sir. Slide sorter, slide sorter. <laughs> I think what I should do it. Um, I should put it into. Is the presentation coming, sir? Now opening. No. Yes, it is. It is there. It is it's there. Uh, we could see this slide number yeah. two. Yeah. Is it moving now? No. no it's not moving slide number 2 is there that uh, that's but what? it is not full screen it is only slide sort of okay i'll just close it completely and um, then what i will do first i'll open and keep it and then try just put slide share first open that presentation in your computer okay i'll do that um, ex exit this exit full screen close it here i go to somewhere. i'll look at open the presentation and i will put it into slide show itself okay now i'll go here okay Something wrong. Just double click. Okay. Is it moving now? No. No, it's not moving. It's not moving. And for me, it's full screen. It's completely moving. I tried both. I tried to open it first and then share. I tried sharing it first and open. Nothing. Some probably. But yesterday I had a PowerPoint presentation, a webinar. It was all working. Today. I I really, but let's see where it can be wrong. I don't know. I thought maybe I uh, made a mistake in the way I logged in, so I logged out and tried. Even then, it is not working. If I try without slab, uh, are you seeing the presentation now? No, no. No, I'm. We are seeing it, but not okay. in the. If I move it uh, now, okay, it's not moving at all. That's the whole problem. That's the whole problem. I think I'll close it up. Then close it again and um, open it. Open and keep. Then I go here. View full screen. Share screen. I think I think now it will work. I had made a some problem. Let's see. Uh, is it moving now? No. No. Then you are on the slide one. Slide one. Slide shorter. Yeah, I am in slide one, and for me it is moving in full screen, but it's not getting transmitted. Uh, your screen sharing is that is okay. The shop share. Try again sharing screen. Share. Is it moving now? I didn't put full uh, full uh, full screen. No, no, it is moving now. It is moving, moving now. Yeah. So once I put in the full uh, slideshow, it's not moving. Let me just see the slideshow on the other one. Let's see whether. Uh, is it moving now? No. 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 So only alternate I have is uh, 
I put it without full screen. Let's see with that whether, uh, and um, there is a way for doing that. If I, it is moving now, right? Yeah, it is moving. But it, you will see only a small screen there. Yeah, small screen. Mm. That's okay. Yeah, that I, yeah, I can probably. See, it, it, this is only everyone is uh, watching one by one. <laughs> so you that will, I mean, it's not the whole audience. Yeah, that's so true. It doesn't make sense. I have a way of doing that also. Let me see whether it is possible. Close this, we can a little more bigger, I think. And uh, I don't know whether that will make it different. That will become too much. Is it any better, Anil? No, yeah, no, it's the same. Yeah, no, but I think uh, we are able to see quite a this big is, one because see, you have you have removed the slide sorter. Yeah, I have removed as much as possible. Let's see, I'll keep it like because the problem is. I feel bad. Last one I was telling all the time, next, next, said troubling somebody. And uh, I think you, continue, you continue like this. You continue like okay. this. Okay. Minus the last talk. Yours is the first talk. So it, it can remain in my computer like this. And at that time, I will share it. And I'll just, I will just take a break, have my lunch, and come yes, in five yes, minutes. Please, please, okay. Please. Thank you. Ali. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is going to be 2.20 and we are going to start our next session, which is on the infections in the bone. And I request Dr. Anil Jain, an authority on the tuberculosis of the spine, and Ashok Banskota, my very dear friend, and his, uh, his work in Nepal is uh, really commendable. And I request them, both of them, to chair the session and start their uh, lectures. <laughs> Thank you. Over to uh, Anil. Sir, we have to stop sharing the slides of uh, Dr. Raj Gopal. Yes, Raj Gopal. Hi, Anil. Hi. <laughs> How are you? Doing okay? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just fine. Nice to see you after a long time. That's right. Yeah. Thank uh, you, can you stop? Stop sharing. Can you your slides? one for lunch. Yeah, I think so, probably. I think we'll, have, we'll have to speak on the uh, I think post change the post
I think he has left his phone also in different place. <laughs> It's ringing, but um, probably he has gone to other room for lunch. He gave his ah, doctor, 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 doctor Rajgopal, please uh, stop sharing your slides. Then only I'll be able to share. Okay, yeah. please, please, please. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Anil, you can start now. Ah, yeah. Let him let him stop sharing first. If you would put your slides and then this slide will get removed and your slides will come. Continue. Yeah, good. Now you are there, Anit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much indeed for giving me this opportunity. Uh, well, I'm sorry I'm using the last year's uh, uh, paper. Um, so, uh, consider it for 2022. Uh, well, I shall be talking about uh, a subject uh, which we are likely to get one case uh, out of uh, four boys, at least one of uh, the boy will uh, or the student will get the case. So, talking about uh, osteoarticular tuberculosis, we all know that bone tuberculosis is a secondary tuberculosis. The primary tuberculosis occurs in lung. So bone tuberculosis starts after a, from a initial primary infected visceral lesion, which may be active at this time or quiescent or apparent or latent. So there is a, there occur a hematogenous dissemination and bacteria are lodged into the bone. When this infection lodged into the bone and joint, then, and they, and then there is a polymorphonuclear infiltration around those bacteria, which gets converted into monocytes and macrophages because macrophages are able to uh, do the phagocytosis of the tubercular bacilli. And gradually it gets converted into epithelioid cells. Now these clump of epithelioid cells, these few epithelioid cells. When okay, they then. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Thanks. I've already started. The, these cells fuse and make a Langhen giant cell, which has a multiple nuclei. And this collection of epithelioid cells and Langhen giant cells surrounded by a ring of lymphocytes. So that is called a standard classical granuloma. So you have a Langhen giant cell, other cells surrounded by a rim of lymphocytes. So this is a hard tubercle. Now these multiple small tubercle cholecysts to form a big tubercle. And in the center, liquid necrosis of the uh, takes place. And that's how the uh, cold abscess or an abscess, which has a lesser inflammation than the pyogenic abscess. That's why it's called cold abscess. So that is how the tuberculous lesion starts. Now, with this introduction, you know, now it means there are two types of pul uh, tuberculosis, pulmonary and extrapulmonary. And we need to understand that pulmonary is a lung disease. And while extrapulmonary, any tissue, including bone. So all other tuberculosis beyond the uh, other than the lung, there comes into extrapulmonary tuberculosis. Now, anyone can be affected with pulmonary tuberculosis, but it is more common if you take 100 patients which are HIV positive or in children, then there are more chances of having an extrapulmonary tuberculosis. Now in lung symptoms, since the general symptoms are uh, there and the lung symptoms are there and that is why patient presents early and diagnosis become uh, can be made early. While in an extrapulmonary lesion there are less general symptoms and part affected have a you, you know the regional or local symptoms are less and that is why generally there is a late diagnosis and in case of osteoarticular it is always adds to some complications as a deformity or and some uh, other kind of complications in case of spine. Now, the bigger difference is that since the, these organisms in lung tuberculosis, they have a high oxygen concentration, so they uh, rapidly multiply. And that is why it is a multi-bacillary disease. So there are more chances of getting an AFB uh, on a smear. And that is why bacteriological diagnosis is possible quite early. 
while in extrapulmonary because it this focus is has a low oxygen concentration that is why the bacterial division is less and this is a posse bacillary so there are few or lesser number of uh, bacilli there and that is why bacteriological diagnosis and source detection rate is low in spite of getting a tissue there may be a possibility in a good number of patient that it may be afp negative now i would to all student i say that this review article which was published in 2010 it is a must read for any every postgraduate student while the same thing was revised in 2020 so these two uh, review article gives the good basis of your knowledge that from where in 10 years time what new things have been ad added and that is what given in this current concept review now let us see how the diagnosis and management of tb spine because here now i'll shall be concentrating only on tb spine and not on osteoarticular tuberculosis but then the general uh, part general diagnostic part would be practically the same for both so what are the landmark of the uh, during the last 100 year it is the introduction of att that has revolutionized the treatment of tb and uh, particularly tb spine because subsequent improved drugs and regimen so introduction of at followed by further improvement in the drugs and the regimen that has transformed the treatment of osteoarticular tuberculosis so and this landmark has divided into pre chemotherapy era when there was no att and a post chemotherapy era in last 30 year when we have developed surgical facility better we have a better diagnostic imaging possible we have a better uh, diagnostic uh, uh, avenues in term of molecular diagnosis and implant uses have become more common this all have changed the outcome in recent time so for, for us it is practically a pre chemotherapy post chemotherapy and the latest so now the goal of treatment in tb spine in a pre chemotherapy before 1950 when these patients used to be treated in sanatoria and we were aiming that healing of lesion may take place because of natural immunity and that is why the end point in a spinal tb was death or severely crippled in more than 50% cases in a when att came in we started observing healing of lesion and end point changed to residual kyphosis and sequelae of paraplegia so the lesion used to heal and the, some of them they uh, are most of them they used to have a residual kyphosis or sequelae of paraplegia so now what issues i am going to cover for your understanding how to diagnose and how to do an early diagnosis and once suspected how to ascertain diagnosis how long to treat because tb spine with neural deficit is another subgroup of patient spinal deformity instrumentation and drug resistance so i'm broadly dividing my talk into these seven subheads so as i said current goal of treatment is healing of lesion with end point with no or minimal deformity or no sequelae of neural deficit so that is the objective in current time with the recent developments now i would just uh, uh, like you to just concentrate for a minute this used to be the presentation of a tb spine by x ray that if there is a complete obliterate regional osteopenia complete obliteration of disc spaces loss of anterior bone body height pre vertebral collection or a para vertebral shadow so this used to be the x ray uh, these are the x ray finding in a classical case so whenever these patients come with a classical case this diagnosis is obvious but by this time most of these patients have deformity and neural deficit so you could see there is a deformity there is a deformity diagnosis is not a problem here but now there is already a deformity and these patients might have a neural deficit so we do not want to wait till this time we want to diagnose little earlier and for that you need to understand the pathology of disease now most of the time spinal lesions they occur a para vertebral lesion 98% they are para vertebral para discal 
lesion occurs on both side of the disc so 98% it is the paradiscal and 2% where any part of the bone post the complex whether it is spinous process facets transverse process uh, pedicle they may be affected by the disease now when this inflammation starts taking and disease starts uh, uh, occurring uh, pathology of disease manifest as increased granulation tissue here increased blood supply here and as a result subchondral bone become weakened and disc starts herniating and when this disc start herniating you see on a plain x ray a straight spasm a spine because of spasm and reduction in the disc height on a plain x ray you could see this disc height and this disc height this disc height is less than the height above so and then if even at this stage we are not able to diagnose then gradually this disc will be obliterated like this and subsequently there will be loss of anterior bony height in a dorsal spine and a kyphotic deformity occurs while in a cervical and lumbar uh, spine obliteration of lordosis followed by appearance of kyphosis is the sequence so that's how the disease progresses if it is allowed to run its natural course without being diagnosed so we want to intervene at this stage we want to intervene at this stage so that deformity does not develop and this is what i said that if at this stage we clinically suspect then by x rays by ct or by mri we should be able to ascertain find out the lesion in a early stage of disease and now mri is the gold standard so what is a suspected or presumptive case any patient with persistent localized pain for 6 to 12 weeks or more with or without constitutional symptom with local with or without local tenderness and some x ray pointer you could see this cervical spine symptomatic patient and on x ray you see there is a spine is straight it is not lordotic and at the same time one could see that this disc margins are fuzzy this is sharp margin but here this is fuzzy this disc height has reduced and there is a little small increase prevertebral shadow in a dorsal dorsal lumbar spine you could see that this is a suspected area which matches with the presentation and person must have a persistent pain in particular segment of spine 6 weeks or more then this is a suspected case and mri should be done now when you do an mri and what you find i have taken this classical case as an example the findings uh, for tuberculosis are i think you just uh, remember these findings contiguous vertebral body involvement intact disc spaces what i talked about x ray obliteration you could see this is obliterated but here these two disc are intact and since there is no body here and this is what two disc have come closer so relative preservation of disc spaces sub ligamentous extension of disease of an abscess you could see this is be beneath the anterior longitudinal ligament t1 weighted low signal bright t2 weighted this is watery large pre and para vertebral abscesses this is pre and para vertebral abscesses which are septated which are septated epidural involvement this there is a breach of the disease in the epidural space and intraosseous abscess now if with the constellation of these findings one can 95% sure that you are dealing with a case of tuberculosis spine so this septate paravertebral shadow is one of the characteristic finding of a tubercular abscess in comparison to the pyogenic abscess pyogenic abscess generally are not septated and this is the example i was just telling you could see here suspected area and see the mri two body disease intact disc spaces and you could see one is this these are the septated cold abscess which has bright in t2 weighted and in this patient CT, aspiration ct guided biopsy was done and this was confirmation of the tuberculosis was obtained now see this picture see this picture see this picture where multiple contiguous bodies are disease and compare this with this where this body disease these are normal this is body disease normal this body disease 
So this is a diagnostic uncertainty. We cannot call it tubercular on MRI. You could see here, there is no paravertebral abscesses and it's kind of an heterogeneous signal in T1 and T2 weighted images suggest that there is a dry kind of lesion. And here differential diagnosis would be a multifold. It could be pyogenic, it could be uh, brucellosis, it could be multiple myeloma, it could be lymphoma. And that is why this is a diagnostic uncertainty on MRI must take biopsy because there is no place for empiric treatment. Now, another thing on MRI that this is what is a liquid compression, liquid uh, abscess. This is a T2 weighted bright and in T1, this will become low signal. While when you compare this where heterogeneous signal and probably this is a dry lesion and this is the compression onto the spinal cord by a dry lesion and this is the disc came out from this patient. So this is what that the dry lesion uh, could be anything else. At the same time, dry lesion could be tubercular and we need to, uh, uh, we find that in some of these patients, compression is by disc or sequestra. And this is what is a cold abscess, low signal, T1 weighted, bright T2 weighted. This is a liquid disease. And one can even identify site of involvement, which bone is involved, cervical dorsal junction. This is what is the quantum of compression. So this kind of information one can get on MRI. So summarily, diagnosis has to be ascertained either by imaging or else tissue diagnosis is must and tissue can be taken open or percutaneous. So diagnosis of spinal TB, if it is not done by clinical and imaging, then microbiological, molecular, histological diagnosis comes into the picture. Now, what are the sample for laboratory? Any tissue, pus, bony tissue, soft tissue. Tissue may be obtained by surgical debridement or aspiration of cold abscess. May be percutaneous or may be done as a core biopsy and uh, sample is to be obtained. And core biopsy is more commonly done when you are we are dealing with the extra spinal tuberculosis, say tuberculosis of tibia or knee or all other um, uh, bones. So we can take a core biopsy. Adequate volume tissue must be given in a leak-proof leak -proof translucent container surrounded by absorbent material, shock resistance outer package, no preservative. It should be in water saline only. Sample transported to the laboratory immediately and be processed as soon as possible. And if not, keep it two to six degrees. Suppose you have taken the tissue today and you're not able to send. Immediately put it into the refrigerator uh, where the temperature is two to six degree and not in the shelf of OT when the, the temperature outside is 40 degree. Tissue must be processed uh, as soon as possible. Now, these are the diagnostic hierarchy. You could see, I said radiological image or imaging, clinical suspicion and therapeutic. They are low in diagnostic accuracy. While the topmost is a culture. If you are able to demonstrate organism on culture, then it is the gold standard. But we all know it that mycobacterial culture is very difficult to obtain and it varies from lab to lab from 20 to 30 to 40 to 50 percent. Best of the lab, it is 50 percent. Molecular methods, gene experts, line probes, here the diagnostic accuracy for mycobacterium is 80 to 90 percent. AFB smear, as I said, it is possibly not more than 10 to 30 percent in various hands. Histological diagnosis, again, is not 100 percent. In almost 60 percent cases, you are able to get a classical caseating granuloma and you are sure. If the granuloma is not caseating, epithelite cells or all, all other cells, then it comes suggestive in 35 degree. 35% instances and in 5% instances, you may still not be able to uh, show on histology proof it is a tuberculosis. And that is why there is a role of submitting the tissue for all. And that is being highlighted in the, this uh, article, which is published two years ago. When 77 samples were taken and AFB smear in my hand, in my lab was positive to 47% in fresh cases, with culture, in 70% instances, FB smear or culture, together, we were able to get a diagnosis in 70% instances. When histology was added, 
than 93%, still uh, 6% patients, we are not able to ascertain the diagnosis of mycobacterium tuberculosis. But when LPA and CBNAT was added, the diagnostic accuracy touched 100%. So this, the conclusion of this article, if you have taken the trouble to procure the tissue, please submit for all. You never know which one is uh, possible, uh, uh, which, will, which will ascertain the diagnosis, which investigation. And that is why it should be submitted to all. So molecular methods, diagnostic accuracy is 90% for mycobacterium, but pri and primary drug resistance, one or more drug resistance was demonstrated in five to 6% instances, primary drug resistance. While in presumptive drug resistance cases, when culture negative, it helps in demonstrating drug resistance in a more number of cases. And here, this is the uh, 12 patients of suspected drug resistance. And here you could see that we could demonstrate diagnosis by FB smear and culture only in 25%, histology uh, 83%, and with LPA and uh, CBNAT, we were able to demonstrate that it is tubercular lesion in 100% instances, and we could demonstrate drug resistance in certain number of patients. So in all those patients where culture is negative, if the smear is negative, and when culture is negative, we cannot demonstrate drug resistance. So here, the molecular method comes handy to demonstrate the genetic basis of drug resistance. So tissue must be submitted for all tests to a certain diagnosis in 100% cases. We did another study where 10 uh, drug samples were, 10 drug resistance was uh, calculated in 60 patients and to our surprise now, in this time, we have more laboratory investigation, we could demonstrate drug resistance in 13 cases of 52. So this is the, these 52 are those patients who have not taken ATT ever and still 13 of 52 are showing some drug resistance, one or other drug resistance. So bottom line is that whenever make an attempt to take the tissue, submit it for molecular method, definitely, because you may uh, get the uh, uh, drug resistance. And sometimes, you know, the low level INH resistance, which can be treated by high doses of INH is uh, detected. So that is why it's very important to submit them for molecular method. And you could see this cervical spine, classical disease, on MRI, it is a classical lesion, but when this uh, tissue was procured uh, on surgery and uh, one could demonstrate low level INH resistance. And this low level INH resistance, we increase the dose of INH to treat it adequately. Now here, S1 disease, by no investigation, by no imaging, one is able to suspect and diagnose tubercular lesion. And when tissue was taken by uh, CT guided biopsy, then we were not only able to demonstrate the disease, uh, cytology consistent for TB, but drug sensitivity, drug resistance for FMPC and INH was demonstrated. So that is the use of getting the investigation done and ascertaining the diagnosis of the TB spine in as many number of patients in possible. And the whole idea is that we want to diagnose an inflammatory stage, early stage, before spinal deformity or neural complication appears. Now, then coming to the treatment. Now, mainstay of treatment is a ATT, prolonged continuous multidrug ATT. And surgery is indicated, surgery indicated or not, what is the type of surgery? Is surgery indicated in paraplegia and quadriplegia in children, in granulomatous disease and paraplegia with heel disease? These are the various situations which require individualized approach. So the mainstay of treatment is ATT. Now, what is, if, if you look at the drug therapy, we'll talk about drugs and its volume, intermittent or daily doses, endpoint duration of ATT, what ATT do we give in children? And if patient doesn't show clinical response to the ATT, then a failure of drug therapy. Now, it is always a multi-drug ATT. And you need to understand there are various types of mycobacterium in one disease locus. Extracellular, rapidly dividing, acted upon by INH, streptomycin, and ethamitol. <clears throat> Extracellular, 
slowly or intermittently dividing acted upon by rifampicin intracellular intermittently dividing acted upon by pyrazinamide and that is why to uh, work on all kind of bacteria a multi drug att is given there there are always some bacteria which are dormant no drug act against that and we don't treat that dormant bacteria because that will remain dormant uh, forever uh, for extended period and can get activated later in life causing relapses uh, whenever the body immunity falls now these are the drug combination rifampicin inh ethambutol pyrazinamide intensive phase for 2 months all att is to be given milligram per kg of body weight and nowadays it is the government uh, rntcp protocol so accordingly the atts are given now after 2 months the maintenance phase is rifampicin inh and ethambutol in the 10 6 or 7 years ago the maintenance was rifampicin and inh but now even the study which i just talked about and the, uh, the few other studies published um, uh, from gujarat that inh resistance demonstrated in a virgin lesion in an uh, uh, primary lesion or in a lesion which has not been treated by att ever is almost 15 to 20% and that is why now the the program in the program tb program rifampicin inh ethambutol is given in maintenance phase now question comes you want to give it for intermittent one day uh, alternate day or you want to give a daily doses intermittent doses it was pretty common from 2008 to 18 17 uh, and this was the part of policy that att were given on alternate day because it is considered a scientific because it act on the principle of lag effect what what is the lag effect when a bacteria is subjected to minimum inhibitory concentration att and then the drug is withdrawn then bacteria remains under suppression for 24 hours and by the time you give another dose so intermittent uh, uh, delivery of att was prescribed in the inter intermittent or uh, regimen where three times per week att used to be given and the whole idea was that it improves compliance and patient could be ensured patient att could be given supervised also but the problem what happened that if someone misses one dose then there were serious consequences risk of emergence of drug resistance so now for almost 3 4 year no more intermittent it all daily doses regimen how long to give att short course or long course well pulmonary uh, there are regimen available 6 months or 9 months now pra practically most of the are moving on to 6 months regimen and the argument is when it works for pulmonary then why not for bone it is possibility less uh, bacterial load and that is why world over opinion is divided between 6 9 and 12 months for osteoarticular and the reason is that in pulmonary it is very easy to demonstrate sterility of the lesion you do uh, a repeated afp smear the moment smear turns negative from positive to negative then another subsequent 3 to 4 months att are good enough and that is how the short course regimen came in but in an osteoarticular and particularly spinal lesion it is impossible next to impossible to demonstrate the bacteriological sterility and that is why we rely on other parameter clinical parameter uh, hematological parameter or maybe some imaging so that is why our end point of treatment as yet not been decided so in all studies we were talking about healed status completion of regimen whatever 6 months 9 months 12 months prescribed and no recurrence for 2 year we used to call it that is the healed status now this when when we uh, we searched this uh, brief review of literature and we found there is a lack of consensus about what constitute healed status in the literature so there is no clarity what is a healed status patient doesn't have a pain patient doesn't have, esr comes to normal these are the only criteria they were available and there are no recurrence so since the end point of treatment is not defined healing of lesion is not defined we took contrast mri to uh, decide the end point of treatment and in that we found and what is seen is that in an mri if 
T1 weighted body, vertebral body becomes bright. It is taken as a evidence of healing. That lesion has healed because fat necrosis has taken place. So inflamed bone, which was low signal in T1, now has turned into bright in T1 because the fatty replacement has taken place. And to contrast MRI shows no enhancement. So these were the criteria when this study was done. And what we found that 35% patient achieved the healed status at eight months, 60% at 12 months, 90% at 18 months. So we concluded that it is unscientific to stop ATT by fixed time schedule. And this is what, that some of these patients, they showed, you could see T1 weighted and fatty replacement has taken place. And you could see this is the active disease and the active disease. And this is the active disease, active disease. And now this is the uh, intermittent, uh, intermediate. And this is T1 weighted fatty necrosis has taken place. But then continued enhancement of bone, which at that point of time was taken as a continued activity. Later on, it was realized that probably some of these are continued inflammation, healing inflammation, and not the active disease. So now we are better uh, qualified, better, we have understood better that if there is a fatty necrosis has taken place, we can stop ATT on MRI. Since this confusion, to solve that confusion, we added in a series, a PET scan in some of these patients. And as PET scan, whenever the active inflammation is, that disease is active, it show enhancement. So that is what is the contrast MRI and PET was done in a series of patients. There were 37 patients. They were all a certain diagnosis, histologically and molecular, treated ATT, evaluated by contrast MRI and PET. And what we could found that when the MRI demonstrated healed in 52% cases, PET demonstrated uh, healed status, uh, that lesion has healed in 100% instances. And particularly when there is a stainless steel implant, that could be the only modality to demonstrate healing. So we found that probably that has improved our understanding that if fatty replacement has taken place on MRI, but there is a continued enhancement on contrast, then we can get a PET scan and uh, can settle that issue once for all. And again, in this also, we concluded that we have to give ATT till healed status is demonstrated by any of the imaging. And I'll just give you one example. This lesion, this x-ray I've shown you before, and CT-guided biopsy was advised. And on CT-guided biopsy, mycobacterial TB was positive, sensitive to rifampicin, sensitive to rifampicin and INH, uh, smear was positive, and liquid culture was positive to all first-line drug. So the, what can be the best diagnosed case? And this was the best diagnosed case. We treated non-operatively. 15 months ATD uh, uh, because, and when he came at uh, 15 months ATD, one could see it gives an impression as if this lesion has healed. But uh, since as a protocol, we got an MRI done and you could see here, these are the two lesions, lesions on the vertebral body. You could see such a big lesion. So we, on contrast, this enhanced, this enhanced. So this was the, and you could see this, intraosseous abscesses enhanced. And this was enhancing intraosseous abscess. So we put a CT guided uh, needle again, and it shows active granuloma. So this is what is the proof that in spite of having a good uh, sensitivity report, still some of these patients, they take little longer than usual to demonstrate the healed status. So what is the conclusion on ATT? Four drugs for two months, three drugs for 10 months, daily doses, must, one must closely monitor for development, progression of neural deficit. Some patient requires surgical intervention. Total treatment duration, 12 months, extendable to 18 months on case-to-case -case basis. But this is what we are following and this is what been given in the index TV guideline. Again, a word about children. Children are not the miniature adult you have to calculate the doses as per these milligram per kg body weight and in different weight category. So in every visit, weight, take the weight of the child. If child is moving from this weight category to this weight category, increase the combination of uh, tablets in uh, intensive phase and maintenance phase. This is what must be done. And this is the evidence that this intraspinal abscess 
has completely resolved under the influence of ATT. What are the surgery indications? If there is a cord compression, means if there is a neural deficit, cord compression, or there is an instability, impending neural deficit where the uh, panvertebral disease is there, then you need to do a surgery. Or patient already has a deformity at first presentation, or sometime in children where deformity is unstable or progressing, or patient has a treatment failure because we need to divide the lesion to ascertain the diagnosis and then paraplegia with healed disease. So these are the surgical indication. Now, as I said, what surgery where? For decompression alone, in case of neural deficit, you do decompression. However, whenever you want to provide stability as well in an unstable, potentially unstable spine to prevent treat neural deficit, you need to do instrumentation as well. Tissue procurement to ascertain diagnosis or to address suspected drug resistance. So whenever there is a failure to conservative treatment, you need to debride the lesion because you want to subject the whole tissue, decrease the bacterial load, at the same time, subject the whole tissue for various tests. And whenever the patient comes for deformity, in that case, our surgery is a deformity current. And this is what are the objective of surgery. And to treat late onset paraplegia, if person comes with a sequelae or deformity and developing paraplegia, that paraplegia with heel disease, then you have to treat the paraplegia on the merit. Now, I think you have heard these two words, radical resection, excise till normal bleeding bone. And this is what this used to be treatment when Hodgson and Hong Kong group advocated surgery that they used to excise the whole lesion as a malignant lesion and used to put a long bone, uh, bone graft depending on the gap being created. But then this graft is weak on the day it has been put in. This graft may dislodge, this graft may break and chances of neural deterioration may be there. While debridement, you just remove pus, KGS tissue, sequestra, and you remove unaffected or viable bone only to provide access to the focus or to decompress the spinal cord. And this is what I mean is that here, you just debride the lesion to such an extent and remove this much bone only so that you decompress the spinal cord. And this is the adequate decompression of the spinal cord. And this leaves a relatively stable spine. So debridement is good enough because we know bone is either infiltrated, infected, which recovers on drug, while a necrotic or separated bone or a disc that requires removal. Now, various surgical approaches. I think I'll just put a little you, uh, cervical spine. There is no, there's only one approach where you go between the trachea and esophagus and the carotid uh, sheath and the sternocleidomastoid and reach to the vertebral body. This is the approach for the cervical spine. But for dorsal spine, when Hodgson advocated transthoracic, where a transfer chest is open, uh, lung is closed, lung is deflated, and all additions are removed, reach to the vertebral focus, and that is how the lesion used to be debrided. While in extra pleural, we remove posterior seven to eight centimeters of the rib, three ribs at the apex of uh, deformity, reach outside the pleura in front of vertebral body. This is the spatula placed in front of vertebral body and then decompress the spinal cord. So this is the extra pleural anterolateral decompression. And you could see here the same thing. This is the internal kyphosis. And you could see the spatula is placed in the, um, uh, onto the other side of the body. And that is how the decompression has been done. And when we compared this in a series of 10 patients each in a randomized control trial, this was the decompression by transthoracic. This is the decompression by extrapleural. So nowadays, no one does transthoracic, transpleural anterior decompression. We do extrapleural anterolateral decompression because we can instrument this uh, as well with the same approach. Or all posterior, midline posterior, put a pedicle screw above, put a pedicle screw below in a healthy bone, hold the pedicle screw, remove the posterior column, excise, and reach to the anterior disease focus to decompress it. So all posterior is also advocated. But then here, you have to excise posterior column in a disease where anterior body disease is already there. So my personal preference is whenever I do a deformity correction, I do all posterior, but it may not be good 
option for a long segment disease. Now, this is what the example I'm going to show you. Such a severe kyphotic deformity. And you could see we opened it midline. And, and, and this is what gradually being corrected on traction. And then we opened it midline posteriorly, put the pedicle screw above and the below. The lamina and uh, posterior complex of this body was excised, reached from the side of the body to the front, debrided the lesion, deformity is corrected, and the uh, the graft is placed. And that is what is a all posterior surgical approach. Now, a word about TB spine with paraplegia. I think there are two types of neural deficit. Paraplegia with active disease, when the disease is active, or paraplegia with heel disease. So in active disease, the compression is by disease tissue or, in, uh, or instability. While in heel disease, it is the internal salient or healed bone, which is causing internal deformity. So should we do surgery for all or surgery for few in active disease? I think that's a big question. And I could, I've shown you this example that here, this patient completely pus has resolved on ATT. And this patient, in spite of severe compression, uh, compression didn't have very severe neural deficit. So it means looking at the MRI cord compression does not always mean paraplegia. The surgery has to be decided on clinical criteria. And this is what I said on ATT, this pus has completely vanished. This compression has vanished. So what are these people, uh, patients who respond paraplegia with active disease? on non-operative treatment, if there is only a liquid compression or relatively preserved cord size or cord edema and myelitis, provided spine is stable. So if spine is stable and you observe these findings, it is justified to wait for a few weeks and these patients will recover. However, if it is a dry lesion, then they must be operated as soon as possible. Now, what is the intended surgery? Either you do a surgical decompression uh, with instrumentation or without instrumented stabilization case to case basis. And I'll just give you one example here. Not only the deform, uh, this was uh, uh, done, but even uh, you could see the anterior lesion and the graft is placed, posterior instrumentation was done. Now, I have shown many examples of instrumentation. So that means that instrumentation can be done in infected TB lesion. Why? Because the biofilm formed in a pyogenic bacteria is very thick and it is it does not allow antibiotics to penetrate while in tubercular the biofilm form is very thin and that is why it doesn't stop the penetration of mycobacterium uh, ATT AT, AT drugs to the myco mycobacterium and that is why uh, instrumentation is compatible we did a meta analysis in 2005 to know what are the indication there was no consensus found so we listed the indication of instrumented stabilization in spinal tuberculosis. One is panvertebral lesion. What does that mean by that? If the body is diseased, posterior complex is diseased. Now in that patient, if it is not stabilized, then this happens. The proximal spine translate onto the distal spine. And this injury to the spinal cord um, uh, is, is very difficult to recover. So we need to stabilize these spine where body as well as posterior complex is disease. And how do we identify it? If in a tubercular lesion, in an AP X-ray, we found pedicle shadow is missing besides hello. body disease. Then it is a pan. Hello? Hello? Please. The other one is large post debridement. If you debride here, then the graft placed is too big. And that is why here, posterior instrumentation should be done. A, 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 by any chance, if disc graft spans to disc uh, height, then you need to stabilize with the instrumentation. Correction of kyphosis, instrumentation is must. And TB of junctional area, cervical dorsal spines, then it is the instrumentation should be done. So these are the in indication of instrumentation. Do any instrumentation, whether pedicle or hard shell or plate fixation, all works well if correct principle used. You could see the pedicle instrumentation here. You could see the hard shell instrumentation here. You could see a combination of hard shell and pedicle layer. And you could see the posterior cervical spine. The posterior instrumentation was done and the whole graft was bridged anteriorly. Now this is the, you could see here, such a long segment disease, D1 to D10 para, uh, 
tuberculosis with paraplegia and you need to decompress at multiple level. So now uh, putting a multiple pedicle screw in such a long uh, disease and it would have spanned the whole instrument, uh, whole spine. So what we did is that we taken purchase against few of the disease bone, one healthy bone. These two were relatively better bone taken purchase and these are the um, uh, left these and then these are uh, purchase was taken uh, and that's how this spine was stabilized. You could see two level disease. Again, such a long segment disease. So what we did is that we put the uh, instrumentation proximally, left the middle segment, which was decompressed surgically, then some healthy uh, segment and then some healthy segment below. And that is how the hard shell instrumentation done. And since it was a stainless steel, so PET, it was evaluated by PET scan. Now spinal deformity, all issues are important. Which uh, uh, spinal deformity need to be corrected? What is the natural history of spinal deformity? If we are, this, we are deciding to correct the deformity and how we are going to do and how the deformity in children are going to behave. So we know that anyone which has a healed 60 degree or more deformity, then risk of late onset paraplegia increases. So deformity must be corrected in active stage of disease. And who are the ones which are going to have 60 degree? If initial vertebral body loss in octet disease is 1.5 vertebral body height. So in spite of conservatively treatment, deformity progresses. So we know if there is a in 1.5 vertebral body height loss, then it is going to end up in 60 degree or more kyphotic deformity and hence must be surgically corrected. And deformity correction in active disease is easier and has less complication. And that is what the deformity correction has to be done. Now, the question is how to do it. This is the line diagram of uh, uh, a tubercular lesion. And most of the time, tubercular lesion has a retropulsion of disease tissue into the spinal canal. And as a result, if you open it and correctly by soft, considering it to be soft disease, then deformity will correct. But this retropulsion will produce a paraplegia, a severe paraplegia. And that is why you need to do an anterior corpectomy. You have to excise this all and the disease focus. Now, if you correct without opening the locus, then the posterior, the length of the vertebral column increases because this kyphotic deformity, severe kyphotic deformity, has taken four to six months to develop. And this spinal cord is shortened to that length for last four to six months. So if you correct it, then this spinal cord will stretch out. And that is why you need to do a posterior column shortening. So you have to remove the posterior complex uh, of the body. So it means you have done anterior corpectomy, you have done posterior uh, excision of posterior column. Now this is a grossly unstable and that is why instrumented stabilization is a must and gap grafting anterior as well as posterior. So these are the step of deformity correction. And they have to be done sequentially and simultaneously in the same setting. And you could see many examples where this deformity has been corrected. You could see here such a severe deformity, here pedicle system, all posterior was done. And this example I have already shown before. Now the last is suspected drug resistance. We all know drug resistance for pulmonary tuberculosis for almost last four decades. But for bone and joint, first report uh, case started reporting around 98 and 99. And the issue was which case to be called a suspected drug resistance because we have never been able to uh, ascertain the diagnosis by demonstration of organism. At first instance, you know, pulmonary is very clear. If a sputum positive patients after four months of ATD remains positive, it is a drug resistance. While in our case, we have to suspect them clinically. So we do not know which is a case, how to establish drug resistance and how to treat. These are the three questions. I'm just going to answer in a minute. And this is what a lesion, ATD was started. And at nine months, the same. And in fact, one body more is affected now. So this is a suspected drug resistance case. So what in one of the article we have labeled is that anyone with five months ATT shows persistent of lesion, deterioration of the lesion, appearance of new lesion, appearance of a new cold abscess or a wound dehiscence. 
then these are suspected drug resistance cases. And these, what is the line of action? First, we have to ascertain the diagnosis. Are we treating tuberculosis or something else uh, on a, a clinical imaging ground? So we have to debride the lesion, submit for histology, smear, and genotypic analysis. That will ascertain the diagnosis, culture for DST, and a molecular method for DST. So these are the way by which we can get a drug resistance demonstration culture or gene experts for rifampicin and line pro for all other drugs. So that's how this action has to be done if you have suspected. And one must put tissue to two national accredited laboratory always. And then on the basis of that, it could be a isolated drug resistance, could be an MDR means rifampicin INH, or could be many other combination of drug resistance and then give treatment as per those uh, resistance. So second line ATT has to be done. But it is easier to ensure drug compliance. It is easier to prevent development of drug resistance because this the most common cause is improper treatment, improper regimen. And that is why ensure drug compliance at first instance, monitor drug response closely, never add a single drug to failing regimen and give a good nutrition. And then if it still doesn't respond, then uh, doesn't show good clinical response, then debride the lesion. And I think I would suggest you read this article because this has all information what is required for postgraduate student uh, on drug resistance. TB spine in children, I think we have to understand that child is not a miniature adult because these bones are cartilage. They just melt in a uh, infection, in inflammation. And that is why destruction is more, more severe and early severe deformity. You could see that there's hardly any bone, three vertebral body is completely disappeared. So you can understand how severe it's going to give a deformity. And it gives an early and severe deformity. This patient when came to me for the first time was carrying an x-ray which was taken three months ago, uh, three months before this x-ray. And you could see le very little, less deformity and such a severe deformity. Had he come at this point of time, then this such a severe catastrophe of severe deformity could have been avoided. This deformity, even after ATT, lesion heals, but deformity progresses with growth. And that is why we have to watch, keep a watch on that, that which is, spine at risk sign and which deformity is likely to progress and that deformity has to be surgically corrected in active stage of disease. We know here, you could see here that this deformity has progressed when we were doing only posterior spinal fusion. Now this deformity remains the same while this deformity has progressed. So that is how we have to observe and we have to continue to watch these children till they attain uh, growth uh, maturity uh, for their progression behavior of deformity. And one could see here, that, that is how these deformity uh, present in these children. And you could understand that these severe deformity could have a severe repercussion as for risk of paraplegia with healed disease. This is, was very interesting. This child has such a severe deformity. And when child used to lie down, this deformity used to get corrected. So it means this cartilaginous focus has become a pseudoarthrotic, need to be surgically intervened. And that is how a surgically intervention in another child was done. This patient came at this stage. This x-ray he was carrying and father was very clear, categoric, that in six months time, this deformity has progressed. He was carrying an x-ray which was taken six months, eight months before. And ATT was started at this point of time. Had he come at this point of time and deformity was taken care of, then probably this severe progression could have been avoided. And that is what severe progression of kyphotic deformity in children has to be watched. So friends, I have just talked about diagnosis in a presumptive case, early diagnosis before a classical lesion, ascertaining the diagnosis, hierarchy of diagnosis, treatment, which includes drug therapy, when, how much, how long, differences in adults, children with deficit, without deficit, Intervention, when type of intervention, surgical approaches. Drug resistance, how to diagnose. TB spine in children and paraplegia with heel disease. I would recommend that this index TB line uh, guidelines 
uh, it is available on Ministry of Health and Family Welfare's uh, website, 75 to 84 page, every postgraduate must read. And this book has 200 questions answered uh, from different uh, spine and uh, different joints where the question has been given an answer from, question answer from, for an evidence based. Uh, and all my articles which I have cited are available on www profaniljain.com and you can download as many times as possible and just try to read some of them. They will be useful to you all. Thank you very much indeed for patient hearing. Thank you, Anil. Very nice lecture as, as ever. And of course, we'll have a question at the, at the end of uh, this thing. And now we have another very eminent faculty with us, Dr. Ashok Banskota who has got a tremendous experience in treating the bone and joint infection, and he'd like to share his views on the chronic osteomyelitis. Dr. Ashok Balskota. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for making me a part of this August group of teachers participating on this uh, course. Uh, Chronic osteomyelitis is a uh, not so commonly encountered uh, condition in many developed countries, but we still see a lot of uh, long-standing and very challenging complications that still present to us because there are people who still cannot avail of, avail of treatment on time. So greetings from our hospitals in Nepal the Hospital and Rehabilitation Center for Disabled Children and the BNB Hospital. Uh, chronic osteomyelitis is an infection of bone and of the bone marrow. It generally progresses from an acute and subacute stage to a chronic form. The uh, prevalence from acute subacute is uh, reported from anywhere from 5 to 25 percent after the acute onset and in tubercular infections, one to 5% of bone infections proceed on to the chronic phase. The long bones of the extremities and the vertebrae are the most commonly affected sites. The uh, timeline is very interesting. Uh, it's been reported in, uh, uh, by Hippocrates' uh, observation that dead bone and sequestra were expelled out of bone, then uh, Brody's abscess was described in a subacute form of osteomyelitis. The term osteomyelitis was coined by Nilayton. Septic arthritis was also observed. And then uh, Robert Koch uh, heralded the birth of bacteri bacteriology and uh, uh, organisms were cultured in osteomyelitis by Becker. Gary defined certain different types of osteomyelitis and uh, bacteria were uh, isolated from the uh, bone and uh, there were uh, advocates of different types of treatment that started to occur like drainage, irrigation, and then the uh, availability of antibiotics starting from sulfonamides, penicillin, chloramphenicol, and whatnot. So, the causes of osteomyelitis, most important of all is the inadequate treatment of acute osteomyelitis. There can be hematogenous spread in uh, various types of septicemia, bacteremia, and that can seed any bone. Trauma, open fractures account for also a significant number of these infections. Another important category of infections involves iatrogenic you know, causes uh, especially following fracture fixation, joint replacements. And then there are you know, certain host factors that predispose to infection like uh, diabetes and peripheral vascular disease where ulcers fail to heal and uh, can progress and involve bones. So the most common bacteria involved in all age groups is Staphylococcus, but viruses, fungi, helminths, and granulomatous organisms and other atypical forms of bacteria like Salmonella and Brucella also can cause infections in bones. There is a uh, 
predilection for certain organisms based on age groups. Staphylococcus aureus is common in all age groups, but in infants under the age of four months, the enterobacter species, group A and B, streptococcus, and then in the four months to four year age group, in addition to Staphylococcus hemophilus influenzae and enterobacter, and etc. Sickle cell anemia, uh, salmonella group is important to remember. Sometimes vertebral osteomyelitis, brucella can be a cause, and of course, patients with uh, uh, vertebral involvements and um, infection by tubercular uh, bacteria can present with cold abscess. Uh, it's important to know uh, some of these uh, age variations and uh, uh, bacterial involvement because sometimes in acute osteomyelitis, there is a need to start empirical treatment. So you'd like to cover uh, your suspected organisms in addition to Staphylococcus till your culture, culture reports become available. In our own hospital, we found some recurring pattern of pathology. Um, most patients with chronic osteomyelitis present late, you know, uh, in this series, uh, the symptoms were present for an average of more than 15 months. Most of the lesions were in the lower extremities. More than 60% had a draining sinus when first seen. And there were only 53% uh, positive for staph aureus. The other organisms were tuberculosis, pseudomonas, proteus, and E. coli. And we are unable to grow any organisms in 27% because most cases of chronic osteomyelitis would have received a variety of treatments before they end up in some definitive treatment center. The infection uh, is predilected to involving long bones because of the specific nature of the vascular anatomy at the epiphysis where the sinusoidal loops you know, are a predisposed area for venous stasis where bacteremia can cause lodging of vertebra. A small abscess starts to form and the abscess can slowly increase and it finds the uh, outlet, uh, um, mostly ending in the formation of a periosteal abscess. When the attachment of the joint capsule is uh, intraarticular, the pus can spread into the, the adjacent joint as well. The epiphysis is a, a good barrier to the spread of infection, but from the birth to the age of about 18 months, transepiphyseal vessels are present and they may uh, permit the spread of infection into the joint in this age group. And this is a point that has to be remembered. So the abscess starts to increase if it is not uh, treated, it has uh, several outlets. It can uh, become a subperiosteal abscess. It can uh, get into the joint if the joint capsule attachment is within the uh, metaphysis, and it can also spread down the medullary canal into the diaphysis. Patients generally will present with pain, fever, and constitutional symptoms. And when there is a wound, the bone may be exposed, there may be a discharging sinus, there may be deformity, a long-standing case may present with you know, joint involvement, limb deformities, limb length inequality, a pathological fracture, or septic arthritis. There are various classifications of uh, chronic osteomyelitis, and they're based on a variety of factors, such as etiology, wound characteristics, the extent of tissues involved, bone defects, the anatomy of the bone infection, and the physiology of the host. The classification uh, may apply to a particular scenario only, and it does help to plan management and predict prognosis and plan rehabilitation. So this one particular classification by Cerny and Madder is pretty helpful. It is based on the anatomy of bone infection and the physiology of the host. The anatomical types are uh, four, and 
You can have a medullary osteomyelitis, a superficial osteomyelitis, a localized osteomyelitis, or a diffuse osteomyelitis. And the physiological class, you may have a normal host, a systemically compromised host, and a host in which the uh, treatment could be worse than disease. So I'll try to you know, describe these with certain uh, classical examples that we have encountered in our own uh, uh, institution. So the medullary osteomyelitis, the in infected intramedullary rods is a good example. In the superficial uh, category, the only a, uh, one cortex of the bone may be involved. And sometimes uh, in the localized form, a full thickness cortical sequestrum uh, may be seen without any uh, instability. When there is a diffuse involvement, there is loss of bone with instability and which uh, may require uh, intercalary resection to control the infection when a large segment of the bone gets in, uh, involved. So there are different types of uh, host uh, factors. They could be systemic as noted here and local, uh, for example, lymphedema, venous stasis, all these things could affect the nature of the uh, progression of the disease and uh, affect healing. So, the different uh, types of uh, osteomyelitis have been described clinical uh, varieties of Brody's abscess where uh, thick cortices will prevent the abscess from breaking into and forming a subperiosteal abscess leading to recrudescent you know exacerbations of pain and uh, fever and uh, the second type is a Gary's sclerosing osteomyelitis, where large segments of the diaphysis become uh, involved. You can also have a recurrent multifocal type of osteomyelitis, where you know there are periods of uh, um, well-being followed by sudden again uh, symptoms of pain and swelling, and very difficult to culture organisms in this type of osteomyelitis, and quite often they are self-limiting. Then you have a, a syndromic, you know, what is called a CFO, where osteomyelitis is uh, accompanied by synovitis, acne, postulosis, hyperostotic changes, and osteitis. And sometimes in uh, uh, children, uh, osteomyelitis uh, can mimic Ewing sarcoma. So uh, that has to be always kept in uh, the back of your mind. Uh, what is a sequestrum? A sequestrum is a very important part of the clinical and radiological scenario in chronic osteomyelitis. And a, the control of chronic osteomyelitis is frequently related to how you uh, uh, deal with your sequestrum. So sequestrum is a piece of uh, avascular bone and it is uh, seen in the x-ray as hyperdense because of its static mineral content. And in this particular x-ray that you see on the left side, you can see the sequestrum lodged in the intramedullary space. Another type of sequestrum is like what you see in this clinical picture where a large segment of dead bone is, uh, you know, just uh, at the center of a large open ulcer. So the sequestrum has uh, various consequences. It can, in a small uh, growing child, it can completely resolve and the sequestrum can incorporate into a involucrum. It can also discharge through the sinus or sometimes the sequestrum will require uh, uh, surgical removal. So we have a logarithm here and how you proceed to uh, manage a sequestrum. You can, if it's a resolving sequestrum and a, you have an enlarging involucrum, you can wait and watch and protect the limb, or you can proceed with a limited debridement and can uh, wait till the sequestrum is fully incorporated into the involucrum. If it does not occur, then you can go ahead and do a limited sequestrectomy. If there is a constant sequestrum and a constant involucrum, 
you can do a, a localized, uh, simple uh, minor saucerization. If there is a diffuse uh, sequestrum, then you might require to resort to intervention, interventions like intermediary reaming or do a limited diaphysectomy. If there is an enlarging sequestrum and a limited involucrum, a radical debridement and reconstruction may be necessary. And now, depending on the bone gap that is present, you might be able to uh, accept a little bit of shortening or you might have to do some reconstructive measures. So I will go ahead and show you a few examples. Here is a uh, young boy who presented to us six months after uh, his original uh, event, which was severe burns sustained to both his lower extremities. And uh, he was advised bilateral amputation at the primary hospital. So that is when he came to our hospital. So the X-ray shows that one uh, cortex, the anteromedial cortex of his tibia is uh, hyper dense. And the problem here was failure by the original treatment team to recognize the superficial sequestrum on the tibia. So what we did was uh, through multiple surgical procedures on each leg, the superficial sequestrum was uh, very carefully, you know, scraped off with an osteotome and uh, we allowed granulation tissue to uh, cover the exposed uh, healthier bone. And over a period of time, we were able to graft this. So here is the boy now uh, grafted. Both legs were salvaged we, uh, with physiotherapy and you know, training was able to walk again. And we, this is a seven year follow up where both the limbs are you know, completely uh, functional. Here is a, another example of uh, a child presenting to us five weeks after the uh, original injury, which was a uh, open fracture with a draining you know, abscess and um, the uh, dead bone is projecting out of the wound. The X-ray here shows a uh, tubular sequestrum with a very, very proliferative uh, involucrum. So this sequestrum was uh, removed and you can uh, see here in the following picture how uh, after removal of the sequestrum, the involucrum goes on to uh, remodel and heal with uh, good function. This is uh, another 14-year-old boy, again presenting to the hospital with uh, uh, discharging sinus and uh, after uh, seven, eight weeks of the initial event, the X-ray shows a uh, evolving involucrum around a large segment of uh, uh, hyperdense uh, tubular sequestrum. So in children, you got to be very uh, careful not to aggressively remove large segments of bone. You proceed to uh, provide adequate drainage of the pus. You uh, do your you know, culture studies and initiate appropriate antibiotics. You protect the limb and uh, just observe. And uh, at some point in time, a limited sequestrectomy would do the job, like you see in this case, where we waited for the involucrum to form and a small part of the sequestrum uh, had to be removed. And over a period of time, excellent remodeling. The periosteum is very vascular and it can actually uh, remodel extremely well. There's another example of a 16 year old girl. She sequestered a right tibial diaphysis. She presented with this picture with multiple pathological fractures and she was managed in a uh, above knee cast. And uh, over a period of time, the pathological fractures united, the knee healed in a little bit of freaker bottom. But uh, when you treat uh, children, a lot of these children come to us from very remote areas and they don't have access to repeated you know, follow-ups. And we sometimes have to decide on treatments to effect a cure. And so 
we always think of function and uh, the patient here was uh, able to manage extremely well, even though we have some residual deformity and a little bit of shortening. Here you can see that she's able to squat and uh, it is another example of a child presenting to the hospital two months after the original injury with fever and uh, discharging sinus and a dirty infected wound. So this uh, large segment of bone has uh, spontaneously sequestered and is almost uh, coming out of the uh, shin by itself. So uh, you gradually, uh, uh, after your tactful sequestrectomy, uh, you clean the wound and allow uh, the uh, soft tissue envelope to develop. The vascularity should not be disturbed. If, you, if the periosteal tube is uh, maintained, you'll be surprised how the bone starts to reform nicely. So here we have uh, removed the sequestrum. You see the nice uh, vascular bed and over a period of time, the fracture heals. We just protected this child in a uh, plaster immobilizer. And over a period of time, the bone went on to heal itself. Another example of a constant sequestrum where the sequestrum is in uh, completely surrounded by uh, uh, the Cortex, cortex on all sides. So in this kind of case, you will have to do a sequest saucerization and remove the uh, dead bone from the medullary space. Sometimes in a sclerosing osteomyelitis, the uh, patients suffer from uh, repeated episodes of fever, pain, swelling, and the x-rays would show something like this. So the medullary canal is extremely narrow and these types of patients will require very tactful uh, intramedullary reaming where uh, it will be very difficult sometimes to get into the medullary canal. So you've got to plan your surgery properly and very graded uh, uh, intramedullary reaming uh, to restore a normal medullary canal and to drain the, you know, abscess if abscess is present or and to clean out the infected endosteal bone is uh, the way to go and if you can do that you can get a scenario like this where you are able to remove all the infected debris uh, in this this kind of case there is a great risk of actually breaking your reamer and so you must have all your instruments in proper shape so when you have a larging, uh, enlarging sequestrum and a limited involucrum, then radical procedures are required. Here is a young 15-year-old girl. She uh, sustained her injuries in a village more than nine months back and presented to us like this with a large segment of the mid-diaphysis completely sequestered. So in her particular case, what we decided to do was do a two-stage Huntington procedure where the fibula is incorporated uh, into the tibia and we proceed with protected weight bearing. And this girl, uh, in, with protected weight bearing, the fibula slowly hypertrophies and over a period of time, it is uh, able to take uh, weight and um, the leg length inequality is completely manageable. These types of procedures are not done frequently anymore, but when you have a uh, patient who is near about uh, completing their growth spurt, it is a uh, definitive treatment. And that's sometimes a very big challenge for us. A lot of children come from very remote areas and we are kind of uh, pushed to deliver a cure with one or to treatments and they have very little access for follow-up. So this procedure always uh, is in our you know, books and here you will see an example of uh, such a case. So uh, fractures and open injuries are common everywhere. 
uh, still a large number of uh, uh, children who live in remote areas come to us late with complications. It's a 16 year old girl with a Gustillo three fracture, you know, treated by uh, external fixators and antibiotics and um, coming to us with a huge mid segment uh, sequestrum. And we did a uh, sequestrectomy. We took care of the wound, all the unhealthy tissue was removed. So we left with a gap, which was managed by distraction, osteogenesis on a frame. And uh, we ended up with a docking site non-union. This was addressed by plating, this failed, and uh, bone grafting was uh, done in addition. But after all these procedures, after uh, this, we put the child in a petal tendon weight bearing cast for several months and uh, this went on to unite. So here we are, final x-ray. So another example of a 14-year-old girl, uh, six months post untreated acute osteomyelitis of the right tibia, no involucrum response and uh, almost 10 centimeter leg length inequality. So first stage, we did a radical debridement and put the uh, ring fixators. And uh, it's sometimes very difficult to achieve uh, a large segment bone transport in one go. So in this particular child, um, some significant leg length discrepancy uh, persisted, but at this first stage, we decided to uh, regain the knee movements and give her a shoe lift and build up her muscles and uh, follow her up again after some time. So in, here, here we have a uh, final x-ray. Here she is now with a slight shortening of the leg. Oh, this can be addressed as a second procedure later. So sometimes the osteomyelitis, which involves the forearm, you can have a, a complete loss of a big segment of the diaphysis and the, when the radius is involved, the patients will present to you with a discharging sinus and uh, with a radial club hand type of deformity. So in these cases, we uh, do a stage procedure. You can use a tibial inlay graft and protect the, maintain the radial length with the external fixator. And uh, in children, the graft takes on very well. And uh, here is an example of that. So fibular uh, graft is also is, uh, an option in a infected non-union like this. good example of how the graph takes nicely. So fibular inlay graft. Sometimes you can use the fibula and you know anchor it into the medullary canal like this and hold it with few screws here. In children, these types of treatments are also uh, quite effective. So here is a, a case where multiple procedures had been done and the patient presents to us with a uh, very challenging scenario. First managed elsewhere with the external fixator after a, uh, infection and uh, uh, multiple procedures failed. So when they presented to us, there was a uh, active infection, large tubular sequestrum, which we removed and we used a you know, antibiotic space filler to control the local infection. And uh, we left the antibiotic spacer for uh, six weeks. And this allowed a, a membrane to form here uh, with a healthy vascular bed. So this is like a masculine procedure. And take both cortical and cancellous grafts to pack that defect. And over a period of time, there is a good incorporation of the graft, and uh, here you have a nine months follow up 
the gap is fully filled. So this is a, a logarithm that I had presented before. You have to uh, carefully evaluate your patient and x-rays. You do your bone culture, biopsy, you do your lab work, you start appropriate antibiotics uh, guided by culture and sensitivity, and you observe the nature of the sequestrum and then proceed further. So my take home message is to treat acute osteomyelitis promptly. Prevention is the best treatment for chronic osteomyelitis. We need to proceed with judicious debridement and avoid very early sequestrectomy in young children. If that is done, you may have long, very long bone gaps, which are very difficult to manage and give biology a chance. And follow a comprehensive care pathway addressing general condition of the patient, nutrition, comorbidities, appropriate antibiotics, and surgical debridement. Now, sometimes you can come with, uh, come, uh, be confronted with a scenario where you don't know what to do. There is an example of a child where we have proceed with any treatment, but it's a six-year-old female child who run osteomyelitis of the left area, very significant leg length discrepancy, severe knee at the bottom and ankle virus for the child at no pain, and this is how the child walks. It's very functional. What to do? Leave the child alone, proceed with amputation and and reconstruction. Very difficult to decide. So we don't know if any intervention would make the child worse. It is another child again has gone through the whole uh, process. No treatments have been available. His whole arm is stopped. Only the universe has only two small pieces of bone. These are some examples that patients that we have treated. for your patient. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, we have a next lecture by Dr. Krishna, my very dear friend and a very eminent orthopedic assessor from Peshawar, Dr. Krishna. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Very warm greetings from Peshawar, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this uh, PG instructional course. I am very grateful to the organizers and as always to Dr. Devin Taneja. Today I am going to, going to talk about uh, the diabetic foot, and I hope uh, people can learn from it. So what is a diabetic foot? Any foot pathology that results directly from diabetes for its long or its long-term complications. The foot of a diabetic patient that has the potential risk of pathological consequences including infection, ulceration, and or destruction of deep tissues associated with Neurologic abnormalities, various degrees of peripheral vascular okay. disease, and or metabolic complications of diabetes in the lower limb. A full screen. Uh, could, could you make it a full screen? And uh, your slides are not moving. Okay. Full screen. Is it all right now, sir? It is okay now. 
Uh, hey, let it be like this only uh, because yeah. there, there was a problem with Dr. Raj Gopal also. So I don't know what. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, can you see the slides? Yes. Okay. Now, any foot pathology that results directly from diabetes or its long term complications, this is a diabetic foot. The foot of a diabetic, di diabetic patient that has the potential risk of pathological consequences, including infection, ulceration, or destruction of deep tissues associated with neurologic abnormalities, various degrees of peripheral vascular disease, and or metabolic complications of diabetes in the lower limb. Diabetes causes more than 70% of lower limb amputations. Every 30 seconds, a person loses a lower limb to diabetes in this world. And diabetes causes more amputations than landmines, even in former war zones. Foot ulceration, sepsis, and amputations are the feared complications of diabetes. We, over a passage of time, have learned a lot about diabetes. But what is happening is that there's a gap between what is known to us and what is really being done for the patients. So we have to overcome that gap. It is unwise to consider that diabetic foot occurs all of a sudden, it does not. There, there are predisposing factors, which are neurological and, and, you, uh, and uh, vascular. There are precipitating factors, trauma or tenia. And there are per, per, uh, perpetuating factors, which are the comorbidities. Now, what's the high risk for it? First and foremost, long duration and uncontrolled diabetes mellitus. In plus, peripheral neuropathy, peripheral vascular disease, trauma, previous ulcers, diabetic nephropathy or retinopathy, obesity, and lack of education. Now, everybody must have seen in their practices that it is the male gender which is most affected. I, in my practice, see eight out of 10 cases of males. So it has to do something with the gender too. The classification and staging of a diabetic foot, uh, a standard classification is useful to assess the etiology, find prognosis, facilitate appropriate treatment, monitor progress, and serve as a form of communication. But there are no universally accepted classifications. The diabetic foot is classified on the basis of etiology into the neuropathic foot and the neuro ischemic foot. The neuropathic foot can be with infection or without infection. And so is the neuro ischemic foot, which can be with or without infection. Uh, Wagner's classification is the most widely quoted classification when ulcers develop. And this classification is the following. Grade zero is the impending diabetic foot or the impending ulcer when the skin is intact, but you can see some redness around the, the affected area. Type one is the superficial ulcer. Type two is the deep ulcer. Now deep ulcer is where when you can see the underlying structures of the skin. Type three is when there is osteomyelitis. Type four is the forefoot gangrene, and type five is the whole foot gangrene or the entire foot gangrene. Now, this is what it would look like. Grade zero is the impending foot, diabetic foot. Grade one is the superficial ulcer. Grade two is the deep ulcer. Grade three is with osteomyelitis. Grade four is the forefoot gangrene, and grade five is the whole foot gangrene. 
Now, the pathogenesis is multifactorial. There is neuropathy, there is vasculopathy, and there is immune dysfunction. Prolonged hyperglycemia contributes to all the above factors through different mechanisms. So neuropathy, vasculopathy, and immune dysfunction coupled with prolonged hyperglycemia is the reason why a diabetic foot develops. The assessment is history, physical examination, and investigations. This is an algorithm which you must remember. Diabetic foot examination includes the deformity, D for deformity, I for infection, A for atrophy, B for the breakdown of the skin, E for edema, T for temperature, I for ischemia, C for callosities, and S for skin color. Now, what does neuropathy do in a neuropathic foot? That sensory neuropathy leads to a loss of pain. Now, this loss of pain would make the foot vulnerable to small trivial trauma, which can be thermal, chemical, and mechanical. Now, then the lesion progresses, there is callus formation, and which leads to tissue necrosis and the damage of tissue beneath the callus. Then cavities appear, which are filled with serous fluid, and these cavities are underlying the callus. And then this complex erupts into the surface, leading to the formation of ulcers. Now, motor neuropathy can lead to the weakness and wasting of interesting foot muscles, leading to foot deformities, abnormal gait, rubbing of the foot in abnormal areas with the footwear, or against other uh, irritants, and ultimately leading to ulceration. Now, the, what does a neuropathic foot uh, look like? There are clawed toes, bunions, nail deformities, deformities from premier, previous trauma or surgery, and ankle equinus. Pes cavus, pes planus, the Charcot's foot, Alex Ruiz, these are all present in a neuropathic foot. Neuropathy can be autonomic, which results in decreased sweating, leading to dry and brittle skin, leading to the formation of fissures and cracks, which predispose to infection and there is secondary infection and formation of ulcers. Now, factors contributed to foot ulceration are intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic factors are bony prominences, limited joint mobility, deformities, callus formation, previous foot ulcer, and neuroarthropathy. Extrinsic factors are walking barefoot, inappropriate footwear, falls and accidents, small objects inside the foot, thermal trauma, and increased activity level. Vasculopathy, vasculopathy, which is the neuroischemic foot, there is macro and microangiopathy. Macroangiopathy is atherosclerosis of large arteries, commonly found in diabetes mellitus. Microangiopathy is increased thickness of basement membrane of endothelial pro proliferation, and which also there might be capillary damage. So what happens when there is decreased blood flow? When there's decreased local blood flow, it is difficult for the blood supply to get to the wound and there is poor wound healing. And if you're giving drugs, there is poor antibiotic penetration. The neuropathic foot has diminished sensation it is invariably warm as opposed to the neuroischemic foot. It has intact, often bounding pulses. Ulcers 
Pressure points on portal surface, stress areas on dorsal surface. Ulcers often preceded by callus formation. Ulcers can be secondarily infected. They can quickly lead to cellulitis, abscess formation, and osteomyelitis. Sepsis may complicate, resulting in gangrene. In an ischemic foot and or the neuro ischemic foot, the full foot pulses are absent, indicating trauma, indicating ischemia. Sorry, foot is not warm. Lesions on the margin of the foot and tip of the toes. Absence of callus in his characteristic feature, whereas in a neuropathic foot, the, there was callus formation. Gangrene may be present. It is essentially to identify critical ischemia. It is characteristic pink. It is painful. It is pulseless. It is cold. Now, what is the difference between what are the characteristics between the neuropathic foot and, and, and the ischemic foot? The skin temperature in neuropathic foot, it is warm, whereas in an ischemic foot, it is cold. Neuropathic foot is painless, ischemic is painful. The skin color in a neuropathic foot is not altered. There is slight rumor in the ischemic foot. Callus, thick at pressure points, in an ischemic foot, callus is usually not present. There are ulcers usually on tip of the toes and plantar surfaces. Whereas in an ischemic foot, it is often on the margin of the foot, tips, and toes. Peripheral pulses in a neuropathic foot are bounding. In an ischemic foot are feeble or absent. The ankle brachial index in a neuropathic foot is more than 0 0.9, and it is less than 0 0.9 in an ischemic foot. And the complications of the neuropathic foot along with the ulcers is charcoal joints, whereas in ischemic foot, it is critical ischemia. These are the following investigations that you have to do. One is the blood work for high blood sugar and diabetic, diabetic ketoacidosis. Gram staining and culture imaging includes plain x-rays, MR, Doppler, ABI, and ultrasound, sometimes for deep abscesses. Five cornerstones of the management of the diabetic foot. There should be regular inspection and examination and patient education. This is very, very important. Patient education and, of course, education of the relatives and healthcare providers is one of the biggest cornerstones of management of the diabetic foot. Identification of the foot at risk, appropriate footwear, and a multidisciplinary approach and treatment of ulcerative and non-ulcer pathology. The principles of foot ulcer management include infection control, offloading of the foot, vascular assessment, and wound care. The neuropathic foot, the management falls into three parts. Removal of callus, eradication of infection, and reduction of weight bearing forces, often requiring bed rest with the foot elevated. Excess carotene should be pared away with a scalpel blade to expose the floor of the ulcer and allow efficient drainage of the lesion. In a neuropathic foot, you have to get x rays which would help you to assess whether there is a possibility or the presence of osteomyelitis. And this is done in cases where there is a deep penetrating ulcer, when the lesion is to heal, or they continue to recur. A bacterial swab should be taken from the floor of the ulcer, culture of the excised, culture of the excised tissue, a superficial ulcer may be treated on OPD basis. Oral antibiotics are prescribed according to the organisms isolated on culture. The most likely organism to infect superficial ulcer are the staphylococcus, the streptococcus, and anaerobes. Now, treatment should be started with 
amoxicillin, fluoxacillin, and metronidazole. Antibiotics should be adjusted when results of bacteriological culture are available. Choice and duration of antibiotic administration require considerable expertise and laboratory guidance. A simple non-adherent dressing should be applied after cleaning the ulcer with normal saline. Deep indolent ulcers require offloading with local contact plaster, with total contact plaster. It should conform to the contours of the foot, thereby reducing shear forces on the plantar surface. Any foot lesion which is not healed in one month requires further investigation and a different approach. In an ischemic foot, ulcer does not respond to must, uh, medical treatment and vascular investigation is required. Now, if you are treating the patient and it is not responding, that vascular investigation becomes a must. Doppler studies to measure the pressure index, the ankle brachial ratio. Uh, there is a way you have to get the ratio from both the posterior tibials and the dorsalis pedis and the brachial arteries. So if the pressure index is 1.2, or more, it indicates rigid or classified or calcified vessels. If the pressure index is 1 to 1.1, it is normal. If the pressure index is 0 0.9, it indicates ischemia. And of course, if the pressure index is lower, it indicates more severe anemia, ischemia. Arterial imaging include Duplex scanning, MR, and conventional arteriography. Infrapoptelial angioplasty or distal bypass to the tibial or peroneal vessels are imported from Liz limb salvage. Amputation of the toe is usually success, is unsuccessful in neuroischemic foot unless the foot is revascularized. If amputation due to some reasons is not possible, then a dry necrotic toe should be allowed to auto-amputate. Amputate. After attempts to control infection, below knee amputation is indicated in those with extensive tissue destruction. In the ischemic foot, it can, rest pain is very significant. And it can be relieved by successful revascularization, paraventricular lumbar block. If that fails, opiates, opiates have to be given for pain relief. And ultimately, uh, if it does not respond to any other treatment, a below knee amputation may be the last resort. What, are, what, are the, what is the urgent treatment required? When there are danger signs, urgent treatment is needed. These dangerous signs include redness and swelling of the foot, cellulitis, discoloration, and crepitus. A pain, painful, pulseless foot, even without gangrene, indicates critical ischemia. Urgent treatment is bed rest, IV antibiotics, and it is necessary to provide a wide spectrum of antibiotic cover. Thus, quadruple therapy is necessary, consistent of amoxicillin, fluoxacillin, metronidazole to cover the anaerobes, and either cefetazine and gentamicin to treat gram-negative neg gram organisms. This treatment can be adapted when the results of a culture come in. The emergence of MRSA is presenting a very serious problem. Now, and the available treatments include IV clindamycin, vancomycin, and intramuscular tycoplanine. An IV insulin pump may be necessary to control the blood glucose. Surgical debridement to drain pus and abscess cavities to re remove all necrotic and inf infected tissues to remove devitalized and infected bone resulting from osteomyelitis. If necrosis has developed in the digit, 
a ray amputation is necessary. Skin grafting is needed after granulation tissue has developed, which accelerated, accelerates bone healing. The neuropathic joint, also called as, called as Charcot's joint, uh, in that Charcot's foot, there is loss of pain, sensation, and there is a ramification of bones. And this happens because of the abnormal mechanical stresses, and that can lead to the damage to susceptible bones by relatively minor, minor trauma. Patients present with a hot, swollen foot, sometimes aching. These appearances are often mistaken for infection. Injury may have occurred days or weeks earlier or may not have even been noticed. The distrust, destructive process does not continue indefinitely but stops after weeks and months. Bony changes are most often seen, seen at the ankle joint, tarsometatarsal region of the foot, or metatarsophalangeal joints. Early diagnosis of a charco foot is essential. The initial presentation of unilateral warmth and swelling in a neuropathic foot is suggestive of a developing charco joint. Bone scans are more sensitive indication of new bone formation than radiography to confirm the diagnosis. It is essential to exclude infection. When the diagnosis is difficult, gallium white cell, cell, cell scan and MRI are needed. Now, the management of a neuropathic joint initially is rest, ideally bed rest or use of non-weight bearing crutches. Alternatively, Alternatively, the foot can be immobilized in a well-molded total contact plaster, which is initially non-weight bearing. Immobilization is continued until bony repair is complete, usually in two or three months. The use of bisphosphonates, now this is important, the use of bisphosphonates in preventing bone damage in a charcoal foot is very promising nowadays. Long-term management, special shoes and insoles should be fitted to accommodate deformity and prevent ulceration, which is a major, major hazard of the charcoal foot. Long-term care of the wound is footwear, molded insoles, and failure to wear appropriate shoes is a common cause of recurrence in treated patients. Screening and prevention. The foot must be examined routinely at the onset of the diabetes and annually thereafter. Identify the critically ischemic foot is important. Patients should be aware of the need for foot care. Patients should be advised that new shoes have to be broken in by wearing them initially for only short periods. This is very essential in, uh, in, when you go for patient education and the education of their relatives. The new footwear should be worn initially for a few minutes and then keep on increasing them with the passage of time. Now, a simple sensory test should be performed. Uh, this is the pressure test here. And it is uh, where if there is an inability to detect 10 gram or more of pressure, then the foot is at risk for ulceration. Examine the pulses, and the pulses should be dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial. Now here, I would want to mention one thing that in a lot of cases, in even in normal people, you might not be able to uh, palpate the dorsalis pedis. Uh, so you have to be very careful. So it has to be dorsalis pedis and the posterior tibial arteries, the pulses have to be examined. Uh, active lesions should be sought and treated immediately. Deformities, callus, skin cracks, discoloration need to be detected and managed. Advice and education must follow the examination. In a low risk foot, these are the feet with normal sensation, palpable pulses, and individual foot care education. In an at risk foot, 
where there is neuropathy, absent pulses, or other risk factors described above, enhance foot care education. Ins inf inspect foot every six months. And in a high risk foot, these are feet with ischemia, deformity, skin changes, or previous ulcer. There should be a three month follow up in intensified foot care education and special arrangements for people with disabilities or immobility. So in conclusion, many foot problems can be prevent, prevented and all diabetic patients should be aware of the potential problem of foot damage. Every patient should be issued with information containing straightforward safety instructions. A good podiatrist must be available for diabetic patients. Close coordination between the podiatrist, orthotist, nurse, physician, endocrinologist and a surgeon is vital in the care of a diabetic foot. Now the key message is that most foot problems in diabetics are easily detectable and preventable. Simple intervention can reduce amputations by 50 to 80%. Strategies aimed at preventing foot ulcers are cost-effective and cost-saving. And the pathway to amputation is littered with bandages and dressings, which deceive both doctor and the patient into thinking that the dressing, the dressing of an ulcer, by dressing an ulcer, they are curing it. And diabetics should treat their feet like their face. Thank you. That was it. Uh, very nice lecture. I enjoyed it. A very, very uh, difficult problem to deal with it. I do not know how many cases you see. We see quite a bit. Very difficult problem to deal with. Anyway, we will discuss it in let, the, let, our let, discussion let, period. Thanks okay. so much, Krishnud, for your time. And now okay. we'll have go back to Dr. Rajgopalak for his lecture on compartment syndrome. Dr. Rajgopalak. <laughs> Sir, the screen share has to be stopped. The screen is locked, sir. Sir, the screen is... Question, uh, you can remove your slides. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Raj Gopalan. Yes, sir. Hope this works. Uh, so I'll also go like this. Is it moving? I hope so. Yeah, it's moving. Is it moving for you, sir? It's moving. Okay, sir. Yeah. I will not go in full mode, sir. So, um, good evening again. Um, my talk is on compartment syndrome. When we talk of compartment syndrome, all that comes to our mind first is the Wokman systemic contracture. Richard von Wachmann in 1881, he described the uh, contracture. He called it the publication as non-infective ischemic condition of the facial compartments in the extremities, because at that time they thought it is due to a nerve palsy. So he was the first one to think that it's a facial compartment problem, but he also really has not mentioned about compartment. Actually, it's a uh, compartment, yes, but not with the pressure. However, um, he's the one who described it and later, much later, about almost 90 years later only, the compartment pressure measurement and the importance of the compartment pressure recording came in, measurement came in. It was in the 70s that Woven uh, described the use of VIX catheter. And in 80, Dr. Matson probably published uh, the maximum referred article in this compartment part, part portion is concerned. He also described an algorithm for the pathophysiology. But we, before we go into that, a brief anatomy. Now, compartment syndrome can occur in many areas of the body. I am just taking only the leg as the example because within the 30 minutes, all the com possible compartments cannot be covered. A brief anatomy because without that, you will not uh, be clear about it. The leg is divided into four compartments. One is the anterior compartment of the extensors, 
the lateral compartment of the peroneia and the abertus, and the posterior compartment is divided into two: the superficial posterior, including the gastrocoeliac group, and the deep one with the inverters and flexors. A fifth compartment also has been documented in the literature, but the clinical significance of this compartment as a standalone one is really not established. The fifth one is a tibialis posterior compartment. So you can call it a fourth or fifth one, and uh, either way it is fine. But tibia, probably the importance is because of that decompressing each compartment. I'm not going to go more into that. So. When we talk of compartment syndrome, there are two types. Primarily, the etiopathology is same in both it from the increased compartment pressure, but the mechanism is different. The first one is what is called the acute compartment syndrome, where it is the trauma of the affected compartment, like you see in fractures or muscle injuries. The second one is called exertional compartment syndrome, which is associated with the repetitive loading and micro trauma. My talk will be entirely on the acute compartment syndrome. So this is the matrix algorithm. To understand that, we have to before that go into the pathophysiology. So, an acute what is an acute compartment syndrome? When in a compartment, a closed compartment, the intracompartmental pressure goes up to that extent that the microcellular microcirculation of the tissue in the compartment is diminished. That is where the syndrome starts. The pressure can be high, but moment the microcirculation is affected, diminished, then a acute compartment syndrome starts. What is the reason for this? It could be because the compartment should become smaller, or the water is in the compartment muscles they become more in volume, or most often it is both these factors come into play. When will the circulation be affected? When the intracompartmental pressure exceeds the venous capillary pressure. To understand that, we have to look at this picture. This is the arterial length in the compartment, and that normal pressure is around 35 millimeters of mercury. This is the venous end where the normal pressure is 25 millimeters mercury. So there's a gradient of 10 millimeters. So if you if you take the 10, this is plus 10, the mid capillary area is zero, this is minus less than 10. So Keep it as uh, minus seven. So it flows in this way. That is the red blood, uh, the arterial blood. It goes to the venous area. But when the compartment pressure goes up, this pressure, venous pressure goes up. When the venous pressure goes up to 10, the whole thing stops. When it goes more, the arterial, uh, arterial area is compressed. So once it is compressed, what happens? Once it is compressed, there will be arterial compression that will diminish the perfusion. The perfusion will not take place. The gradient is the reverse. Once perfusion is not there, there is no nutrition, there is no, no oxygenation, there will be soft tissue ischemia, and that will cause anoxia, and it will cause cell death. Not only that, when there is anoxia, there will be edema. Edema will make the, the size of the muscle small. A pressure will still increase. It's a vicious circulation, vicious cycle. And what is the most uh, vulnerable tissue in the skeletal muscle? Even though the most sensitive one is the nerve, most vulnerable here is the muscle because they are in the bulk. So your initial problem is of the muscles, then comes the nerves, all, then all the changes. What decides? One is duration, how long you keep the compartment, how fast you release it. So the duration is what deciding factor. Temperature, that depends on the body and the local temperature. The rest of the temperature better. Third is, is any other residual circulation available, which means sufficient collateral blood supply. So collaterals and lower local temperature and earlier decompression will slow down the process. Now let's look at the uh, masses algorithm. I know it will be difficult for you to see it, uh, but it, all be, it has to be there. So you have an increased compartment pressure from whatever be the cause. That will cause a decreased compartment uh, size which will lead to vasospasm, and that causes a uh, decreased uh, arterial pressure, and uh, that increase in the compartment pressure, and that will due to closure of the capillaries. That alone is enough to cause the ischemia of the muscle. But as a vicious cycle, this will again in turn cause edema, increased pressure that goes on. So finally, all this decreased perfusion results in myonecrosis. My God. 
Okay. So now how much time is important? There's publication by Aurora Beck and Clark, which shows that the duration is very, very significant. Their study showed that if you between pressures of 40 to 80 millimeters of mercury, if the, if the pressure is sustained for four hours, whatever nerve function nerve dysfunction occurs is still reversible. But that same pressure, if you keep it for 12 hours, it's a permanent neurological damage. So, in other words, the earlier the diagnosis, the earlier the fasciotomy, you have a good result. So, in other words, the the proportion, the ischemia, the muscle necrosis is proportional to duration of ischemia and inversely proportional to local temperature. Now, what is the problem with the compartment syndrome? What happens is it is called, it can occur. It is common in some of the multi polytrauma patients. So the head injury or patient's bad condition or bleeding or other things may distract us and we will not be looking for the compartment and we may miss it. It distracts us. And that is something which shouldn't happen because the patient recovers, this shouldn't become bad. So one has to have a suspicion and that only will help you diagnose. And the most common site, if you take almost all the articles put together, is the leg, which is followed by the forearm. But there is few series where forearm is more common. But generally, you can say that leg is more common by forearm, then the arm, then the thigh, foot, gluteal region, hand, and also the abdomen. All are recorded. Now, what are the risk factors? Younger patients are more prone to compare to elderly people, below 35. This is probably because of the muscle bulk and type of injury. A close fracture tibia is the most common cause. If you take again by the literature, about 33% of the compartment case are from the um, close fracture tibia and 25% from blunt injuries of the soft tissue injuries of the limb. And forearm is only 20% and foot is around 6%. So the typing is wrong. It's a typographical error. It is 6%. Now, now um, so what, what happens, um, uh, we should look at the risk factors. What happens? In, if you do a, um, in an immediate or a early fasciotomy, the revascularization takes place and most of the patients become improved. So in most cases, they have come out right. Now, what are risk factors other than these things in a vascular repair? Already there is a risk. Thing, so they also go for compartment. That is why most of the vascular revascularization procedures combine with fasciotomy. As I said, males are more common. More in open and closed fractures do not make any difference. As a, as a puncture wound or a grade two wound is not going to dec decompress the compartment. So the incidence is same, at least the literature. Things like burns and blunt injury abdomen, they also, even a snake bite, they're all known to cause. One of the a prolonged surgical position, particularly the thotomy position, also can cause. And uh, in a, a excessive exercise by athletes, can cause acute. When they are prolonged, it will be chronic. That's different. But even in an acute the tip, a sudden exercise, acute for uh, beyond the, not in a very physically active person, can by overuse in athletes also can cause compartment syndrome. These are all somewhat related to trauma, but even non-traumatic conditions like nephrotic syndrome, viral myositis, hypothyroidism, this all probably increases the edema and the compartment pressure. Bleeding disorders probably because the compartment is having fluid and pressure goes up. Malignancies and diabetes, all this also can cause compartment syndrome. There is a condition called DMI, diabetes associated muscle infarction, which is, which is a result of the compartment syndrome. There are case reports of a popliteal cyst or a baker's cyst rupturing and going into the compartment causing increased pressure. Now, how do you diagnose it? The, most of the compartment syndrome has to be diagnosed clinically. It has to be diagnosed clinically. One should not miss it. What happens is that two things are important. One is the complete knowledge of what to look for and how many times have you done it. So both practice and knowledge is important. If you don't have that, you may miss it. And once you miss it, both you and the patient can pay a heavy price. So how do you do that? One is a proper clinical examination. A compartment pressure management measurement is not mandatory for diagnosis. So there are different indications are there, but for diagnosing, particularly in our setting, you need a good clinical examination. And it's preferable that you see the patient and you see the patient serially. 
say it every one hour, two hours, whatever be. You should say it serially because you can pick up the change. If you say one day, I say another after another one hour, it may not be safe. So that is important. Serial clinical examination, and sometimes even after that, if you're still not able to decide whether the compartment, the neck fasciotomy, don't feel bad to call a colleague. A senior colleague would have seen more cases. Definitely, it will be helpful. Um, and again, I repeat, the most important prognostic factor is early diagnosis, and not that will result in early treatment. Five P's are routinely asked sometimes in the examination by us, all of us also. But do not use five P's for diagnosis. They are good. They are important clinical findings, but they are not for diagnosis. Why? It may not be present in every case. And if you are going to see a compartment where there is no pulse, you already missed the bus. It is too late. In a normal one, acute one, if you find there is no pulse, it's probably arterial injury. Then what is the most important thing? The first important thing is pain out of proportion. That is where your experience comes in. Let it be a fastos fracture tibia or a fracture fora. All these years, after a few years, you should know how much painful they are. Even with the different patients, there is an average pain. A senior man, my professor looks at it, he will immediately say, Dr. Tereja will say, without you, anywhere, he said this patient is more in pain. That will give you one first doubt. Then what do you do? The Probably the clinical sign, which is most commonly used and quite reliable, is a stretch sign, which, are the, 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 which was um, mentioned by Griffith. So it goes by the yes, Griffith sign. It is nothing but stretch pain. What do you stretch? You stretch the muscles. There, there is a pain at rest also, one thing for you. And when you stretch the fingers in a forearm or toes in, in the feet, in a leg or a uh, forearm compartment, patient has severe pain. But again, there is a catch. The patient is already anesthetized, or patient has regenerative here, or he is in a coma, or he is already past that stage, he has gone to the late stages, then he won't have a pain. So it is only for early diagnosis. And what do you look for? Okay, you are look for the fish, uh, compartment, there's a stretch sign. Then you look for there is any nerve problem. Even that is a lay, early, uh, what do you call, late stage, but at least you can look for it. And the first is a paresthesia. The first sign of nerve ischemia is a paresthesia. Then there will be hyposthesia, anesthesia, paralysis, and paralysis. Paralysis is a two stage. And when you do a sensory one, you are looking for hyposthesia, you should do by pinpricking test, light touch, and two point discrimination in the patient is having. And motor deficit can be due to also pain, not only paralysis, so you should be careful about it. Compared, complete paralysis is found in late stage of compartment and indicates irreversible damage to the nerve or maybe the muscle. Now coming to pulselessness, it's a late finding. An acute compartment syndrome, how much ever pressure goes up, it can only block the capillary area. It cannot block the arterial pressure. So. If you get that, then probably it's a very, very late stage, or it is probably a diet arterial injury. And don't look at the capillary refill and the blanching of the fingers. That is not a reliable sign at all. So uh, other than this, the other things which are important is the massive swelling of the leg and the firm compartment. These two are not very reliable, but at least it can make you suspicious. In an unconscious patient, there comes the problem. None of this can help you. So you have that stage, patient is in coma, then you have to measure the compartment syndrome. Here comes the compartment, sorry, you have to measure the compartment pressure. Here comes the compartment pressure. How do you do that? There are many methods. Probably if you ask me what is the ideal, I will say this, but I have not used it. I have only seen it abroad. I have not used it. I have seen only by the white size technique locally in this thing. But um, today there are many methods, but before that, what is the importance of compartment uh, pressure? It's in a patient who is fully awake, it's really controversial whether you need it or not. Now, the normal compartment pressure in an adult is around eight millimeters of mercury. You can remember as 10, if it remember. The resting compartment pressure is about 10, and in children it is double 20. So 10 in adults, 20 in children, you can remember like that, but actually it's eight. Now, how do you measure? There are many methods. You have the striker. Uh, these are all where you can digitally read. When you put this, you have a, if you go into YouTube, you can see videos of how it is done. 
you can put it into the compartment you can measure the anterior compartment you can measure the lateral compartment you can measure the deep posterior compartment every compartment measure the answer, the reading will come in that for example if it is a comes a zero zero at the new start when it goes in in a normal it may come as 10 and uh, the, the the needles also straight needles are not advisable the side port needle i'm not going into all this thing but what we can do is this the yeah, white side technique in fact the one of the thesis of my postgraduate i think almost 30 years back was a uh, measurement serial measurement of intercompartment pressure using white side technique for tbl navy before uh, uh, surgery pre op during surgery after like that so it's a very much possible technique but is it really equivalent to uh, let me say a striker instrumented one okay we'll that and go back there's a study by budi and uh, wangparat they have compared all the three that is a striker um, intercompartment pressure a white side technique and probably a better one called arterial line manometer you can put an cat line to the artery and measure and he found that the most um, accurate is the arterial manometer striker is pretty accurate that is uh, he say he uh, just is as good as that is he is adequate but the white side he says it lacks the precision for clinical use i don't know about it but that's the if you want to go by publication that is the answer now okay normal pressure is 10 now what is the importance if you see some literature they say the compartment pressure is more than 30 then it is not good the ideal is probably a measuring the diastolic uh, pressure and for the bp apparatus and reducing the compartment pressure this is called delta pressure so delta pressure is the difference between diastolic blood pressure and a pressure of a compartment syndrome let me say mine is um, uh, 80 diastolic my uh, compartment pressure is 10 then my delta pressure is 70 a delta pressure less than 30 is suggestive of compartment syndrome so if you want to remember like this compartment pressure more than 30 or delta pressure less than 30 is important. So again, clinical correlation. It isn't compartment pressure, whatever it is, if you don't have a clinical correlation, that alone is not correct. Now coming to the other methods. Today, better things are available. So literature, I have not seen any of this. One is where it's called a near infrared spectroscopy. Here, they are not looking at the pressure. They are looking at the biochemical change. If there is a reduced oxidation, there is anabolic anaerobic metabol metabolism. Your pH will, ask, uh, will go down, will change. So change in pH or change in the hemoglobin. So the infrared spectroscopy looks at oxyhemoglobin versus deoxyhemoglobin. They are looking at poor oxygenation. The big, most important thing of this is that this is a continuous one. The uh, NARS you can continuously do, meaning that you can probably monitor it for a period to see what is happening, patient is recovering or how bad is it. Intracompartmental, intramuscular pH monitoring is completely simple. All you have to take is a blood collection from the compartment, from the muscle, and looking for a pH. And according to this was reported by Elliot. And uh, what his publication says is that this is much more reliable than compartment pressure. He found out that compartment pressure sensitivity is only about 30% or less, whereas he found that this is more than 80% reliable for diagnosis. If that is so, probably that, that, that is something where you can probably take it as a surgical indication. I have really no more knowledge about it. Even in the literature, I did not find anything. So what we have, we have, for example, when I was a postgraduate, if I have a doubt, I'll tell my chief, he will say, okay, this is compartment, go to fasciotomy. And once you decide that, it should be done as early as possible because every uh, minute makes a difference in the revascularization. So, but it has to be a good surgical technique, done early, done properly. So, one about the fasciotomy is as early as possible. Till the time you are able to get the theater, to arrange everything, keep the leg elevated, to increase the venous return and to decrease the swelling. Remove all tight dressings, everything, plaster everything, and keep, of, of course, blood all across matched and ready. Now, there are various techniques of fasciotomy. I am not going to go into detail. One, it will be given in the book. You can read it. But you must understand that there are three different techniques. One is a single incision technique. One is a two incision technique. Single incision technique, 
can be a single incision technique with fibrillectomy. Second is without fibrillectomy. Two incision is one for the anterior compartment, one for the posterior compartment. So one incision for both anterior and lateral compartment, one for the posterior, uh, one posterior mid incision for the two posterior compartments. Now a word about fibrillectomy. It was a uh, what do you call? I think when we were postgraduates, this the time this came up. It was quite popular at that time, but today it is replaced by a two incision fasciotomy. Today the commonest what is used is a two incision technique, and um, I, I do not know how often the other thing, other two are done. So you should know a little bit about two incisions. The first incision is for the anterolateral. If you are done a compartment pressure, you are correlating to that, you determine whichever the compartment pressure is much higher. And suppose one is normal, you can probably decide on that if you are able to do an intra compartment, intra operative measurement also. So, anterolateral incision is made first. Let's go into a picture. So, that is the um, medial saprinous border of the tibia, you have the anterior compartment, this is uh, lateral compartment of the peroneae. So you make an incision midway between the tibia and the fibula. So you can release this and go parallel release here. And posteriorly, it is the posterior medial one. And as you say, in both these things, of course, you have to be careful because the peroneal, deep peroneal nerve is in trouble here and peroneal artery is in trouble here. So you have to be careful, but these chances are more in a single incision. So it is possible to decompress all the four compartments through a two incision technique. Let's go back. Um, so in the, where does the incision start? It is the uh, starts between about five centimeter distal to fibula head and extends to five centimeter um, proximal to lateral malleolus. And uh, all the compartments should be, the forearm and the leg is different in, uh, in uh, Forearm, each muscles are not independent. Here, each muscles are independent. So all the muscles and all the sheath of the muscles should also be decompressed. And be careful about the superficial peroneal nerve. Two incision technique, the viability of the muscle. OK, it shall be the technique. When you do that, may see if the muscles are viable. If they are viable, fine. If they are not viable, excise them. Because the whole problem of the workman's is the contracture is the fibrosis of the dead muscle, which causes the deformity. So it is better to excise the dead muscle so that better, less, later you can do any kind of uh, tendon transplant or whatever kind of reconstruction can be done. How do you test them? You pinch the muscle with a thumb forceps, or if you want to have a stimulator, fine. And color of the thing, color a, a pink or red color muscle and contraction on stimulus indicates muscle is viable. And all non-viable muscles should be excised. Sedan described it long back as calling a sudden secretectomy, but we are not talking about uh, um, diagnosing of already ischemia. This is supposed to be in the early stage. And during the procedure, all exposed tendons, periosteum, muscles, nerves should be kept moist. Second is the posterior medial incision, which is made uh, uh, between the posterior medial, uh, uh, medial border of the tibia. And this can release both superficial and uh, deep compartments and should release it adequately, the particular posterior compartment, because that's a much bigger compartment. And uh, don't damage the saphenous nerve and the vein as much as possible. But the, here, this is the superficial uh, compartment, and you go in between and decompress that. Now, one incision with fibula, without fibrillectomy, it is the publication shows successful in ex experienced hands, but it is not very popular to my knowledge. Our um, uh, Dr. Maheshwari from our country, he has reported excellent outcome in 58 legs, which had single incision fasciotomy. So here, here a longitudinal incision made from the fibula from almost distal end to the proximal end. So what matters is surgical technique. Once you have managed, mastered the technique, I'm sure any other method, you can get an excellent result. Now, um, OK. OK, then. Um, but in the one single approach, as a one incision approach, you can do the anterior, lateral, superficial, posterior compartments are done first. Then you go to the deep posterior compartments. And uh, you must ex ex incise the lateral endomuscular septum. 
at this fibula insertion. Now, compartment can occur in the forearm, it can occur in the foot, it can, this is a compartment in the foot, it can occur in the thigh. I'm not going to that because each one will take at least 15, 20 minutes more. So I, but the principle applies to all the compartments. I'm not even going into a woke man ischemic contracture. I'm purely limiting myself to a compartment syndrome. And because I want to devote more time to it because this is a problem that you should not miss. After doing the fasciotomy, does it really end their story? No. Fasciotomy wound does give problem for expert Today, we have the um, negative pressure wound therapy, which is definitely better that we didn't have it in our student days. Definitely better, gives a better result. Wounds definitely heal better. There's no doubt about it. The, here, a, a vacuum is applied in a subatmospheric pressure. So this will reduce the, um, with a porous foam dressing, it reduces the extra vascular pressure and it um, reduces the edema. So you can improve circulation and granulation is better and also makes make the area of uh, grafting lesser. It also reduces the inf infection, but there is a higher chance of skin grafting. The other one is the shoelace type wound closure where gradually you can tighten up. That also sometimes you can avoid a uh, skin grafting, but at least it will be less. So I, this is the old method. The suction, uh, negative suction wound therapy is a better method. And the last thing, what happened? Sorry. Is this one important, particularly for all of you, the postgraduates who are listening to it? What about the medical legal practice aspect? Why have I put it up? This is a publication by uh, Bhattacharya and Rahas from our country. They looked at claims medically legally regarding compartment syndrome with the 23 year old period. And the data showed greater than 50% went against doctors, went against us. And, and most likely, they all would have come late. It would have not been our fault, but it went against us. Another publication by Shadgan, he showed that out of 30, uh, 35 out of 64 uh, legally completed cases ruled in favor of the patient are against us. So unfortunately, this one where no problem of ours, it may go against us. Why? What happens is that there is a high incidence of delay union, non-union, along with the uh, compartment syndrome. That is, you have managed compartment syndrome, the fracture may not unite. And there's 55% non-union in acute compartment syndrome versus 17.8 in a study, in a meta-analysis. So when you think of this, even if you are diagnosed early, inform the patients about all the possible complications and increased chance of assailing complications so that you will not be in trouble. So that's why I added these two slides. So to conclude, an acute compartment syndrome of forearm, which I didn't touch at all, has multiple etiologies. But a forearm or the leg, they all result. Why I added forearm is the claw deformity, hand function problem is a bigger problem. So all this will have a contracture, neurological deficit, if it is not treated properly. And the, the disability can be a very major deform disability if it is going to be very, very late. Beware of a patient within 35 years of age, because that is where the compartment syndrome is more. It's a good monitoring and um, uh, the incision, I don't talk about it. So all of you for your exams, wish you good luck because this is my last talk. So all the best to all of you. Thank you, sir, Dr. Ganeja. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Raj Gopala. Excellent and exhaustive lecture. Sorry. And now the, the this session is open for discussion. <clears throat> if uh, any anyone has got any any question, uh, <clears throat> can I uh, Anil there? Anil there? Yes, I'm there. Okay, Anil is not there. There, uh, there, I'm there. Uh, Ashok uh, uh, Banskota is there. Ashok, I have a um, little one point to make. You showed me some cases <clears throat> who had undergone many surgeries, and there was a big question whether we should leave them as such or do an amputation and uh, make them mobile as early as possible. Where you see that uh, mine is also the same experience. And over the, when I was young, you know, we are trying to save their limbs, which was all a futile exercise. 
And then, you know, Professor Mukhopadhyaya, and we had one lecture by him, uh, amputation versus salvaging a limb. And he talked that, you see, in a country like us, where the people are very poor, and you see the amount of money they have spent, you see, it is not worth trying to save these limbs because you're never sure of the success of your operation. And therefore, he said it is much better to do an amputation, get them a good artificial limb fitting, and they will be ambulatory and they'll be start earning for their destiny. You agree with me, Ashok? You have to mm -hmm. unmute. Unmute. Please unmute. I think you are muted. Yes, yes I, I agree with you. There are some si situations where it's very difficult to decide how to proceed. You know, the treatment uh, is uncertain about the result and then uh, the challenges of uh, multiple procedures and all the ensuing factors that are related to the socioeconomics, finances are so unpredictable. So I think that's a very... Uh, important good point. Thank you. Uh, Anil, I have one or two uh, yeah. queries to you, Anil. Yes, Anil, you said that uh, the MRI studies say that 35% uh, get healed by eight months' time and 90% get healed by 18 months of ATT given to this patient. You also said that uh, the 52% patient who get healed in MRI and when you do the PET scan, you find that uh, majority of them have shown a good healing. So uh, under the circumstances, I feel if uh, in the MRI, it is the 18 months period where the 90% will get healed. Will it not be justified irrespective of whatever maybe they think that in these patients of the spine, you continue the ATT for 18 months? No, I think uh, this uh, as a program, uh, most of the time it is nine months. Now, it took me a while to convince them to keep it for 12 months with the rider on because, you know, this continued inflammation, continued enhancement on MRI was the reason where it was presumed that it is active. While that enhancement was because of the healing inflammation due to healing process. So, uh, because MRI is able to detect inflammation only. While PET, the presence of PET, that is why when I did PET, then I found that some of those who had just enhancement, they were actually not the active disease. And that is why um, uh, the, the demonstration of healed status with PET was better. So, if on MRI we get disappearance of abscess and fatty replacement on T1 weighted images, then I think that is good enough evidence to say that we can stop it. Thank you. Uh, Krishnud, I have a, a small uh, query to you. Uh, Krishnud, am I audible? Uh, you are muted, Krishnud, you are muted. I can hear you, sir. Right. Kushnu, the main problem comes, a lot of patients with a diabetic foot comes. Okay. Now, problem is that you see the patient has come with the one toe gangrene. Now, you want to remove that uh, gangrenous part. Then you find the gangrene has proceeded further. So, you, you, one is always in a dilemma. If at what level am I going to amputate? And uh, you see the person cannot come again and again for surgery. It's in a costly affair. And sometimes I feel that if the foot gets involved at whatever the level, or it is best thing is to do an abalone uh, amputation, give them a good PTB prosthesis, and get your sugar control, and they're much better rather than going stage by stage because you cannot just make out the line of demarcation where to do an amputation. So, what do you say? Yes, sir. Uh, actually, what you said before with the uh, in Dr. Uh, Balskota's case, that there are times uh, in our circumstances, uh, it is prudent to go for a baloney amputation rather to keep on chopping the person uh, in small bits. Uh, but uh, the main thing is that what I found out that we are not investigating the people uh, we are dealing with in a full way, because if we do the 
uh, ankle break index and we uh, check the vascularity of the limbs. It helps us uh, save quite a few limbs. Um, and uh, if you do, if in our cases, when we have problems with vascularity, we do an arteriogram. Not always, if it is, if the, if the Doppler is good, they're the good arteries. Don't do that, but in cases we do an arteriogram and uh, we have seen cases do, do great with stenting of popliteal arteries and revascularization. So it all depends. Plus, uh, another thing that um, when I talked about the short course foot, we do a uh, cast, we do not put any um, cotton underneath. We put the, the plaster directly on the, on the foot, uh, relieve the foot, and we have started using uh, bisphosphonates. And we have found out that there is a lot of uh, uh, regeneration of the bone that takes place. So it is all, we have a lot of knowledge now, but the thing is, it is how we apply that knowledge that matters. Another thing, sir, I have, uh, in, uh, everybody here uh, are experienced uh, clinicians. They learn a lot of things along uh, in their practice, which uh, is not written in the books. Like uh, when, I, when a person, when a uh, with a, with a, with a, with a foot ulcer comes to me, I take a culture, but empirically put the patient onto cefepirazone and sulbactam, two grams BD for seven days, and then one gram BD for, uh, uh, for seven days. Till that time, the, the infection starts getting less and less, and of course, the culture comes in, and then you can treat the uh, person appropriately. Another thing I have found in my practice is that using chemicals to clean the wound does not help. I do it with a normal saline and then I do um, Bectigra or Sofratul dressings, uh, which have helped. And it has to be daily dressing, not just dressing, which are not helping. And you have to see the dynamic of the wound. Thank you. A yeah. couple of uh, comments. Yes. Rajkumar, do you have any, any questions? If you would allow me. Do you have any question? Yes, sir. If there are no question, yes, Rajgopal, you can go ahead. Dr. Anil, Anil, I have a, one small doubt. You looked at the healing rate. Have you compared with the patients who had surgery? I'm not talking about the uh, implants. I'm talking about by removing the dead tissue, etc., etc. Surgery, how much has helped the healing in your study where you showed the thing? Well, all of them were operated cases, all of them were non-operated cases. Any role? Uh, yes, I understand what you wish to ask is that uh, does the operated cases make uh, a quick uh, healing? It is actually, I'm, I have started looking at that data now because I was analyzing uh, in the last uh, study. And uh, uh, probably there is no definitive, uh, there are few studies where... Uh, uh, operated and non-operative patients have taken, but there is no conclusive uh, uh, opinion as far as that is concerned. But yes, it really sounds to the logic that if we have debrided the lesion, reduced the disease load, and co-opted and, and uh, a position of the uh, the lesion has already been done with a bit of shortening, then it should it should uh, heal better. So I think, but uh, we need to have a separate data on operated and non-operated. Yeah, I do. Yeah, Thank I do you, agree. Man. I do agree because it reduces the disease load. Sir, I, I, if you would allow me, I would like to make a couple of comments. Yes, yeah. yeah, first of all, uh, excellent uh, lectures by Dr. Nangil Jain and Professor Ashok uh, Banskota and uh, Professor Raj Kopalan. Uh, it, the cases they presented uh, really humbles you it, uh, because it is amazing on how these cases have been dealt with. And I am uh, really, we, are, we should be uh, proud of these people. And uh, this should, uh, because these things are eye openers. But one question I would ask, ask Dr. Anil Jain is, uh, we have... We used to see a lot of cases of uh, 
spinal tuberculosis in the 90s. But I have not, in my clinical practice over the last 20 years, seen a single case of spinal tuberculosis. Is the same thing happening in India? Uh, no, I think, uh, well, we do get a little more than others. That is definitely because we get a lot of referral for that. But still, these patients are there in good number in most of the government setups. So we just can't say that uh, uh, they have reduced. But yes, they are definitely there in good number. But, but at the same time, uh, because we are referral centers, and uh, so probably we get a little more than others. But many of them, they are not being referred. So it means there is a good number. Thank you. Uh, this is true, Anil, that uh, the number of spinal tuberculosis that we used to get earlier is much, much, much less. And even in my practice now, I sometimes see the patient otherwise quite some time they may not. And probably so, probable reason is that probably now we are diagnosing them early. Okay, we yeah. are being diagnosed uh, early in periphery because the moment uh, someone has a persistent pain and they just get an MRI and the lesion is fixed. Right. Thank you, everybody, and especially all my the co-chairpersons and the all the speakers for a very excellent uh, um, presentation of their work to our students. I'm quite sure that some of the students must have been disappointed that they've not been able to ask questions because of the lack of time. They can always send their questions to their uh, faculty members. We'll be too happy to reply to you by on your email. Don't get disappointed. We have a very interesting session now. It is on the pediatric orthopedics. Who else can be the best teacher for this thing? Elric, you know, every year he comes to my course, an excellent teacher. And now I have picked up another very good teacher in Dr. Fadel from Egypt, who is also uh, into a lot of pediatric uh, listening. So I think I'll start and hand over the mic to Elric to start his uh, lectures. Elric, you're welcome. Thank you so much, sir, for that very kind introduction. Yes. And you're absolutely right. I have been... Uh, part of this uh, course since the last, I think, 12 or 13 years. And it's so nice to see you again. And no, no. a lot of my seniors and teachers here, I can see Professor Banskota, Dr. Raj Gopal, uh, Dr. Fadel. Uh, thank you so much for being here and uh, nice to see you all, all again. So for pediatric today, uh, we're going to cover three topics. Uh, the first one is going to be on DDH, which I'll begin. And then I think Dr. Fadel will speak about clubfoot. And then we'll talk about some other common pediatric conditions. And I think it's important to uh, have a good understanding of pediatric orthopedic uh, conditions because many of the short cases in the MS and even your DNB exam are uh, pediatric cases. And unfortunately, during our training, we're not exposed to much pediatric work. Sometimes we see a little bit of clubfoot, but not much of cerebral palsy or palsy disease or DDH. So I'll cover some very basic overviews of these important conditions. And I'll begin by sharing my presentation on uh, DDH. So I just want to confirm that, uh, is the slide seen well? The yeah, first slide yeah, says I don't DDH. See, see, okay, see thank well. you, sir. And you all can hear me clearly, isn't it? Seen well. So I'm going to turn off my video so that I can save some bandwidth. Okay. So, uh, hi everyone. I'm uh, Alaric Arujas. I'm a pediatric orthopedic surgeon from Gilavati Hospital, Hinduja Hospital and Bai Jarbe Hospital for Children in Mumbai. And my field of interest uh, for many years now has been entirely pediatric orthopedic. So today we'll cover a little bit about DDH. So the first thing to understand, like any other congenital condition, even like clubfoot, which Dr. Fadel will speak to you about, uh, you know, there's not one definite entity. It's a spectrum of condition. And similarly, in uh, DDH, it's not just one entity, which is uh, hip dislocation, but there's a complete spectrum of conditions ranging from just mild acetabular dysplasia on one side of the spectrum to a subluxated hip to a complete dislocation on the other side. And while it is okay to miss those mild cases of dysplasia, what we should definitely not miss is a complete hip dislocation because that can lead a lot of morbidity and problems for the child, especially as they grow older. 
So the definition of DDH would be that it's a spectrum of intracapsular displacement of the femoral head from its normal relationship in the acetabulum. And this can occur any time before, during, or soon after birth. Therefore, it can be prenatal, perinatal, or postnatal. If you look at the epidemiology of DDH, it's very similar to other congenital conditions like club foot or cleft tip and cleft palate. Anything which is polygenic and multifactorial has an incidence of approximately one in thousand. So anyone asks you what is the incidence of these common congenital conditions, it's very easy when you have a polygenic multifactorial condition to say it's one in thousand. Of course, we understand that this varies a lot in races and cultures, and there are multiple factors responsible for this variability. We know in India, it's, it's not uncommon. In some cultures, it is extremely common. For example, in Eskimos or in children who are swaddled a lot, uh, the incidence can go to as high as 10 per thousand live births. Uh, and of course, on the other side, in Chinese population, you see that the incidence is much less. So in different countries and different cultures, the incidence will vary, but roughly it's about one in thousand. You know that there is a definite genetic etiology to it, because if the, if the mother has a DDH or one of the family members has DDH, there's a 12 times higher risk of the child having DDH. We know that when there are other mechanical factors also, like breach or multiple births or oligohydramnios, there's a higher chance of getting DDH because it's a positioning problem. Within the, within the mother's womb. So I want us all to understand that when we talk of DDH, very often we think of just a hip dislocation, when the hip is completely dislocated off its socket. And that incidence, as we said, is one in 1,000 or 0.1%. But if you actually examine children when they are born, so neonates at birth, you'll find that the incidence of what we call hip instability is quite high. In fact, almost one in 100 children will have a hip instability. And if you do an ultrasound of the hip of these neonates, you'll find that the incidence of acetabular dysplasia is even higher. So it's almost 5 to 15%. That means out of every 100 children you assess, almost uh, one of them will have a hip instability, and about 10 of them will have uh, acetabular dysplasia, which is only picked up on an ultrasound. But the good news is that uh, something which has been shown by Barlow uh, in almost uh, you know, 1960s, which said that more than 80% of these mild cases will resolve spontaneously in the first four to six weeks of the child's life. So what we should be really worried about are those 10, 20% of children whose hip instability does not resolve and therefore presents with a late dislocation. So this is again what I said, that this is Barlow's work done in 1960s, which showed that hip instability is present in about one in 1,000 children. 60% of those will resolve within the first two weeks without any intervention at all whereas 90% of them resolve within the four, first four to six weeks. So therefore, picking up a, a, an instability at birth is not something you should be really worried about, but picking it up after six weeks of age is something definitely which is to, to be alert about. What are the important risk factors for DDH? And I know many of you have read from different articles that oligohydramnia, torticollis, foot deformities are all associated with DDH, but that are not really risk factors. If you look at the literature in the last 10 years, I think it's become very clear that there are three or four important risk factors. The most important risk factor is a breach presentation. And it's not just breach delivery, it's a breach presentation. So any child who is in a breach position, anytime after the uh, 30th week of uh, gestation is a child who's at risk for DDH. That's the single most risk factor for DDH with a risk as, as high as 27%. And you know that therefore a frank breach in a girl child has the highest risk. The second most important risk factor is the positive family history in a first degree relative, which means either the mother or an aunt or a cousin having a, a positive family history. There's a 12 times higher risk of DDH than if you didn't have a positive family history. And the third most important factor that we are getting to recognize more and more nowadays, of course, some cultures recognize this many years ago, but in countries like ours where swaddling is a traditional practice, if you swaddle a child in an unsafe manner with the hips in extension and adduction, that's the third most important risk factor for DDH. So therefore, I want you to remember that these are the three most important factors, breach, a positive family history, and unsafe hip swaddling. So what do you mean a little bit about this unsafe hip, hip swaddling? It's important for us to understand because it is so ingrained in our culture, and even in the Middle East, and even in Oriental condition, uh, cultures, um, you know, children have always been bundled into these tight cloths for a variety of reasons. And while it has been shown that swaddling, in fact, can be beneficial to the neonate because it allows them to sleep better, it allows thermoregulation, it allows a lot of other positive factors. But if you swaddle the child with the hips tied in extension and adduction, as you can see on the first figure on the left, 
then that is a very high risk factor for DDH. Because the more you leave the hips in abduction, flexion, and external rotation within the swaddle, those hips are at low risk for DDH. So therefore, I think it's important that we have a training program, not just for uh, doctors, but also for nurses and parents to tell them that while swaddling is good, Swaddling in the safe manner is very essential. And in fact, we did a study in our own hospital. Vardia Children's Hospital is one of the premier pediatric and maternity hospitals in, in, in Mumbai. And when we surveyed our own pediatricians, uh, ranging in cadre, right from residents to the senior consultants, we found that only one third of the pediatricians themselves were aware of the risk of swaddling uh, as a cause for DDH. And therefore, that uh, awareness among doctors, nurses, and parents is extremely important to, cre to create that while swaddling is good, we must swaddle them in the hip safe manner. So coming now to the diagnosis of DDH, and many of you are aware of all these different clinical tests that have been used, and we must understand what these tests are, because as orthopedic surgeons, we are called upon often by the pediatrician or neonatologist to examine the child in the ICU or in the well baby clinic for the presence of DDH. And once you have those risk factors, especially as we said, a breach delivery in a girl child with a family history or a history of unsafe swaddling, then you must be able to elicit all these different tests. And we'll go through each of these tests in a little bit of detail. So the first test is what we call the Barlow test. And the Barlow test was described by Barlow in 1960, which is basically a provocative test. It helps to diagnose a dislocatable or an unstable hip. So we said one in 100 children will have an unstable hip. And therefore, one in 100 children will have a Barlow positive test. If you do it in the first four to six weeks of the child's life, it is not abnormal. If you see a Barlow positive after six weeks of age, then that's an abnormal finding. So how do you perform the Barlow test? Here you see that you have to flex the hips and knees 90 degrees, apply gentle posterior pressure, and try and actually push the femoral head out of the acetabulum. The Ortolani maneuver is in fact the opposite. Ortolani, for out of interest, is a pediatrician who was, in fact, the sign was brought to his notice by one of his patient's mother, who said that every time she tried to change the child's nappies, there was a clicking or a clunking sound from, from within the hip. And then Ortolani did a few tests and found out that, yes, this is a test of uh, dislocatability of the hip, and he gave it his own name. So that's about the Ortolani test. So the Ortolani test is far more important than the Barlow test because it demonstrates a dislocated hip. Again, the principles are the same. You stabilize the pelvis with one hand, and then you slightly abduct and try to actually lift the femoral head into the acetabulum. And as Ortolani originally described it, it's not, a, it's not a sound, so it's not a click, but you should actually have a sensation of something entering into the acetabulum. So in, in fact, in Italian, we call it tenio del scatto, which is a clunking sound, which is actually felt, but not heard. So if this video plays, you can see that that's how the test is being done. So you can see that it's a seamless test. Watch what all I'm doing here. So I'm not checking both the hips together. The first thing is that the child is absolutely quiet and relaxed because if you have a child who's crying, you can't do this test. One hand is stabilizing the pelvis. I see very often in, in clinical pictures, even in textbooks, people examining both hips together. That is absolutely incorrect. One hand is stabilizing the pelvis. And now you can see that I'm doing both the maneuvers together. It's a seamless procedure. So I push out, that's Barlow. I lift and push in, that's the Ortolani test. So they both go side by side. So you can see it again, Barlow, Ortolani. Barlow, Ortolani. So every time you push the hip out and you get the plunking sensation, you can feel that movement of the head actually moving over the acetabulum. That's the Barlow test. And every time you abduct the hip and lift the femoral head in and you get the clunking sound, that's the Ortolani test. So I think we must be confident to do these tests. The prerequisite is what I've already explained to you, how the test should be done. The next important sign, uh, especially as a child grows older, so you must remember that the Ortolani and Barlow tests are only positive in the first three months of the child's life. As the child grows older and the muscles around the hip tighten up, the Ortolani and Barlow signs become negative. So these are signs to be used only in a neonate. And often I've seen some uh, uh, residents uh, present a case of DDH in an older child, like a one-year-old, and they say that the Barlow and Ortolani test is positive. That cannot be true at all, because it can only be positive in the first three to maximum four months of the child's life. As the child grows older, these other tests become more important. The first sign, as you can see, is called the Alice or the Galeazzi sign, where again you flex the hip and the knee 90 degrees, and you can see that the difference in the level of the knees. So this indicates that the 
uh, several head on the right side is dislocated, and therefore the limb is short, and therefore there's a difference in the height of the knees on the two sides. Another very important test, which becomes very useful in a child who's older than three months of age, is restricted abduction, especially unilateral. If it's bilateral, it's not so sensitive a test, but a unilateral restriction of hip abduction. Remember that in neonates, when you flex and abduct the hip by 90 degrees, you should be able to abduct the hips to 90 because the hips are so flexible in, in neonates. So if you have anything less than 90 degrees, so anything which is like 60 degrees or so, and especially if there is an asymmetry between the two sides, one side, as you can see, the right side, the hip is abducting fully to 90 degrees. On the other side, it's only abducting to 60. And you can see there's a tightness of the adductor longest tendon there. This is a very sensitive sign of DDH especially in a child who's older than three months. So in a child less than three months, Ortolani and Barlow tests are sensitive. Once you cross three months, then the Galliazzi sign and restricted hip abduction are very important tests for diagnosis of DDH. Of course, unfortunately, in our country, we often have children who come to us after the walking age, and there any limp in a child, the first diagnosis should always be a DDH. So if you have a child who comes to you with a limp, especially with a short limb gait, then DDH is one of the first, first and most important diagnosis to make in that age group. Once you have a clinical diagnosis of DDH, the next step is various imaging modalities. And I still frequently see patients refer to me, children who are three months and four months of age who have had an X-ray done. And remember that X-ray is a very bad test to do in a very young baby. We know that almost all the bones in the proximal femur are cartilaginous at that age. It's an unnecessary radiation because it's very difficult to diagnose DDH in a, three, in a two month or a three month old child with an X-ray. The earliest age that an x-ray can be done should be around four months of age. Ideally, it should be six months. But if you are living in a, in a situation where you don't have access to good uh, musculoskeletal hip ultrasound, especially in young babies, then there's no harm in getting x-ray done, but not at birth, but only after the age of four months or ideally at the age of six months. So the test that's really useful in a young child is an ultrasound. And we'll show you a little bit about the ultrasound. So there are two different methods of how you can do the ultrasound. There's the static method and you have the dynamic method. So the static method has been devised by graph and it's called graph static method. Or you also have the dynamic method. The graph method is the standard thing that has been described uh, in 1980. And what you can see here in the graph method is that uh, it's like a, a, a marble on a spoon. So this is the ileum. This is the acetabulum. That's the triradiate cartilage. And you can see in a normal hip, the femoral head is well centered within the acetabulum. So it's like a marble on a spoon. And at least half of the femoral head should lie within the acetabulum. And then you can draw, of course, these two angles, which are called the alpha and the beta angle. The alpha angle is basically the bony angle of the acetabulum, and the beta angle is basically the cartilaginous angle of the, uh, of the labrum. And based on these two angles, you can classify graph into four broad categories, out of which three and four are definitely pathological. And you can further divide this into, into A, B, and therefore, you have 12 subtypes of the, of the graph classification. I don't think we should be going to too much of detail about that. Suffice to say that if the febrile head is not lying within the acetabulum, like a ball on the spoon, then you know that their hip is dislocated. And there are the various views that you can use. Here you can see that under the ultrasound, we are performing a dynamic bar load test, actually pushing the hip out. And you can see that under stress, the femoral head is now moving out of the acetabulum. You can see that almost half the head is now lying outside the acetabulum. So while doing the, the, the graph technique, you can also apply dynamic stress. And this is what is the Harkey technique about. And nowadays, good sonologists are doing a combination of both. They do the static measure first, measure the different angles, the alpha and the beta angle, and then also to do the dynamic test of doing the Barlow uh, and an ultrasound under the Barlow test. And that's the Harkey's method of diagnosis. So this is still a little bit controversial. You know, do we use ultrasound screening as a routine? In fact, in most European countries, especially in the German speaking world, as Austria, Germany, Switzerland, uh, every child undergoes uh, ultrasound as a universal uh, imaging tool at birth. And there are plus and minus points to that. The problem with that, if you do too much of ultrasound, you tend, it's a very sensitive test you might over-treat children who have mild levels of instability, and we know that treatment by itself is not benign for DDH. It can cause AV and other problems. So most of us in the, in the developed and developing world use what we call selective screening. That means we use universal clinical screening. Every child should undergo a Barlow, Ortolani, 
Galia Z and abduction restriction test, but only the ones who are at risk or who show a positive clinical examination should undergo an ultrasound. So that's the protocol we follow in most countries of the world to do what is called risk screening, which is performed after the age of four to six weeks. So here are some guidelines which have been developed by the American Academy of Pediatrics. And I know it looks like a little busy slide, but it's very simple to understand that if the, the key for the DDH diagnosis is based on physical examination of each and every newborn. So you don't selectively examine newborns. Every newborn who's born at the delivery point or within the first six or eight weeks of life should have a hip examination every time the child comes to the pediatrician. And now what we are, we are advising pediatricians to do is that every time the child comes for an immunization visit, you know that according to the universal immunization program in India, the, the vaccines are given at birth at four, uh, sorry, at uh, six, 10, and 14 weeks, at six months, nine months, and 12 months. So what we're telling pediatricians now, every time the child comes for a vaccine visit, don't forget to examine the hips because that should be a universal practice among all pediatricians. If you get a positive uh, clinical test, that means a Barlow positive, or sorry, an Ortlandi positive, or a Barlow positive after six weeks of age, you should refer the child to the orthopedic surgeon right away because this child needs treatment. A dislocated hip should be treated right away at birth with a public harness. But if it's dislocatable only, you can afford to wait for some time and then assess the child again at two weeks. If the physical examination tests are negative, but risk factors are positive, and we said breach, family history, and unsafe hip swaddling, you should get an ultrasound done at six weeks of age. So don't do an ultrasound before six weeks because we know that any ultrasound done before six weeks will pick up the mild degrees of hip instability, which again, do not need to be treated. So the ideal time to perform a hip ultrasound is after six weeks of age. And these are the various guidelines for those of you who are interested. These are the um, two um, literature um, articles that I would recommend. One is the AOS guidelines published in 2014. And one are the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics guidelines, one published in 2000, and another one published updated guidelines in 2016, for those of you interested in reading this further. The next investigation, as we said, is the x-ray. But as I've shown you from this slide, it is very difficult to interpret an x-ray in, an, in, in a young child because most of the things are cartilaginous here. Most of it are unossified. So therefore, we use various other landmarks. And you can see here what we draw are certain lines to estimate where the femoral head is. So we draw the first horizontal line going through the triurated cartilage, which is called the Hilgenbrenner's line, and a vertical line going on the lateral border of the acetabulum, perpendicular to the, to the Hilgenbrenner's line, which is called the Perkins line. And normally the medial epiphysis of the femur, not the femoral head, because you don't see a femoral head in a young child less than six months. The medial metaphysis of the femur, where does it lie? It normally should lie in the lower inner quadrant. If it lies anywhere else, then it's a diagnosis of DDH. So here you can see that the medial, epiphysis, medial metaphysis is lying in the upper outer quadrant. So that's a definite diagnosis of DDH. In addition, you know that we can draw this curved line, which is called the sentence line. And if it's broken, you can see that's a diagnosis of DDH. And you can measure the acetabular index, which most children with DDH will have acetabular dysplasia, and therefore the index will be high. So these are a surrogate ways of how to diagnose DDH in a child who is younger than six months when most of the proximal femurs are ossified. Coming to the last part of this talk will be about a little bit about the treatment. And we know that uh, in infancy, most of these hips are reducible at birth. And all that we need to do is to position the hips in the right, in the right uh, plane. If you put those hips in flexion and abduction, most of these hips will self-reduce. And therefore, you have these various devices called the public harness, the Frika pillow, or the Von Rosen splint which helps you to retain the hip in a flexion abduction position. So this is the, if you have a child who's less than six months of age and you made a diagnosis of DDH clinically and on ultrasound, then you put the child into this flexion abduction orthosis and just the positioning itself will help to reduce the hip. And as you're all aware, there's a fixed weaning schedule. Normally we need to keep the child in the harness for at least six to eight weeks and then gradually wean the harness off for a few hours every day uh, for the next two or three months. So totally the child will need to be in a harness for at least four to six months, uh, two months of full-time wear and two to three months of weaning. Once the child crosses six months of age and they start then walking by one to one and a half years, 
uh, it becomes very difficult to reduce the hip spontaneously. Most of these hips then develop fixed contractures, and most of the time will then need a closed reduction under general anesthesia combined with an adductor tenotomy, followed by a hip spica cast for three to four months. So here, as you can see, is a child who has a left-sided DDH. You can see all the signs of hip dislocation. You can see that it's lying in the upper outer quadrant. The Shenton's line is broken. The acetabular index is steep. And after you've done a reduction, you know that you think that the head is in, but it's impossible to be sure. And therefore, every time you do a closed reduction, you must do an arthrogram because only from the arthrogram, you can outline the non-ossified femoral head and you can confirm that there is a narrow uh, medial dipole, which is less than seven millimeters. There's a nice rose thorn sign, which indicates that therefore that there is uh, a very sharp acetabular labrum. And this is a good contained femoral head, which you can then put into a hip spike up. So if you do a closed reduction and don't, don't do an arthrogram, then you have not confirmed that the hip is actually in. So only after you have confirmed that the head is in on an arthrogram that you give a hip spiker, and we know that it should be given in what we call the human position of Salter and not the frog leg position, which is typically, as you can see here, where you have flexion of 90 degrees, abduction of only 45 to 60 degrees, and you definitely don't keep it in the frog leg position. So here, as you can see, is the reduction technique. It's very similar to what we call the Ortolani procedure, but it's not an Ortolani technique. You can see that hip is dislocated. And then by pulling it up and in, I can reduce the hip. So it's a very, it should be done atraumatically. If it requires any force, which means that it's not done in the right way. And after you reduce the hip, you can see that the abduction is restricted because of the tight adductor longus. And we do a release of the adductor longus percutaneously before we put the child into a hip spiker. So this is a technique of closed reduction that is very similar to the Ortolani and Barlow test, but it's not the Barlow and Ortolani test. It's a closed reduction test of telescopy where we reduce the hip in flexion, abduction, and neutral rotation. After you've done the hip spica, you must confirm that the, the hip is actually reduced within the spica, and therefore you, uh, the ideal way is to do a, a, a CT scan or an MRI. Remember that x-rays are not very useful because as you can see in this x-ray, I can't see anything at all. Is the hip reduced or not? It's impossible to say. So the ideal test is to do a CT scan. And you can see in this image where this, the hips are well reduced on the CT scan, the actual cut. Here you can see that the femoral head is lying posterior to the acetabulum. So all that you need is a single uh, slice to be sure that the hip is out of the acetabulum. Finally, the last age group, when you see a child who's older than 18 months, most of these hips will not close reduce and will need an open reduction and combined with some other procedure like a virus, a virus derotation, a femoral shortening, or occasionally an acetabular procedure. So here's an example of a DDH which is untreated in a one and a half year old child. This is an MRI. Normally, I never do MRIs, but this child came with an MRI. I put it up here because what you can see on the MRI is a very nice ligamentum series. This is one of the obstacles to reduction. So you can see a huge, thick ligamentum series going right from the femoral head, right into the acetabulum. And this is one of the obstacles to reduction, which must be released when you do the open reduction. So this is different steps of the open reduction. We do a standard anterior approach. Remember that in a, in a child, we never use the posterior hip approach. So you have a standard approach to the hip by the Somerville. You open up the, the capsule, you can see the femoral head dislocated. And when you trace the ligamentum teres into the acetabulum, you can see the acetabulum is right there. And the femoral head is out here dislocated. And then you do a femoral procedure to try and reduce the femoral head. If you have a child who's older than three years, then in addition to the femoral procedure, you'll also probably need to do some sort of acetabular procedure because almost all of these children will have acetabular dysplasia as well. And the technique that we use is called a periastable osteotomy, and I'll show you some of the steps of that. So here's a child who has bilateral DDH in a three and a half year old child, and you can see how the femoral head is articulating with the pseudo acetabulum. The actual acetabulum is down here, and it's extremely steep. So here you have done what we call a one stage reconstruction, open reduction, femoral osteotomy, and an acetabular procedure. Not at the same time, but one hip done first, and then the other hip done after a certain amount of time. So this is what the child has undergone. Here are the various steps of that procedure. So this is the anterior approach. That's the sartorius that we have released. This is the iliosoas tendon, which is an important barrier to reduction. So we must do a fractional lengthening of the iliosoas. 
there you see the capsule of the femoral of the of the of the femur you open the capsule carefully and you can see the femoral head below that then you trace the ligamentum teres which takes you all the way into the acetabulum and that's where the acetabulum is then you do a femoral procedure to a separate lateral approach and then you come back again and do a capsule or capsule orophy to give a nice tight closure and then in addition what we do here is a acetabular procedure because the child has a lot of severe acetabular dysplasia so this is the approach that we use so you have the osteotome going in under cm control along the acetabular margin into the triradiate cartilage and once that is done you hinge that open and you can see how the acetabulum is now reshaped so this is called a dega osteotomy so you can see that opening up nicely and it's a very stable osteotomy it's not the salter but this is a dega osteotomy where the inner wall is intact and it's hinging on the aster on the triradiate cartilage and you can see that with the laminar spreader we have opened it up and you can see how nicely horizontal the sursal has become and then we this open uh, space we fill it up with bone graft as you can see here so we put in these bone graft here we have taken the bone graft from the femur and because it's such a stable osteotomy it stays open and you can see that how well we have corrected that femoral the acetabular uh, dysplasia by doing a dega osteotomy this is a 3 years follow up and you can see beautifully reconstructed hips that's a longer follow up 3 years and this is a child now who's 10 years old this is when she was 3 now she's at 10 and you can see both hips are extremely well relocated there's no signs of avn and these hips will last this adult a lifetime so this is the only way that a dgh can be approached remember that the diagnosis is important to make and the treatment should be based upon the age of the child going from a public harness to a closed reduction to an open reduction so thank you very much for your attention i'll stop sharing now thank you elric very very nice lecture as ever and i'm sure our students must have enjoyed your lecture we'll have any questions at the end of the session may i now request dr uh, mohammed fadel from egypt uh, to talk on his very favorite subject that is on the overall view of the club foot dr fader <clears throat> hello dear friends i will uh, try to share yes fader go ahead is it okay it is okay thank you uh uh good afternoon uh, <laughs> uh it's my pleasure uh, to talk with you uh, for the second time uh i am uh, professor mohammed fadel uh, from egypt uh, working in amina university hospital and limb reconstructive surgery a uh, program director uh, i am honored and pleased to be uh, 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 one of uh, the part of this uh, elegant uh, postgraduate course uh, and uh, uh, also to uh, ask them ask you to uh, uh, continue on and uh, happy on behalf on my uh, trainee and lrs i think that uh, we have uh, uh, not less than uh, 60 Uh, attendee at least uh, now and since yesterday and it will they will continue with you tomorrow uh, they have uh, the benefit of this uh, uh, wide scope of all these elegant uh, speakers uh, and thanks for uh, professor tanija to give me this uh, uh, opportunity and for our friends the, the, the organizing committee and the scientific committee and there's a chance to invite you all to Uh, be with us in Egypt in uh, one, the first and second September uh, this year uh, about uh, the conference of white uh, warded against infection on subedic and trauma and uh, honored and pleased also that uh, uh, professor Tanija and uh, uh, professor Ala and uh, Arenda uh, and all the committee of uh, world subedic concern agree to be a part of uh, our friends and uh, Uh, share us uh, actively in this uh, uh, conference inshallah uh, 
Uh, it's my honor to uh, give you the greetings from the uh, Egyptian Hospitalic Association, as mentioned by uh, Dr. Tanija. I heard for his uh, very nice lecture yesterday about the ancient Egypt, uh, uh, Egyptian uh, Association. <laughs> this is the logo. Yes, you are right. It is the only uh, one without the uh, the uh, bend the tree. It is uh, for the, uh, re, uh, uh, the re re reconstruction or uh, reduction of the uh, shoulder dislocation. Uh, also uh, from Elmina University, 240 kilometers uh, south to Cario uh, on the river line. Uh, I have the honor also to present for you your uh, greeting and best wishes from my friends there and my staff. Uh, this is the last memory of uh, the, la the previous one, and the only thing of Corona that we have uh, uh, gave us the chance to meet uh, away for uh, uh, this uh, uh, frequent activities. Actually, I am happy to, uh, for this only one reason of uh, uh, Corona. Uh, the topic is so difficult because it is just the foot of the uh, of the child and. Uh, it have many stories and uh, these stories i would like to have it as a journey it is not a congenital club foot just simple uh, two letters you see but it is a long story i would like to make it a story and uh, from now uh, every now and then i will stop in some stations to talk uh, 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 slowly and to explain some uh, practical notes so I will go in a hurry for some uh, areas, which is well known, by the way, because most of them are basics. And for some practical things, I would like to be slowly to some extent to give some idea. Uh, the types, according to the etiology and the theory of the particular foot and the parcel anatomy, which may be also uh, 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 the club foot assessment and the evaluation systems, the types according to the treatment stage, all these are methods uh, uh, to be uh, dealt with in this uh, uh, lecture. And the story of the conservative management uh, and the cases of neglected club foot, how to do with them. As an introduction, we can say that uh, uh, congenital club foot is one of the most common orthopedic deformity requiring the surgical corrections. Uh, actually, uh, this complex organ that is required to be stable for supporting the body weight in standing, also resilient for shock absorption, for walking and running, and mobile to accommodate various activity and also to be cosmetic in appearance. Uh, as a definition, a gross deformity of the uh, foot that give it the stunted lumpy appearance is that club foot is in a casual or unconventional way. But the definition of the uh, of the club foot is one of the most observed abnormality, where, where uh, the, the foot is twisted inward and the toes pointed down. The incidence one every one thousand. It is high incident. Also, male is more than female. Bilaterality is found and. Uh, 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 10 up to 15 percent chance for subsequent child being affected of positive family history and two up to three percent if no family history there is some notes about that the uh, congenital club foot may be isolated or associated with other serious anomalies we should put this in our minds such as bilaterality or the severity or DDH or scoliosis or such or some syndromes. The etiology uh, also is different and uh, sometimes called that it is unknown, but most infants who had club foot have no identifiable genetic or syndromal or extrinsic cause. Uh, associ association with some extrinsic causes uh, had been mentioned in some instances, genetic causes may be also mentioned, and the types of the club foot according to the etiology could be looked for as idiopathic, which have unknown etiology, and congenital taliparsequinovirus. 
uh, as an idiopathic is one item, but we have many variety as the acquired secondary to either to the central nervous system disease, such as spina bifida or polymyelitis, arthroposis, absent bones, such as uh, uh, amelia of uh, fibula hemimelia, tibia hemimelia, or post-traumatic ensemble stasis, or postural, we uh, couldn't uh, uh, miss this topic. The diagnosis uh, of the child uh, is uh, uh, sometimes in the upper and lower extremities should be expected. Also, the spine should be inspected. Also, combination of genetic and environmental give us idea to have a personal history, very good personal history and the family history to check if it is isolated or no, and look for the acquired types, which is maybe neuropathic or syndromic or acquired. This is give an idea, not too much for the management if it is conservative, such as using compulsivity or uh, uh, tapping technique, because uh, uh, some uh, uh, idiopathic, uh, some club foot need for a global idea for the patient, especially in cases of uh, neuropathic, in such cases of spina bifida and polymyelitis uh, or uh, cerebral palsy. Also the cases of syndromic, we may have a telepathic coronavirus in the case of uh, tibia hemimelia. It is not a telepathic coronavirus per se, but we should manage the patient as a tibia hemimelia associated with idiopathic left foot, not idiopathic at that time. Arthrogryposis, so also we should look for the patient from as a general to be sure because syndromics such as these cases in need not for this, but maybe for using something to uh, treat the bladder, to, to close the, uh, the, uh, uh, the iliac bones, and also here for uh, such cases of tibia hemimelia or fibula hemimelia. So uh, uh, club foot is not a simple to be uh, look as just a, a, a straightforward idiopathic club foot. Due to abnormal interuterine position, we may have postural uh, cases or postural conditions, but it is uh, easily to be corrected. And sometimes uh, we may have the classification in the form of postural, fixed or neglected or relapsed. Other techniques or other theories may be erupted or to be in our mind, such as the mechanical theory, and the package packaging the problem, hereditary arrest in the fetal development or abnormal muscle development, uh, prenatal neuropathy, vascular anomalies, soft tissue, and this is uh, are not uh, uh, easy to be detected. Maybe in need for some research, but we should mirror our mind all these items as a basic science to be studied and to be in our mind as a postgraduate not to be going through it because it is a well settled as a basic. I think it is uh, easy to be gained from the books or literatures. Uh, this is abnormalities which could be affected, uh, affected the posteromedial uh, muscles, especially the tendons and the inter tendinous and the inter and uh, uh, joint capsules and even the tendons and uh, also the anterior tibial artery absent or small in some cases, care of the posterior medial release. Many posterior medial groups also are also uh, uh, contracted. So many passo anatomy we should be in our mind. The anatomy for the, the normal or the, the, the actual uh, bone component should be in our mind because any disturbance of these components which lead to the carpal tunnel, to the uh, club foot, especially in the adult age. And the bone is the way to correct, not the soft tissue as it is in the infantile age. So the bony abnormality will increase by the age if we left it without treatment. And the soft tissue abnormality will increase in contracture. And we should put in our mind that talipsis coronavirus has the Latin the word of horse, all these are, and by the way, give us the idea of the problem, which is not all these, the components of the deformity of the foot. 
planas, kevas, abduction, adduction, valgas, veras, equinas. We only in this have four problems. Equinas, from the lateral view we can see here, the equinas. Veras, which we should look for right from the posterior to have the heel in front of our eyes to guide us that it is a various position. This is the axis of the heel to look for and know that it is a various. Here to look from the lateral side to know that it is an equinus. This is the foot and this is the tibia or the leg. So this is the condition of the equinus to look for from the end on appearance from the foot, from end on, from the the plantar surface, we can ask ourselves that is there is a duxon or no, and the cavus is clearly from the medial side. So we should have the foot in front of us in our hands and look for it from the medial side to check if it is cavus or no, from posterior to see if it is varus heel or no, from the lateral side to check if it is equinus or no, and from the and on appearance to have if it is a ductus or no, because all these components is the components of the club foot. So we have this letter C A V E cave, cave us adduction, varus, and equinus. This is the clinical view of them. No, no need to repeat, but we should put in our mind cave us is in the midfoot and look for it from the medial side, a duxon should look it from the plantar side and the equinus in the hind foot and should be in our mind to look for it from the lateral side and the varus is in the hind foot and should be from behind or from the back of the foot. Looking for the pasu anatomy, we'll not repeat these things again, but we should know that this is an imbalance between the tibialis anterior and peroneus longus. Uncorrected hind foot or forefoot pathology will result in all this disfigurement from the view. And from inside, we should imagine that the bone will be crumbled from the medial side and elongated from the lateral side. So this is imbalance. This is give me the short medial column and increase our elongated lateral column, which is locked here and imagined here, and we can feel it and sense the bone here. So this is the four components we should in our mind, and we should know that uh, the component imagine in progression of the deformity it will change it from the sound to all this disfigured uh, shape of bone. The soft tissue contract should be in our mind, everything, even the tibiotalar capsules, the deep deltoids, superficial deltoid, posterior, telocancanial capsule, everything is contracted. So contraction is all over the soft tissue. And we should also put in our mind that all these, if we look for it and try to correct it surgically, will re result in a very uh, questionable condition after surgery. Returning after this uh, basic uh, knowledge about the deformity, the club foot assessment. Any club foot assessment, we should look for it as it is uh, uh, written, actually, as a club foot assessment as we as we uh, would like to treat it conservative though it is not usually a conservative only but this the the, the diagnosis started from even from intratonine uh, fetal uh, examination and the assessment of the severity could be uh, in the prenatal ultrasound diagnosis as early as the 12th week the gestational history should be taken, the diagnosis, uh, also the quantitative deformity measurement and the monitoring. Sometimes they use the, the demiglio and the pirani and the pinsahil and the examination looking to uh, have uh, the uh, 
general appearance, the examination of the hind foot, as we mentioned, the equinus, the posterior skin crease, as we look here, the calcaneus prominence, if prominent or no, the medial rotation, as we mentioned before, from the medial side, lateral side, posterior, and end on appearance of the foot. All those uh, components should be examined, and especially also for the upper limb, don't forget to look for the back. Maybe you have a spinal bifida. Look, don't forget to look for the pelvis. We may have some uh, dysplasia, and also the four the uh, four uh, limbs is important to be checked. And uh, this is the 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 four the the arthropods should be also in our mind atrophy of the lower muscles, uh, smaller feet, one of the others any other congenitals, all, all these conditions should be in our mind. Uh, diagnosis using X-ray is not uh, too much extent important in a very uh, small child, up to one month, two months. Uh, we relied upon uh, clinical examination, but later on, it is may be important that we may succeed to have some measurements from the X-ray, which is so important and help us in the follow-up of the case. Uh, the uh, most important uh, uh, ways we should rely upon some sample uh, uh, assessment uh, and some sample measures. And one of them is of the evaluation system is, is that of Pirani scoring, which depends upon six points, six parameters, three for the midfoot, three for the hind foot, Zero means that it's normal, and six is more uh, severe. So the normal is just zero, moderately affected is uh, 0.5, and severely abnormal is one. And the calculation, if approaching to six, this means that it is severe, and if it is approaching to be zero, this is uh, about to be normal. This is Pirani scoring. I hope that it is in our mind as a postgraduate uh, colleagues. This is simply the uh, shape, how it is uh, assessed in the midfoot and in the hind foot. We can look for it. This is how it is the heel, zero, it's normal, 0 0.5, and this is one, this is more affected also. The plantar flexion, the dorsal flexion, the equinus, this is the heel, the crease, empty heel or something like this is simply to be calculated from the patient in a hurry. It is a simple classification, not complicated, such as that one of the Miglu, and also even as that one of one of the efficient uh, uh, pediatric surgeon, uh, uh, Professor Sahil or Ben Sahil, uh, and also even the International Club Foot uh, uh, Study Group that evolved and make another one which is so sophisticated, morphological parameters, functional parameters, and radiological parameters. I think Pirani is acceptable for our clinics and uh, for uh, 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 our postgraduate colleagues to be simply to be adopted. Looking for the types of club foot according to the uh, treatment uh, uh, stage, you may have uh, neonatal, infant, uh, childhood, or Looking for those, we may have uh, untreated child, treated the child, or resistant, or recurrent, or neglected. This is no problem to distinguish each from each other. If untreated, simply to be treated. If treated, it's okay, just as this. But there is some cases in need for some care. The recurrent foot also, and the neglected foot it is simply to be uh, examined and actually the complex foot that failed of treatment and the difference between relapsed and the neglected it is a, a, a question for postgraduate but it is uh, simply to be uh, uh, known and answered I will bypass it looking for the types according to the treatment stage and looking for those who come for conservative treatment looking for the poncity this is a keystone Kite method didn't depend upon this as a keystone. The uh, uh, tailors show the most important thing in this lecture is to put our thumb in the tailors and move the foot 
to have a very nice Ponsetti management technique. This is the book of the Ponsetti, and uh, it is easy to have it from a global uh, website uh, that had been written by uh, Lene Stahli, and uh, it is easy to download it in color. Uh, looking for uh, the management of Ponsetti, it is not the only one. Uh, there is another area of management, which is French functional physical therapy. But there is some studies discloses that also French study also is possible. The idea of Ponsetti should be in our mind, serial manipulation, average cast around five cast and pecranial stain to Achilles. Looking for the needs of the Ponsetti, need more than one assistant, manipulation started by putting the thumb on the talus, then moving the foot, stabilize the talus, it is the most important. The talus is the key, don't touch the heel. Here how it movement, now here how the first cast appear, it looks like it is not corrected, but it is in the way of correction. This is the front view, medial view, and the end on view. This is the first cast. How it is? Application wrapping, going up, molding of the cast, going up the knee, and trimming of the cast. Following cast is the same such as the previous one, with some improvement in second cast, more improved in the third cast, and overcorrected in the fourth cast. After the fourth cast, you should, in some instances, do an irrigation routine to Achilles to have the cast in this over abduction and the dorsiflexion. This means that you correct is completely. Looking for this is in a hurry. This is such the repetition. It is easy to be understand well following the previous slides. The idea for the next is to have this to do how to do the elongation of the tendo Achilles. I think here, dorsiflexion, more dorsiflexion going through from the scalpel, number 10, from the medial side to the lateral, from the serious, thanks to the more, uh, hell, more uh, easier to be detected here and how it is be cut. Is cut percutaneously with no opening, especially in those children. And here, the cast after elongation of tendo Achilles, and after three weeks, we can detect that this just a pinpoint here. This is summary of the head being dealt. Looking now for those who came for us with relapse or recurrent or resistant cases. Those relapse or recurrent or resistant cases, we should put in our mind that relapse should be managed early and have many causes, especially from incompliance of the patients, loss of abduction, loss of dorsiflexion or recurrence. All this should be tackled with early, don't stay. So casting for relapses is early and is so important to examine them, especially supination abduction is not clear except while walking. We should from behind look for the patient while she's walking because we may find the supination abduction just while he put, take off his foot from the ground. So we may have a coinus uh, relapse to do a new elongation of tendo Achilles again, or we may have various relapse, which is not appear except from behind. We can do recasting, dynamic supination. We may need to do tibialis anterior transfer to the medial coliform or the medial or the second tarsal according to the, we may find that the, there is a, a severe uh, cavus. We may need to do standard procedures to solve this. Or sometimes they do first metatarsal. This is for relapses. There is some uh, algorithm. I think if we are in uh, in a good condition from previous uh, uh, slides to understand it, it is 
uh, easy to collect them and to read it. This is in some cases of relapses. We may do lateral ray shortening by wedging or by doing some calcaneo cuboid resection, even calcaneus only, cuboid only, lengthening of the medial column, shortening of the lateral column. All these are according to the case or a la carte as sometimes called. Sometimes we may have a patient with recurrence. The recurrence of the patient is also high because the compliance of the patients or the parents. Resistance of some cases, mostly due to uh, the complex cases of the congenital or associated with other uh, neuropathic condition. Looking for this uh, case with the uh, idiopathic left foot had been treated and failed for city and have a contracted uh, uh, medial side of the foot, which is not amenable for posterior media release. Posterior media release is the keystone of resolving many conditions of soft tissue. But in these instances, soft posterior media release may result in a very serious complications, especially in the bone, because it is so child, so young to loss the epiphysis and also the skin so serious to interfere. In these instances, we look for a Lizarov and use it, or even to use Ponsitki again as a green party. There is agreement in our day to do and to have Ponsitki. So what I would like to say that Ponsitki for the older children, this is a point to be in our mind. Ponsitki for older children is so important and it could be done even post posterior media release. And post media release is not to be uh, think except of after finishing all the trials of uh, uh, Ponsitki technique, even in post surgical release. And also as the last instances, we can look for the Elizarov as a safeguard or may consider it as a salvagial procedures in some cases such as failure of this condition. We may have bilateral feet had been treated by the same surgeon, but one succeeded and failed and the other is so bad. So in this condition should be tried to do again, no posterior media release, but to do Ponsetti, even if, if she is eight years old, we should try Ponsetti. And if failed, we should try Elizabeth. Don't try to do posterior medial again or doing any soft tissue release again on those child. Please think of doing Ponsetti again or doing or performing Elizarov again. Doing this is more important for the patient. No touch, no posterior medial release again. For this patient had been treated by the same surgeon, failed by one and succeeded by the other and the trial, but failed, but failed. So. Elizarov applied, and we have here so complicated Elizarov, but it's so effective. We can make the frame pre assembly, but we later on we can do it on table. The conister, as we see here in Aquinas, and from the media side, we make this rod to do distraction. So we open the cavus and correct it, and we make differential also distraction here so as to safeguard again crumbling of the soft bone. This is a condition with equinus, it is not corrected yet. And this is a condition from here. We push the heel to correct the, the varus heel. We push here this rod to correct the cavus here. And we push here from behind to correct the equinus here. And we help this by this rods from in front to make compression here. So we make distraction posteriorly, lengthening from the medial side, as uh, such as the lengthening of the medial column, shortening of the lateral column, but here no shortening of the lateral column, but keeps the lateral column in part by differential lengthening of this uh, uh, lateral column, just one millimeter, and from the medial column, two millimeters until we attain the correction, as we see here. No touch for these old scars from previous three uh, operations beforehand. No problem about the crawling of the toes. It will be resolved later on, as we see here. Everything is going well. Also, the X-ray so uh, uh, difficult, but 
it gives us some idea about the condition. Here, after removal, show how it is so supple, no problem, uh, in a cast and open the cast from post-operative edema to be saved, and later on, some special shoes, and this is the condition after, and this is the condition later on, and she was crying now, starting the treatment, so happy, and this is the condition growing up, and it have a follow-up too long until now. She is now around 15 years old. Thank you. Thank you, Federal. Very, very nice lecture. In such a short time to cover everything of the club foot. In fact, it is my mistake. I should not have given you this lecture. <laughs> I should have asked you to speak only on one aspect. Fantastic. Uh, well, I tried. What, we want, what I tried. Really we want our students to know is the Ponsetti technique, which you have very well covered. That is what they must know about it. Thanks a lot, uh, Federal, for your uh, giving your valuable time. And again, I invite uh, Enric to come and talk. And followed by another very interesting lecture of the pediatric access. Enric. <clears throat> so, sir, thank you so much. And um, so the, this talk will be on Perthes. And I'm not going to cover everything in Perthes because it's impossible but I'll cover just an overview of what we should know from um, an exam point of view. So what I've seen about Perthes disease is that um, there's a lot of confusion about diagnosis and especially the treatment of Perthes disease. And uh, again, remember that Perthes disease is uh, named after the people who first described it in 1910. So three people simultaneously, one from France, one from Germany, and one from the US. And therefore, it's called Leg Calve Perthes disease. That's the whole terminology, but very often it's just called as Perthes disease. So we know that Perthes disease is basically an avascular necrosis of the femoral head. Uh, and the outcome of this condition is usually quite benign, especially when it occurs in a child who's younger than six years of age. It's only when the child is older, as they go close towards skeletal maturity, that Perthes can result in a problem. Because if you have a collapse of the femoral head, in the stage of avascularity and fragmentation, that femoral head can start extruding out, resulting in a deformity of the femoral head before the child has a chance to mature. So what happens in Perthes disease I've seen is that there are so many terminologies which are bandied around. And in the end, you're left with a person who's really confused. You know, what are these different classifications that we use? What are these different outcome measures? How do we make a decision making for Perthes disease? And that's what I'll cover today in, in this talk is basically focusing on decision making as to which children need treatment. And when you decide to treat them, how do you decide to do a containment procedure? So the problem, as I said, with Perthes disease is unlike other conditions like TB, hip or DDH or club foot, uh, the minute Perthes was diagnosed in 1910, it's not that it's a new condition. It's been there for, for, for millennia. It's just that after X-rays were discovered, Many patients who were thought to have tuberculosis, in fact, were found to have this condition called Perthes disease. So when you say it's been described since 1910, it's not that it's only been there since 1910. It's been there for many, many uh, millennia, as we have said. But it's only after X-rays came out in 1896 by Wilhelm Roentgen that this condition, which is very specific to children, was actually diagnosed and named. And the minute the diagnosis was made on an X-ray, what happened is that most children underwent some sort of treatment. So therefore, you'll find that there are very few long-term studies, unlike DDH or club foot, where we actually have natural history studies to say that if you don't treat a child with DDH, what happens at the age of 50 or 60 or 80? Whereas with Perthes, we have very few of these long-term studies. Most of them are retrospective. They have a small number of patients. And most of them are not randomized. So you don't have a controlled group. And the minute you don't have a controlled group, you can no longer say that one form of treatment is superior to the other. So in general, I think we must understand that Perthes by itself is not a very disabling condition. It's not like DDH or cerebral palsy. Most children with Perthes disease, especially when they're young, will recover well and will have little disability over their lifetime. And we know that it was not a big problem many, many decades ago because people never lived to a ripe old age. We are now seeing people who are surviving into the seventh, eighth, and ninth decade of life. And uh, therefore, it becomes an issue now because many of these older patients start getting symptomatic which weren't happening before. 
So this was a good long-term study which came out of uh, Iowa, same Onseti Institute by, by uh, Stuart Weinstein in 1984. And another one from Scandinavia, which showed that usually in young adulthood, most children with Percy's disease, most uh, adults who have had Percy's when they were young are quite active and pain-free. And despite the x-rays look quite abnormal, they don't surprisingly have much disability. They're able to function well, they have little pain or problems, but it's only once you cross the age of 50 and you enter your fifth and sixth decade of life that more than half of these patients start developing disabling pain and osteoarthritis. So now that we have more of an aging population, especially in developed countries, you'll find that Percy's is becoming a big diagnostic problem because we know that not all of them will do well. As long as you're a young adult, you tend to, you tend to do well with a deformed head. But once you enter your fifth and sixth decade of life, you will have degenerative joint disease which almost always needs a total hip replacement. Now, I must caution everyone that the treatment of palsy disease when they're symptomatic is to first treat the symptom. And most of these children come with a pain and a limb. And very often when a patient like this comes in the exam, I've seen most of the candidates will say, oh, this is a palsy disease. This child has, uh, is in Elizabeth Town stage uh, two or two A. Uh, this patient has a collapse of the femoral head by catrol grade, it's grade three or grade four. And therefore, we'll do a containment surgery. And remember, that's a wrong answer because that's not how we treat patients when they come to us in our clinic. They come to us with symptoms of pain and limp. And therefore, our first treatment of Percy disease is to make the child comfortable and not to treat the x-ray. And this is something I can't reiterate strongly enough because very often I attend various conferences and I have young orthopedists come up to me and show me x-rays of patients. Say, this is a patient's x-ray that I had, saw in my clinic a few days ago. Should I do a containment or not? And my answer to that uh, person would be, what are the child's symptoms? Does the child have a full range of motion? Does the child have a limp? All those need to be treated first. So remember, when a child comes to you with a diagnosis of Percy's disease, they're not interested in what the x-ray shows. They've come to you with symptoms. So therefore, the first step is to relieve pain, put them in bed for a period of a week or 10 days, give them some non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, put them in traction to relieve the pain. Once the pain comes down, institute range of motion exercises, physical therapy, and improve function and treat the x-ray only after all of these features have been completely dealt with. Now, we must remember that when it comes to Percy's disease, what's important for us is when you see that five-year-old or six-year-old or eight-year-old child with a diagnosis of Percy's, you can treat those symptoms very well. But eventually, what is going to happen to that hip? And we are called upon as orthopedic surgeons to prognosticate what is likely to, to happen to that hip over a period of time. And that becomes a little difficult for us because when we treat club foot or we treat DDH, we can see the problem right in front of us. We can see that the deformed uh, foot and that foot needs to be corrected. Whereas in Percy's disease, very often some of the children tend to do well. Some of them land up with very bad looking hips. So we must be able to uh, look into a crystal glass and actually prognosticate which of those hips are going to do well in the long term. And this was a really important study that came out from Stolberg and Cooperman which was published in 1981. And even 40 years down the line, we're still using the same classification to understand that the only hips which do well in Percy's disease are the ones who land up with a spherical hip joint or a spherical head at the end of skeletal maturity. So Stolberg classified the hips at skeletal maturity into five grades and said that only if you have a spherical head, those adults will have a hip which will last a lifetime. Anything less than that, will land up with symptoms by the time you're into a young or old adulthood. And if you have an aesthetic incongruency, that's the worst hip. You have a deformed head and a deformed acetabulum, and which will likely land up with a severe osteoarthritis. So the aim of treatment of Percy's disease is to ensure that by the time the disease has finished its course, it's not going to run a natural history. By the time it finishes its course, it lands up with a head which is as spherical as it can be. So here you can see these are x-rays of five different children, five different adults now at skeletal maturity. All of them have had Percy disease of the right hip joint. And you can see in each of them, there's a different outcome. Here there's a Stolberg one where the head is completely normal and it looks like any other hip joint like the opposite side. Here's a Stolberg two where you can see there's some slight flattening of the femoral head and some coxa breva and coxa magna. This is a Stolberg three where you start seeing a mushroom or an ovoid shaped head. And you can see that the head is much larger than the acetabulum now and is therefore extruded by almost 40%. Here 
This is Stolberg four, where you have a very large and abnormal head. You have coxa breva, you have coxa magna, and you have an astigmatum which has fallen short of the femoral head. And finally, you have a Stolberg five, which is the worst type of hip outcome, where you can see a very deformed femoral head, which is going to become arthritic in a few years' time. So therefore, we must understand that our aim as orthopedic surgeons, when we see the child at uh, the age of five, six, or eight years. We must ensure that this child lands up with a result which is either a Stolberg one or a Stolberg two, and definitely not a Stolberg four or a Stolberg five. And we have to keep the head as spherical as possible because that's the only outcome which will result in a good long-term result. So, what are the important prognostic factors that decide the sphericity of the head at skeletal maturity? If you can ensure that the head is spherical at skeletal maturity, you can be sure that this hip will last a lifetime. And it depends on these five factors: the age of the child, the range of hip motion, the stage of the disease, which is basically at what uh, point in the evolution of the disease has the patient come to you, the grade of epiphyseal involvement, which tells you how much of the femoral head is involved, where we use the, sal the salter or the catrol calcification, and finally how much is the extent of epiphyseal collapse, for which we use the heading grade. So you must remember that these are the five important prognostic factors which help us to make a decision as to whether we should treat the child conservatively or go in for a containment. So as you can see, most of the things that are not in our hands, we can see that the age of the child, when the child has Percy disease, is not in our control. We know that the younger the child is, the better the chance of remodeling, and therefore a better prognosis. The older the child comes to you with Percy disease, the worse is the prognosis. We know that if they come early in the stage of the disease, we can do something which can keep the head round. But if they come to us in the latter stage of the disease, in advanced stage of, of collapse, then those so there are very limited options for us to keep the head round. So let's look at each of them. So if you look at the age of the child, the age of the child means the age at which the, the symptoms actually began. And what we use is the chronological age. We generally know from our long-term history now that if a child is less than six years, when birthies affects the child, the outcome is generally good. 90 to 95 percent of these children, irrespective of the treatment that you give them, will do extremely well and will land up with a spherical head at skeletal maturity. Between the age of six and ten, the prognosis is more guarded. And when you get pothies over the age of ten years, those children are likely not to do well and are likely not to land up with a spherical head. Next is the hip range of motion. We must remember that maintaining hip range of motion is crucial in Percy's disease. And that's why we said that every child who comes to you with pain and restriction of motion must have bed rest, traction, non steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, so as to keep the child comfortable. Because the more you keep the hip moving, the less the chance of a contracture and the less the chance for extrusion. The next stage, the next is called the stage of the disease. And this is the, the point at which the patient presents to you. And we use Elizabeth Town classification modified by Benjamin Joseph from Manipal, who has got a huge amount of work on Percy's disease. And he basically divided the four stages of Percy's into, uh, into four more subtypes. We know that Percy's passes through four stages. The first is the stage of avascularity. The second is the stage of fragmentation. The third is the stage of reossification. And the final stage of, of healing. So the first stage of the avascular stage was further divided by Benjamin Joseph into stage 1A and 1B. 1A is where it's very early in the stage of the disease, when there's an infarct of the femoral head, and the epiphysis becomes avascular and dense, but there is no loss of height of the epiphysis. Stage 1B is when it's a more advanced stage, when there is loss of height of the epiphysis, but the epiphysis is still in one piece, there's no fragmentation. So these are the two stages of avascularity. Once you start getting fragmentation of the femoral head, that is stage two, and that's further divided into A and B. Stage 1A is when you have very early fragmentation of just one or two fissures, and stage 2B is when the epiphysis frankly fragments it. And this is the stage where there's maximum collapse of the epiphysis. So if the patient comes to you in stage 2B, you know that he has come at a very advanced stage, and therefore there's very little things that you can do which will help to prevent the collapse, prevent extrusion, and therefore, this child is likely to develop a poorer result of Stolberg 3 or a 4. Stage 3 is a longer process. This is a stage of reossification when the collapse has already happened, the extrusion has already happened, and now new bone starts forming on the lateral aspect of the, of the femoral epiphysis. If it is a small amount of new bone, that's stage 3A. If you have a large amount of lamellar bone, which is covering at least one third of the epiphysis, that's stage 3B. 
and the last stage is the heal stage where the process of of, of revascularization and repair is complete and there is no evidence of any avascular bore so these are the four stages of perthes disease the next we want to understand is the grade and very often people confuse stage with grade stage is something which which evolves it is something which uh, as the child will progress through from stage 1 to stage 4 every child with perthes will pass through those four stages of avascularity fragmentation reossification and healing but grade of the disease is actually how much of the head is involved So catarrhal is the one whose classification we tend to use, and it's very simple to understand. If the epiphysis is involved less than fifty percent, that's the catarrhal one or two, and if more the epiphysis is involved, that's the catarrhal three or a four. So it's more important to differentiate catarrhal two from a three rather than between one and two and three and four, because between twenty-five and fifty percent, or between fifty and seventy-five percent, is not important. But it's important to understand: is it less than half, or is it more than half? and then we have a last grading which is called the herring grade which is based on the lateral pillar and this is an important classification because what herring did was to understand that the lateral pillar which is the lateral one third of the epiphysis is what prevents the head from collapsing and extruding outside the confines of the acetabulum so if the lateral pillar was intact then that's a herring a if less than 50% of the femoral of the lateral pillar has collapsed that's a herring b and if more than 50% of the lateral pillar has collapsed at the heading c and that has the worst prognosis because once you lose the integrity of the lateral pillar the femoral head tends to extrude out from the acetabulum so therefore based on these five prognostic uh, parameters we can decide which are the children who will benefit with containment versus those who do not contain what does containment mean containment means taking that epiphysis which is likely to extrude and putting it within the confines of the acetabulum because we know that perthes is a disease of the epiphysis the epiphysis is, is soft the epiphysis is moldable the epiphysis is likely to extrude and collapse the the acetabulum is normally intact in perthes disease so what you're trying to do is you're using that intact acetabulum to mold the soft femoral head into the round shape during the stage of avascularity and fragmentation so that it does not result in a stolberg 4 or a 5 hip so what we understand is looking at these five prognostic parameters if you have a child who is more than 6 because you know that less than 6 has a good prognosis anyhow so you don't need to contain them but if you have a child who's more than 6 then it benefits with containment if you have more than half the epiphysis involved then that hip should be contained if they come to you in the early stage of the disease that means before they develop late fragmentation because that is the stage when maximum deformation of femoral head and collapse occurs so before the head starts getting deformed and collapsed you must try and contain it within the intact acetabulum and therefore stage 1a 1b and 2a are the ideal points in the in the stage of the disease when the containment is of any use once the child enters into late fragmentation that hip has generally declared its course it's likely to have a poor outcome and therefore containment surgery is less likely to be useful in the later stage of the disease if you already have extrusion present then definitely containment will help and the important prerequisite for containment is that the hip must have a normal or near normal hip range of motion this is a very important parameter very often seen patients come to us with pain and stiffness and we plan for a containment surgery which is not which should never be done because that child will in fact develop a deformity rather than getting an improvement in his function so therefore here is a hip who will benefit from containment surgery you can see that this is a child between the age of 6 and 12 it's come to you at an early stage of avascularity and early fragmentation the catarrhal involvement is more than 50% and the lateral pillar height is reduced by 50% or more so this is the child who will benefit with the containment procedure so this is in india we used to get this 50 50 biscuit and perthes disease is very similar to that so if you have a child between the over the age of 6 if you have more than 50% of range of motion more than 50% extent of involvement and more than 50% collapse then this is a child who will benefit from a containment procedure so give you a few case examples here's a four year old boy and i'll show you how that decision making process is being used by us every time so as i have said you don't just look at the x rays you have to know what is the range of motion you have to know the patient's symptoms you have to know which stage of the disease so you can see that in the left side it's stage 1a there's an avascularity but there is no loss of height of the epiphysis and you can see now how the child is progressing over the next few months into stage 1b you can see now there is lots of epiphysis 
But because it's a young boy, it's a child who's less than six, the prognostic factors are all good. There's a good range of motion. I decided to just observe this child and not do any form of containment surgery, going by my previous decision-making algorithm. Here's a child now in stage 3A, uh, sorry, 2A and 2B. And this child was seen by two other orthopedic surgeons who kept telling the parents, please undergo surgery, please contain the hip. And they kept coming back to me and I said, no, nothing needs to be done. The x-ray may look horrible, but because we know the natural history of Percy's disease, because we know that it's a young child, good range of motion, good prognostic features, I'm not treating the child's x-rays, I'm treating the child's hip, and therefore decide not to do anything. So despite this x-ray looking horrible, you know, they're looking flat, it's looking fragmented, but it's not extruding. And that is the natural history of Percy's disease at this age. You can see that now it's progressing into the stage of healing, that's advanced fragmentation. The child is now uh, eight years old, and this is the final hip, where it's now entered into the healing stage, where the chance of extrusion and collapse is very low. This, there's no reason for this child not to have a great outcome with a Stolberg 1 or a Stolberg 2 hip. So this is an important point to make you all understand that it's very easy to get confused, okay, the x-rays and seeing how the disease progresses, the head collapsing, getting fragmented, but because you're sure and you know the uh, prognostic factors which are likely to have a good outcome, a young child, cataral uh, stage one or two, early stage of the disease, you know that if you maintain the hip range of motion, this hip without any containment procedure is likely to develop a good outcome. On the other flip side, here's an older child now. So this is a seven-year-old boy who's come with a strict of hip range of motion. You can see now that there is a stage 1B. It has now collapsed of the epiphysis. You can see that extrusion. You can see that the breakage of the Shenton's line. You can see that their head is extruded by almost 20% out of the confines of the acetabulum. So all the prognostic features are against this child, and this child needs an early containment procedure. So this is what the child underwent, the so one year, that's a two-year follow-up. And this child eventually did extremely well because you can see there's a round head developing now from a very flattened head that was seen initially. So picking up the children who need surgery, treating them early before significant extrusion occurs is the key for management of Percy's disease. Here's another child who's six and a half years, who's again come to an early stage of the disease. You can already see the some amount of extrusion. So though he's still young, though he's just crossed six years, because I'm beginning to see extrusion of the femoral head now, and he's come to an early stage, this child again undergoes a containment procedure. This is a technique done by Benjamin Joseph. You do an open wedge osteotomy and you put a screw across the, epi the trochanteric apophysis because you want to halt the growth in the lateral trochanter so that there's no trochanteric overgrowth. Here's another child, again, the same principles, eight and a half years old, early stage of the disease, treated with traction to restore the range of motion. And here you can now see that we have started to use a different type of implant. This is what is available in India for the last 10 years or so. It's called the proximal femoral plate, which is the pediatric size. It's a much better implant than just use a simple lateral plate. You can see that we can medialize the shaft quite well with this implant. And we have moved towards using this now for all our femoral osteotomy procedures. Here's the last case of an eight-year-old girl Again, the same thing, you can see a large metaphysical reaction. You can see early stage of the disease, older age, and extrusion already. So therefore, a containment procedure using, this was an older case of mine where I still use a lateral plate, but putting a screw across the trochanter. And I brought this child up because I can have a longer follow-up. This child is now 16 and a half years old, skeletally mature, eight years post-op, full range of motion, and a Stolberg class two hip. So because we treated that child early, and understood the principles of decision-making, did not wait to see significant extrusion and collapse, and did an early containment surgery that that child had now has a good outcome. So in conclusion, I would say that there's a lot of light which is now dawning in Percy's disease. It's not a confusing condition that we used to always consider earlier. We have now understood that uh, you know, boys do better than girls because they have more time before skeletal maturity. So if you have a, a girl who comes to you with Percy's disease, the prognosis is generally guarded because they have lesser years of growth remaining before they hit puberty. We know that the younger the child is, the better the prognosis. And we know that if you have a round-shaped head at the end of skeletal maturity, it's much better than having a mushroom-shaped head. So the aim of our procedure, the aim of our treatment of Percy disease is to allay the pain, the muscle spasm to allow rest for a few weeks, let the pain and, and uh, the symptoms subside, restore the range of motion, 
and then go ahead with doing a containment surgery, understanding which are the children who will benefit with containment versus those who will not require containment procedure. So that's all I have about Sochi's disease. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you, Andre. I think if you're in your lecture, if you would have shown only the last slide, that would have conveyed everything. The last slide <laughs> conveyed everything. The rounded head and mushrooming head. Fantastic. Beautiful. Sure. I really enjoyed you, your lecture. And um, are you ready for your to continue with your next lecture, Elric? Yes. Now, what I'm doing, sir, is that the topic which I took initially is a really small topic of how to talk about X-ray. I, I think cerebral palsy has not been covered in this course. And that's an important uh, case yes. that comes in the exam. Yeah. So, with your permission, in fact, I'll do first, I'll do cerebral palsy instead, and I'll just give a highlight and overview to the candidate how right. you should look at a case of cerebral palsy, because nowadays you can't escape from that. You know, I remember when we were giving exam, even the examiner didn't want to touch a, a case of CP, nor would the examinee. But I think now in the DNB exam, it's almost over. every time you have at least one child who comes to you with cerebral palsy. So, I'm going to mm -hmm. cover uh, cerebral palsy instead. Okay, can you see that slide? All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the evaluation of a child with cerebral palsy. Yep, and uh, I'm just going to give you an overview of an examinee, how you should, what, what should you look for in a child with CP? So I think the first thing to understand is the definition of CP because without a definition, we don't know what CP is. Remember that CP is not a single entity. It's not like clubfoot or like DDH but it's a spectrum of different disorders which result in a problem with movement and posture, which cause a limit limitation of activity because of a non-progressive lesion in the developing fetal or infant brain. So this is the primary diagnosis of CP. It's a permanent disorder. It's a group of disorders of development of movement and posture causing limitation of activity because of a non-progressive lesion in the developing brain. Understanding that these motor disorders of CP are not isolated because it affects a large part of the brain, they're often associated with disturbances of sensation, perception, cognition, communication, epilepsy, and by secondary musculoskeletal problems. So this is the definition of CP that we use nowadays. This is the one that's come out from Peter Rosenbaum from uh, Canada. And this is the definition that all of us should be aware of when we talk about what CP is. I would like to caution a lot of the youngsters nowadays because still in the exams and still when we discuss in clinics, I see people using terminologies which should not be used. And we know that disability is a universal feature. All of us can be disabled at some point in our life. And the whole focus now is moving towards inclusion, where we include everyone, even with disabilities, into our society. And therefore, certain terms should not be used when talk to parents or children with CP. And therefore, I call it pejorative. Pejorative means a, a term which is uh, not good to use. So never call the child a spastic child or a CP child. I know in some cultures, we still say, oh, there's a spastic child or this is a CP child. And that's the wrong terminology. What we should focus on is not the child, but the disease. And therefore, we shift our terminology to say that this is a child with spasticity. This is a child with cerebral palsy. And we don't say there's a spastic child or a CP child. Another terminology I see people using as this is an MRCP child. Now, to me, MRCP is a UK degree. It has nothing to do with a child with cerebral palsy. We must understand that more than 30, uh, uh, more than 60% of children with CP have normal mentation. Sometimes they can't communicate. Sometimes they can't verbalize, but does not mean they're mentally retarded. So avoid using terms like MRCP because most children with cerebral palsy, are, in fact, are very intelligent. They have problems with communication and cognition but they are quite intelligent and only a third of children with CP actually have some sort of mental retardation. And today, as we said, the focus should be on the disease and not on the child. And we must have this atmosphere of inclusion where we include children with disabilities within society. So the first step to understand CP is to classify. And there are two ways we can classify CP. One is called the motor classification or the neurological classification. One is called the topographic or the anatomical classification. So in the neurological classification, depending upon the neurological type, 
declassified children saying that they either have spasticity, they have dyskinesia, they have ataxia, or they have a mixed condition. And when we say dyskinesia, it basically means a uh, posterior column features. It means involvement of the basal ganglia. And depending on which part of the basal ganglia or the posterior columns are involved, either they can be chorioisotoid or they can be dystonic. So these are the broad types of motor classification of cerebral palsy. So here's a child who is, as you can see, I'm not saying that by looking at the gait, you can come to a diagnosis. But generally, if you see a child who is walking with a consistent gait pattern, as you can see, this child is always walking on the toes. So this is a toe walking child. And this is most likely to be our motor type, which is the spastic form. In, con in comparison, here you have this child who has got very abnormal movements. You can see that there are very large involuntary movements of the upper limb and the lower limb. And this is very atypical of spasticity. This is more like dystonia. So when you see children come to you with this kind of a gait pattern, where they have very large abnormal movements of the proximal parts of the muscles, shoulder, uh, hip, then this is a dystonic gait pattern and not a spastic gait pattern. So this, by looking at the gait, sometimes you can classify the motor type, whether it's spastic or it's dystonic. And then occasionally we'll have children to come to you with hypotonia. As you can see this girl, there's a child who is got, as you call as a taxi type of cerebral palsy. She's keeping her arms out for balance. She's got a broad base gait and it's a very slow shuffling gait. So sometimes just looking at the gait of the child, you can come to a diagnosis what motor type this child has, whether it's spastic, whether it's dystonic, or whether it's ataxic. The next type of classification that we tend to use is what part of the body is involved. And therefore we classify cerebral palsy on two ways, the motor type and the anatomical type. So depending on the topography, depending on which part of the body is involved, we can classify the children hemiplegia, diplegia, quadriplegia, and which is very rare, a monoplegia. So here's a child, as you can see, with hemiplegia. What does hemiplegia mean? It means that half the body is involved. So one half of the body is normal. So you can see that the right side is normal, but the left side is abnormal. Here. So you can see that there's decreased swing of the left side. You can see the abnormal posturing of the knee and the foot. And this child, therefore, has a diagnosis of hemiplegia. And just the gait itself will give you a clue as to the diagnosis. On the other hand, if you have a child who has involvement of both lower limbs, as you can see here, especially the lower limbs involved more than the upper limbs. So you can see this child has got what we call a jump posture, where you have hip flexion, knee flexion, and ankle inequinus, both lower limbs involved more than the upper limb, then we call this as diplegia. And finally, you have children who have got what we call quadriplegia. Quadriplegia basically is children who have got total body involvement, where they have a lot of comorbidities, where the limbs are constantly, uh, as you can see here, scissored, and the child is always bedridden. In this, the hips are the very highly risk of, of subluxation or dislocation. And this is the most severe form in far the topography is concerned. So whenever we see a child with cerebral palsy, we classify them by the motor type, either spastic, dystonic, or mixed, and by the motor type, either hem and by the topography type, either hemiplegia, diaplegia, or quadriplegia. So a little bit of neurology is important to understand before we talk about CP. So we must understand that the pyramidal system and the cortex is the locus of all manual and voluntary control system. Remember that the spinal cord is facilitatory, whereas the upper center, that is the brain and the brain stem, are inhibitory. So remember that because cerebral palsy affects the brain and the cerebral cortex, which is actually inhibitory, the facilitatory effects of the spinal cord are released from the inhibition of the cortex. And therefore, you have all these features of cerebral palsy, which is spasticity, uh, dependence on primitive reflex pattern, loss of selective control, imbalance between the muscle agonist and antagonist. So these are all the features of cerebral palsy occurring because of loss of inhibition from the cerebral cortex. And therefore, you have this progressive lesion where the static, the lesion of the brain is static, the effect on the body is progressive. So it's primarily an upper motor neuron lesion, unlike polio, which is a lower motor neuron lesion. So therefore manifests with spasticity and weakness, resulting in secondary myostatic changes within the muscle, causing fixed contractures, leading to bony torsion, instabilities, and dislocation. So you can see how a child who initially has a normal muscular system, because of the upper motor neuron lesion and prolonged spasticity and weakness, resulting in myostatic changes in the muscle, 
leading to changes in the bones and the joints. So the lesion in the brain is static, but the, but the effects on the muscular cerebral system are progressive. And this is an important thing to understand when you talk of cerebral palsy. Also to understand that when you see a child with CP walking, they have gait deficits. And the gait deficits can be primary deficits, secondary or tertiary. Primary deficits are because of the brain lesion, because of the spasticity and poor balance, resulting in muscle contracture and bony torsion, which is a secondary deficit, resulting in compensatory mechanisms in the proximal joints, which are called tertiary def deficits. So you must be able to isolate the tertiary, secondary from the primary deficits in children with cerebral palsy. So here's an article that we wrote up, which I would urge all of you all to read, and encourage you all to read. This was published by us in the Journal of Indian Orthopedics, where we put out a, an article describing a review of how do you examine a child with cerebral palsy from the orthopedic point of view. Remember that a physiotherapist will examine a child differently, a neurologist will examine a child differently. This was an orthopedic assessment of a child with CP. What are the things that we must look at and examine uh, when you have a child who presents to you with CP? The first thing to understand is you must take a very good medical history. We already said that cerebral palsy is a perinatal condition. It can occur because of a genetic problem. It can occur perinatally because of uh, certain perinatal features. And therefore, taking a good medical history is the key before you start examining the child. Of course, ask the family what their concerns are. Remember that cerebral palsy also has other deficits in terms of cognition, vision, hearing, and understand all of that rather than just looking and focusing on the muscular schedule system. A good birth history is very important to understand. Find out if the child was preterm, find out if there were any perinatal risk factors, find out if there were any prenatal problems, ask if there's history of birth asphyxia, find out what the APCA score was, whether the child required intensive care for the first few days or weeks of the life, did the child have neonatal hyperbilirubinemia or jaundice or convulsions or hypoglycemia, so taking a very detailed birth history for the risk factors for CP is a very crucial part of our history taking. The next thing to look at is what are the motor milestones that the child is achieving. And we look at the gross and fine motor function uh, when we assess children with cerebral palsy. And we must use certain scales to uh, quantify what exactly is the deficit that the child has in gross motor and fine motor activities. So one classification that we use very frequently is, that, is one that was described at Palisano at all, almost 25 years ago. It's called the GMSPS, or the Gross Motor Function Classification System. All of you should be familiar with this, because when we see a child with cerebral palsy walking, we must be able to quantify what the GMSPS level. So it's an ordinal system where you can see it progresses from a spectrum. A level one child is able to walk completely normally, has only deficits in, in gait and posture and balance, and uh, they can climb stairs, but they have some deficits in terms of balance. So parents will frequently tell you that the child is otherwise fine, but when he runs and plays, he tends to fall more frequently than his peers, but otherwise has no other functional problems at all. So that's a level one child. A level two child is a little more involved. They otherwise can walk well on level surfaces, but when they start climbing stairs or do certain activities more than the normal, then they need some help or support. So a child with GMFCS2 needs the support of a handrail while climbing stairs. Level three and four basically need some sort of assistive device. They cannot walk independently. A level three child needs either elbow crutches or requires a wheelchair when going for long distance. Then they can propel themselves on a manual wheelchair. Whereas a level four child also needs assistive devices, but usually much more than a level three, whereas these can, can move around with a, with a crutch. These would generally need a walker or a motorized wheelchair. And a level five child is one who's basically bedridden, who cannot propel themselves anywhere, who has no head control, no sitting balance, and needs someone to propel them forward on a wheelchair. So here you can see a spectrum of involvement growing from level one to level five. And all of you should be aware of this classification system because it's a common language that we use when we discuss children with neurologists or physiotherapists. So if I say that this is a level two child, immediately the therapist knows that the child is an independent ambulator. If I say it's a level five child, we straight away know that this child is on a wheelchair or bedridden. The second thing to talk about in the examination is the tone assessment. We know that because it's an upper motor neuron lesion, there are abnormalities of, of tone. And the tone means there's increase in the spasticity. But just saying that the child has spasticity is not enough. We must be able to quantify that further. And we use two scales to quantify the amount of spasticity. 
One is called the modified Ashworth scale and one is called the Tardieu scale. The modified Ashworth is basically a, a subjective system of telling us how much tight the muscles are. And again, it's an ordinal system which goes from zero to four, where you can see a zero out of one is where there's a mild increase in tone, where you have a catch followed by a release. This is what is typically called a clasp knife type of spasticity. Whereas as the tone starts increasing, you may have increased resistance throughout the range of motion. And this is what's called a lead pipe type of rigidity, which is a Ashworth 4. So this is an ordinal system that tells you how much or spasticity the child has in the various muscle groups. The next important one to make out the to, to decide the quantify the amount of, of tone is the Tardieu scale. And for the Tardieu, you are basically trying to elicit the stretch reflex and calculate the amount of tightness or spasticity the child has. And we use two values, the R1, the R2, and the R1 minus R2. So R1 is the first catch which you get. Then you use the most sustained stretch of the muscle, which is the R2. And the difference between R1 and R2 is what's called the dynamic range of staticity, which is also an important value. So this can be used in all muscle groups. So here you can see we are doing it for the ankle joint. So you see R1 is the first catch. R2 is where you get a more sustained stretch. And the difference between R1 and R2 is also important, which tells you the degree of staticity within the muscle. Here's a video which shows the same thing. So that's the R1, the first catch. Then you put a more sustained stretch on the muscle and you see how much of dorsiflexion, that's the R2. And in the knee in the ankle joint, we also flex the knee. That's called the silver scholes test. And we see whether there's more increase in dorsiflexion because of the gastronemus relaxation. So there are in the ankle joint three tests, the R1, the R2, and the silver scholes test. So I'll play that again for you. The first catch is the R1. Then we do a more sustained stretch. And remember, I'm not dorsiflexing just the midfoot. I'm looking at the heel because I don't want to elicit a midfoot break. And then I do the silver scroll test where I get more dorsiflexion, indicating that the gastronemus is more involved in the soleus. Similarly, I can do the same test for the hamstrings as well. So here again, I'm doing it for the ankle joint. And then I'm, I can also do it for the popliteal angle. And you can see I give a... So a rapid catch, so a rapid stretch, that's the R1. And then I will do a more sustained stretch, and that's the R2. And that tells you the difference in how much tightness is there in the hamstrings, the R1 minus the R2. <clears throat> so that's the R1, the first measurement, and the R2 is the most sustained measurement. And we measure the popliteal angle from the vertical. The last step of the examination would be to do a detailed musculoskeletal examination of the different range of motion of the various joints, the presence of contractures, the presence of any deformities. And then we must grade the strength because we know that every child with cerebral palsy will have some amount of weakness. And that's what we use the MRC grades for the strength of the child. And the last part was there to do have these uh, various tests that we use. So these are all tests for biarticular muscles. Remember that in cerebral palsy, the biarticular muscles are involved more than the uniarticular muscles. So therefore, you have these special tests, which are called the silver scholes test for the gastrosoleus, the hamstring, which is the popular angle test, the prone rectus test, which is called the Duncan Ellie test. For the iliosaurus or the hip FFD, we have the thomases or the prone Sahili test. For the adductors, you have the Phelps and Baker test. So some named tests for common contractures around muscles which are biarticular. So there are the various tests which you can see. Here, this is the Thomas's test that is performed. You can see that this child has a hip FFD. This is the popliteal angle test, so you measure the popliteal angle from the vertical. This is the amount of hip abduction, and this is the modified popliteal angle test. Then you also have the Duncan Ellie test, where you can see I flex the knee, and the, there's a pelvic rise, which shows that the staticity of the rectus. And here, this is the silver scrolls test, where you are doing ankle dorsiflexion in knee extension and with the knee inflection. That's again showing you the Thomas's test and the Duncan Ellie test. You can see that as I flex the knees, the hip comes up because of the tightness of the rectus femoris, which is a biarticular muscle, which is a hip flexor and a knee extensor. So therefore, to conclude, I would say that when you evaluate a child with cerebral palsy, you must look at all these various tests. You must grade the ambulatory potential of the child based on the GMSCS. 
Look for the presence of contractures or deformities by using those special tests I described. Grade the spasticity using the Ashworth or the Tardieu score. Grade the level of strength by the MRC grade. Look for selective motor control, which is basically the ability to isolate a certain muscle group. And always end with a gait analysis, because I always feel a gait analysis, you don't need to have a fancy gait lab, but just doing a video analysis of how the child is walking in the coronal and the sagittal plane gives you a good idea of what are the great gait abnormalities that this particular child has. Finally, I would urge all of you all who are treating children with cerebral palsy to move towards this classification, which is called the WHO, International Classification of Functioning, Disability and Health, Health or the ICF framework. I'm sure all of you are aware of the ICD codes. Everyone is using the International Classification of Diseases, which has recently been released. You have the ICD-11. And similar to ICD, which is a classification of diseases, ICF is a classification of function. And what the ICF looks at is that when we assess children with neurological conditions, we should not just look at body structure and body function, because very often, that's what we always focus on. We see a child who's got a decline foot, we do a surgery and make the foot straight and they're happy because structurally the body has changed. But does that mean that the child's function has improved? Does that mean that the child can now uh, do his activities of daily living? Does that mean that the child can now participate in activities that the child is supposed to do is what we tend to ignore. So we must as orthopedic surgeons move beyond treating just body structure and function, but start understanding that whatever we do should impact the child's activity and participation. Activity basically means the ability to take part in life, uh, life roles, which is basically bathing, toileting, eating, feeding, writing. So these are called activities of daily living. And then we have participation, which basically means taking part in certain other things in life, like being able to play, being able to work, being able to do a particular hobby. That is called participation. So whatever we do for the child in terms of body structure should improve the body function and should improve uh, activity and participation. Then we know that we have avoided a disability. So that's our basic treatment for the child. Remember that every child lives within an environment. And sometimes you have to consider the role of the environment because what I do for a child who comes to me living in a small village versus what I do for a child living in a high rise building in South Mumbai is going to be very different. They may have the same features, but because the environment is so different, I know that a child in a village will need to squat, will need to use an Indian toilet. A child living in a high-rise apartment will be fine with a Western-style toilet. So the treatment of the same child in different environments is going to be very different. So understand how all of these impact the treatment of children with cerebral palsy, move beyond the framework of treating body structure, focus on function improvement, understand the role of activity and participation, and the effect of environment and personal factors on the overall treatment process. And finally, to understand that disability, in fact, is universal. We, are, we, we should stop. I think that's what the ICF framework has done. It made us understand that a child with disability is not in a silo. It doesn't live separately. It lives within society. And all of us human beings will suffer disability at some point in our life. Tomorrow, if I get back pain because uh, of a, a, a slip disc and I can't go to work, I am disabled. If my mother or father or grandmother has arthritis of the knee and therefore cannot walk around in the community, cannot participate in activities, that person is disabled. So disability, we have to understand, is universal. It is not a specific group of people who have a certain life condition, but every one of us will have a disability at some time in our life or not. So what we should understand is that we begin with an impairment. An impairment is basically a loss of function of a body, body part, resulting in an inability to perform a function, therefore resulting in a disability. And when the disability is hampered because of our environment, when society imposes a handicap on us, that disability becomes a handicap. So what we should do as living in society, we should include people with disabilities, assuming that disability is universal, assuming that all of us will be disabled at some point in our life and avoiding society from imposing a limitation on us and preventing us from moving from disability to a handicap. And therefore, in any good society, you'll realize that we should not be using the word handicap. When we say the word handicap, it means that in addition to that person's disability, 
we have imposed a limitation. So if I go to a mall and I'm disabled and I need a wheelchair and the mall does not have a ramp, then society has imposed a handicap on my disability. So a truly evolved society will move away from handicap. It will move away from uh, the feature of imposing a problem on a patient with a disability and make uh, everything more accessible. And that is what the focus of the world today is all about accessibility, all about providing facilities to people with, handi with, with disabilities so that we don't impose handicap on this vulnerable set of people. So that's what I would like to conclude about with uh, CP. With any questions, I'll be happy to take them. We have had, I think, four talks on mm -hmm. cerebral palsy. Thank you, and Elric. Very good lecture. And one of the most difficult subject, cerebral palsy, you make it so easy and, and explain the things very, I'm sure the students would have been greatly benefited. And uh, if there are any uh, questions, and if you go into the chat box, uh, uh, chat, there are about 20 questions. Uh, uh, Fadel, are you there? Fadel? Uh, uh, anybody would like to make comment on the accelerated uh, Ponsetti technique, Elric? Okay, yes, okay. I'm here. Yeah, Fadel? Uh, Welcome. Any, I'm watching any, you. <laughs> any comment on this? Uh, people have been talking about the accelerated Ponsetti technique. Uh, is it uh, worth uh, following? Yes, it was, uh, it was following. Uh, uh, especially in some conditions, it was for, uh, to be tried with uh, some patients, uh, but uh, the uh, experience is uh, uh, to try, but not to enforce, enforce not to enforce the patient to, to do this. Uh, it may suit some, uh, uh, not patients, but we can say that it suits some families, because the, the patients, I think, uh, uh, in my opinion, to follow the uh, classic teaching uh, uh, program of Ponsetti, weekly changing or five days changing is okay, but day and uh, day after day, uh, it may suit the families, not the patient. But I can try it with the patient, but no um, enforcing the patient to, to follow it because, in my opinion, it is. Um, enforcing uh, uh, technique. Uh, no need for doing this in five days, except for some conditions. Maybe from rural area, they came and didn't like to return. May I try with them? But many uh, who have financial support, I didn't like to try with them this. The problem with us in our countries is uh, they have uh, the exchange not weekly, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe twice per month. <laughs> they go <laughs> and return for us after two weeks, not after one week. It was uh, to, to, mm. to do this with them, but I think it is not good uh, in, uh, in my opinion. Good. And Fedel, up to what age you are doing the Ponsetti? A Ponsetti from uh, one month on. Uh, uh, up to what age? Uh, uh, according to uh, what I would like to uh, stress for uh, my uh, uh, trainee and my uh, uh, the postgraduate uh, friends, uh, colleagues here, is that uh, the up-to-date uh, uh, trial of city should be uh, tried even up to uh, 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 12 years, in my opinion. Though many authors, or not many, we can say that some authors that uh, he, uh, succeeded to solve the problem for those patients of 18, maybe 20, and some people said that 25 years old and maybe more. Uh, all these I discussed with them, and uh, I was lucky to be with them in last Secret and was uh, uh, associated with many of uh, friends who are dealing with the uh, Ponsetti in uh, uh, after working age. Uh, and of them, um, uh, 
Monica, you know her, and yeah. uh, uh, some of uh, their friends, uh, uh, they have uh, some papers, and even Matthew Dobbs, uh, they tried Ponsetti even in older age, and even in post, uh, post-remedia release, uh, uh, scars and uh, complications. Uh, actually, I tried the, this uh, since a long time uh, to lessen uh, and decrease the, um, the severity of the contractile tissue and succeeded, by, but I didn't do it as a, a research work. I was so happy that it erupted as a research work uh, maybe since five years or six years ago uh, or more maybe i didn't remember the date but uh, it was a trial to try city at least until the age of puberty or at least the age of bone consolidation it is the same age of permission for doing some osteotomies or some arthrodesis or telectomy in some condition so I agree to do post remedial uh, Ponsetti technique, not to do post remedial release. Even I would like to practice, and uh, I practiced uh, Elizarov successfully, very nicely from age of two uh, years in post uh, uh, complicated surgical failure, such as that child I would like uh, to stress on it, two years and a half, up to uh, uh, the puberty age. At that time, I call it uh, the, uh, the gray zone. This gray zone of age is that age of you couldn't touch the bone because of the epiphysis is still open. And also you couldn't touch the skin because the soft tissue is destroyed by frequent previous surgical interference. So for those, I prefer to do Elizaro. But following the research and the, the up-to-date systematic reviews that I mentioned it in the lecture, I tried before doing Elizaro to use Ponsetti, even for those up to uh, 12 years ago, uh, old. Uh, if failed Ponsetti, I go forward for uh, the uh, Ponsetti, for the Elaz Elizaro. But in case of uh, a body belt, good body belt, heavy weight, I couldn't uh, uh, control their limbs by using a cast. I going directly to Elizar from the age of uh, two and a half or three years up to 12 years mm -hmm. old safely. And Elizar is very nice distraction, histogenesis, no disturbance, closed by all means. I hope that I covered this. Yeah, that's a. Uh, my experience also says that I've done about nine years old child, 10 years old child, and tried this Ponsetti. And we've, all we found that it takes many more plasters than what we do it in a, a young children. And uh, I'm not very convinced with the accelerated Ponsetti method because sometimes it's very difficult to get the patient so frequently to come every fourth day or fifth day. I think the patients are happy coming every week and in five, six plaster, if you are doing a good Ponsetti, you can always make it all right. Alric, yes. what are your comments on that? Yes, you are right. Actually, I agree with you. And the difficulty of, uh, I couldn't imagine that the foot in the uh, plaster cast could do something in three days. No remodeling uh, so faster than this. I know that the child have a power of uh, regeneration and remodeling and uh, fasting, uh, faster uh, uh, growth and growing uh, bone, but it is not up to for this. Uh, uh, Ponsetti was wise enough to say that it's weekly. Week is enough for bone to grow, but one or 24 hours or 48 hours, it is not. Uh, in my opinion, it is not uh, easy to rely upon a remodeling or even growth of bone for two days. I think that if we examine the, the cast, I think uh, no, uh, maybe two or three millimeters increasing in the cast size. So this is my opinion that no time for the growth of the foot to be included in the regeneration 
power of this. This is the important thing that I am in need for some time for uh, doing this remodeling and growing inside this shell of uh, recontaining the uh, small bones. Alric, you have any comments to make on that? You do a lot of club foot. I completely agree with what has been said so sure. far. We have published our work on sure. neglected stuff for the older age club foot as well. And uh, as far as the accelerated Ponsetti program is concerned, we must remember that a lot of things that Ponsetti taught us is sometimes just art and not really science because, you know, he says change the plaster every week. Why? We don't know. He said, you use the brace till the child is five years of age. And we don't know why. So unless we have a randomized controlled trial, we'll never know the right answer to this. I think the answer why we change it less frequently is because the Ponsetti method is based on, on two principles. One is the biomechanical principles of the foot, how the kinematics of the subtalar joint work. But more importantly, on what we call the viscoelastic properties of collagen. And Ponsetti has described this talking of creep and stress relaxation. Creep is basically the wavy nature of collagen, which happens during manipulation. You stretch that fiber. And stress relaxation is that using the plaster, the collagen which is stretched can now get back to its wavy form again. And how many days does it take for the stretched collagen to become wavy again so that you can use creep to restore the shape is what we don't know. There are people who have shown clinically that if you change the plaster every three days or every five days, you can get equivalent results to changing it weekly. And maybe it's a fact. Maybe down the line, maybe 10 years down the line, we might be changing classes every three or five days once we understand the biological properties of collagen. How many days does it take for creep and stress relaxation? So as of now, I think in the absence of that, the Ponsetti method, the accelerated program should be used for a very small subset of patients. Now, those who come from outside far away, who stay in an institution for a period of two or three weeks, they're not going back and coming back. They're staying with you. There are some hospitals which allow that. And those are the patients who can change the plaster every three days or five days. So I think only in that subgroup, we should use the accelerated program. There have been experts, even on this panel, I think Dr. Ala uses the accelerated Ponsetti program. And, you know, there are people who have shown good results with that. So maybe that's the answer. We don't know that still. But for now, we will use it in that small subset of patients who are staying institution, who cannot travel up and down, who come and say, within one month, complete my child's club for treatment. In those children, I think you can change the plaster every three days or five days and maybe hope for a good recovery. At less than three days, maybe it's not a good idea because the collagen cannot get creep back again, but maybe every three days or five days might be a valid answer. As far as the older child is concerned, you have rightly answered. Dr. Fadel has got good experience as well. We have seen that up to the age of 10 years now, they're getting good results with the Ponsetti method. I shouldn't be using the word Ponsetti method. We should be saying Ponsetti principle because the Ponsetti method is a very specific uh, uh, method used in a child less than one year of age. Ponsetti never used it for the older children. He never had that subset of patients. It's when it became popular around the world and we started using it in, develop, in developing countries like ours where we see older children. Ponsetti said, you do it and tell me the results. So they're using Ponsetti principles, which are basically manipulation, understanding the biomechanics of the foot and casting to allow stress relaxation in an older child. And if it works in the younger child, I'm sure it works in the older one as well. So we're using Ponsetti principles because there are some deviations from the original Ponsetti technique. For example, the handhold differs. Instead of using the thumb for tailor pressure, we use the thinner eminence because the foot is much larger. We don't use the one hand technique, but we use a two hand technique. The molding is a little different. The calus correction takes a lot more time than in the younger child. We tend to sometimes use a below knee plaster, unlike in the younger child where you must use above knee plaster. And if you're using above knee plaster, we don't flex the knee 90 degrees. You flex the knee about 45 degrees because these older children don't tolerate knee flexion of 90 degrees. So there are some deviations on the Ponsetti technique in the older child. So therefore, the better term to use is using Ponsetti principles in older children. And not me, but there have been so many other people I've shown from around the world, from Brazil, from Philippines, from uh, various other countries in South America, from Asia as well, that even in children up to the age of 10, using the positive principles can be effective, at least to decrease the quantum of surgery. I can't remember the last time I did a full posterior medial release. That must have been 20 years ago. Or a very small subset of those syndromic children who have very resistant feet. 
But most idiopathic feet, even when they come to us at five or 10 years of age, using the Ponsetti principles, we can get a very good result and we can decrease the quantum of surgery that is required. We don't need to use those very extensive soft tissue releases. We can do small percutaneous procedures and get a well-corrected foot. Thank you. Very right. Uh, the whole idea of, I think, the accelerated Ponsetti came from the statement made by Ponsetti that the set of collagens are formed every fifth day and therefore you have a new set of collagen, you can do it on fourth or fifth day. And I very rightly agree with you, uh, Enric, that it is very good method for those who come from far off places, stay in Bombay for two, three days and they want to get their child corrected and get into the foot into this thing. Absolutely right. And I'm sure all of us have now stopped doing any um, posterior release or any complete subtalar release. Nobody is now doing that with the after since the Ponsetti has come. So if there are uh, any question from the student side, are there any questions here? Mm -hmm. So uh, there are not many questions and I, on behalf of the, <clears throat> so I, on behalf of the Orthopedic Foundation of India, I really thank uh, my very learned and respected faculty members, Dr. Fadal from Egypt, Dr. Kushnit from Pakistan, Dr. Raj Gopalan, Dr. Rajesh Gupta, Anil Jain, Ashok Banskota, and of course, my very, very dear and favorite faculty, Dr. Elric, for coming every year. And you come and the students look forward to your uh, lecture, Elric. And thanks a lot once again and uh, being with us. And uh, we all have enjoyed your lecture very much. So have a nice day. Good night to all of Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye.